Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. Transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. I'd been up north for a few days. On the way back, I camped on the Pawnee River about 30 miles from Dodge, planning to ride on the next morning. During the night, however, my horse twisted his knee somehow, and it was going to be slower traveling than I'd figured. So I started out before dawn. It was just breaking day when I heard a rifle shot up ahead. A half hour later, I spotted a fallen horse and the figure of a man crouched by its head. As I came closer, however, the figure stood up. And I saw it wasn't a man at all, but a small boy. He held a rifle in his hand. That's far enough, mister. I'm a friend, son. Put down your rifle. Hey, you sound like... Yeah, it's Marshal Dillon. That's right. Who are you? Oh, gee, I'm glad to see you, Marshal. You look familiar. We must have met somewhere. I'm Yorkie Kelly. Oh, sure, I remember now. That camp on the Arkansas. That's right. Well, what happened to your horse, Yorkie? Busted his leg. I shot him just a little while ago. And I've been crying, Marshal. That's why I couldn't see you good. I don't know. Every man loses his horse once in a while, Yorkie. It ain't the horse so much, Marshal. It's my paw. Your paw? Oh, where's he? They rode off with him, Marshal. Right that way. you got to go after him. Please, Marshal, please. Something will happen if you don't. Now, wait a minute, Yorkie. Take it easy. Just tell me what happened. Who rode off with your paw? I don't know, Marshal. It was dark. I couldn't tell. Well, let's sit down here. Come on. Okay. Ah. Now, take your time and tell me the whole story, huh? I was out hunting last night, Marshal. I sneaked off to shoot some coyotes. Yeah. And then I heard a lot of horses coming. So I hid and watched them. Those were our horses, Marshal. And two men were driving them. They stole them. I know they did. Well, what about your pa? He was with them. They stole him, too. Well, how do you know? It was dark, but I could tell. The way he was riding. He had his feet tied under his horse's belly. That's why. Go on. Well, I followed him until my horse went down. He busted his leg in a prairie dog hole. So I unsaddled him, and and then I shot him. Uh, uh, Where do you live, Yorkie? Over there, about five miles. All right. My horse is lame, but I'll get you home on him. Go get your saddle. Well, what about my paw? Ain't you going to go after him? I'll find him, but I've got to have a fresh horse. All right, hand me your saddle. Now get up behind me. Come on. That's it. You think there are any horses left at your ranch, Yorkie? We only had six, and they were driving five. Paul was on the other one. Yeah, we're in a spot, then. My horse will never make Dodge. He's getting worse every step. I got a little Indian pony out in the pasture. Oh, but he's not big enough for you. Then you'll have to do it, Yorkie. When we get there, you'll catch your pony and you'll ride into Dodge. What'll I do then, Marshal? Go to the jail and tell Chester I sent you. You can leave your pony there and ride back with him. Tell him to bring some extra horses. We'll need them. We'll be just like a posse, won't we? <laughs> sure. And 
Don't worry about your Paul. We'll find him. We've got to. You tell Hattie where I've gone, will you, Marshal? Hattie? Hattie ain't my real ma. My real ma, she's dead. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hattie's awful pretty, but I don't like her much. Well, I hope you don't tell her that, Yorkie. She ain't as old as Pa, but she's awful old. Oh? She must be 30 anyway. I see. Well, uh, how old's your Pa? 65, but he's tough. You know, Marshal, I don't think Hattie's any good for a ranch. Why is that? Oh, I don't know. I just don't think she is. You'll see. Yeah. I'll ride real hard for Dodge, Marshal. We'll be tracking my paw before you know it. Sure we will, Yorkie. When we got to the pasture, I helped Yorkie catch his pony and got him started for Dodge. Then I rode on into the ranch, put my horse in the corral and walked up to the house. Hattie came to the door. She was young, all right, and pretty. But she looked more like she belonged in a dance hall than on a ranch. What do you want? My name's Matt Dillon, ma'am. I'm from Dodge, U.S. Marshal. Marshal Dillon? I heard about Mr. Kelly from Yorkie. I ran into him out on the prairie. Where is Yorkie? Oh, he's gone to Dodge for some fresh horses, ma'am. He'll be back by evening, and then we'll get started. Get started? Now, don't you worry any. We'll find him, all right. What... What did, uh, Yorkie tell you, Marshal? Well, last night he saw the men who stole your horses and took Mr. Kelly. Where'd he see him? I, he was out hunting, he told me, and he saw him ride by. So that's where he was. Darn little scoundrel. He's always running off like that. Well, I don't understand, ma'am. <laughs> well, that, that boy's got the wildest imagination. What do you mean? Why, there's no trouble, Marshal. Kelly went along with those men just to show him the trail, that's all. He sold him those horses. Oh? Why, sure. Crazy Yorkie, always stirring things up. I'm going to hide him good when he gets home. Yeah. Then you expect Mr. Kelly back soon, is that right? Sure. He'll be back. When, did he say? Today, I suppose. Who were the men he rode off with? Well, I don't know their names. That's Kelly's business. I don't interfere. Come on inside, Marshal. I've got a pot of coffee on the stove. I expect you could use some. We had coffee, and she insisted that I call her Hattie. And we talked for quite a while. It seemed she'd worked in a dance hall, all right, over in Abilene. Then old Kelly came along a few months ago and offered her a home and respectability. And she jumped at it. According to her, Yorkie was the biggest problem she had, aside from the fact that living on the prairie wasn't exactly her idea of a good time. Oh, I'm sick of it, Marshal. Nothing but work and wind and dust and that awful kid. Are you plan to stick it out? Oh, sure, I'll stick it out. Sure, I will. Oh, you'll get used to it in time. Tell me, Marshal, how's Dodge these days? Pretty lively? Well, it was when I left. I was planning to move to Dodge once. Before Kelly came along. I kind of wish I had. Well, now. One town's pretty much like another, Hattie. Yeah. But the men are different. Maybe. I'd have got along real fine in Dodge. Wouldn't I, Marshal? Uh, sure. Why not? More coffee? Uh, no, no, no thanks. It'll be night before anybody gets back here, Marshal. Uh, yeah, I suppose it will. You sure you don't want any more coffee? No, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'll go see what I can do for my horse. He's pretty lame. Uh, I'll see you later. I'll be here, Marshal. Mm -hmm. I spent the day out by the corral, doctoring my horse and taking it easy. It was after dark when Chester and Yorkie rode in, leading three extra horses. But I still didn't know whether we were going to need them or not. 
I told Chester how things stood while Yorkie was watering the animals, and then we all walked up to the house. I explained to Yorkie that we'd have to wait for morning in any case. Hattie was waiting on the porch. Well, Yorkie, you ought to be real proud of yourself this time. We're going after Pa in the morning, Hattie. Can't track him at night. At least that's what the marshal said. That's right, Yorkie. Now, don't tell me you're going to make a fool of yourself, Marshal. Well, I hope not. Oh, excuse me. This is uh, Chester Proudfoot, Ms. Kelly. How you do, ma'am? Yorkie, I could whip you. Now, good. wait a minute, Miss Kelly. He's done no harm. Your husband isn't back yet, and if he doesn't come in tonight, maybe, maybe we better go look for him. How can he come home when they got him all tied up? Stole our horses, too. That's a lie, Yorkie. Those men bought our horses, and your father just rode out to show them the trail. Why are you saying that? You know Pa wouldn't sell our horses. Don't you talk back to me. You shut up, that's all. I won't shut up. You ain't my mom. You can't Now, Yorkie, me. now, you, you take it easy. We'll find your Pa. I promise you that. Well, okay, Marshal. But you find him. We will. Well, uh, Marshal, I figured you'd all be back here, so I fix some supper. Well, say, now, that's mighty kind of you, ma'am. I'm awful hungry. And the marshal also missed his dinner. Come on inside and we'll eat. Well, I'm going around back and wash, Marshal. You don't have to if you don't want to, though. Okay, Yorkie, we, we'll be along. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? I don't think old Kelly's coming back tonight. We'll be riding after him in the morning. Yes, sir. Sure is a lot cooler now the sun's down. I don't know when. I rode so much in two days. Dodge yesterday and clear out here today. I must have covered a thousand miles. <laughs> well, maybe you'll learn to ride you keep this up, Yorkie. Oh, now, Marshal Dillon. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Huh? What's the matter? What's the matter? Now, here they are. The tracks go off this way. Yeah, they got a whole day's start on us. We can't follow them at night. We'll find them. We got to. Hey, look up ahead there. Where? Where? Oh, it's a man. And he's a foot. Yeah, come on. Ah. It's Pa. It's Pa. Hey, Pa. Pa. Pa, you all right? We found you. Me and the Marshal and Chester, we found you. Uh, Yorkie. Boy. Get him some water, Chester. He's about played out. Yes, sir. Uh, sit down, Mr. Kelly. Chester's getting you some water. Here it is. Thank you. I needed that. They didn't give me any water. Where are they, Mr. Kelly? They've gone. Camped near here all day. And they left me. So as I die out here. Looked like I got lost and starved. Uh, they had it all planned. I knew it, Pa. I saw you with them and the horses. I knew it. Have you eaten anything? No, Marshal. They didn't feed me either. Wanted me weak so as I couldn't walk far when they left me. Chester, dig out the jerky. Yes, sir. I'm old. Wouldn't have lasted very long. It was a good trick, blast them. You mean they were going to leave you out here to starve just so they could run off with your horses? No, it's more than that, Marshal. I'll have another drop of this water. One of them, a fella called Webb Cutter, he's going to run off with my wife, Hattie. As soon as they sell the ranch, he is. Had he owned the ranch with me dead. Oh. I never did like her know how. Here, Mr. Kelly. Chew on some of this. Oh. And I got some hard biscuits, too, if you want to mm. soak them in the water. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be all right once I get something in me. Pa's old, but he's awful tough. Ain't you, Pa? Yeah. And an awful fool, too, Yorkie. Oh, that's all right, Pa. We're better off alone, you and me, anyway. Who was the other man, Mr. Kelly? Uh, Rourke, he called himself. Friend of, 
friend of Cutter's. He's going to get his share of the money off the sale of the ranch. Did you know these men before? No. Hattie knew them back in Abilene. So they said. They had it all figured out before we got married. Oh, Marshal. There's nothing worse than an old fool. Well, you aren't the first man to be fooled by a pretty woman, Mr. Kelly. I was lonely, that's all. And I thought Yorkie ought to have a mother. Sure picked a good one. Just you and me, Pa. We don't need no woman around. Well, there ain't gonna be one long. That's sure. Look, Mr. Kelly, what did they do with your horses? They gonna drive them back to the ranch? That's what they said. Only thing that bothered them was Yorkie here. They weren't sure he was asleep. Hattie said she'd take care of him. I sure fooled him. Didn't I, Marshal? Yeah, you sure did, Yorkie. But if they're headed back to the ranch, Hattie will tell them we're on their trail and they'll all run off. I gotta stop them. They got a couple of hours start on us, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I know, but those horses they're driving will slow them a little. Um, Chester, you stay here. You can ride in tomorrow when Mr. Kelly gets his strength back. I'm gonna take the horse Yorkie was riding on a fresh one. I'll go with you, Marshal. I'll fight uh, No, no, Yorkie. You've done your part. You stay here with your paw. Here. I'm the one that ought to go, Marshal, but I just ain't up in that kind of ride. That's all right, Mr. Kelly. You take it easy and come on back when you can. I'll see you at the ranch. Mr. Dillon, you... Uh, you wouldn't have an extra horse, Chester, and you'd need it. Yes, sir, that's true. Well, good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Turn to the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Monday night, an affable man about murder, Thomas Highland, invites you to come along on a CBS radio crime classic. Dramatizing all the known facts about actual killings of bygone days, crime connoisseur Highland recreates atmosphere as well as details in his crime classics. Remember, Monday nights on most of these same stations, CBS radio presents crime classics for an unseasonal chill in the atmosphere. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. One thing in my favor was that Cutter and Rourke weren't riding as hard as I was. They didn't know there was any special hurry. I changed mounts every few miles, but along toward the end, one of the horses began to sull, and finally I had to leave him. It was just before daybreak when I came to the ranch, and there were no lights on in the house, so I figured I'd beaten them after all. There was a room for my horse in the hay shed, and I put him in there and closed the door. Then I walked up to the house, hid behind a rain barrel near the porch, and waited. It was a half hour before they rode in put their horses in the corral and then came up to the house. Oh. Hey, take it easy, Cutter. She's awake. She's lighting a lamp back there. What's she need a lamp for? It'll be daylight in a minute. She's your woman. Why don't you ask her? She's my woman, and you remember it, Rourke. I seen you looking at her the other night. <laughs> One woman's just like another to me. They're all the same. They're all poison. For you, Hattie's poison, all right. I'm telling you, Rourke. But she's pretty. That's more than I can say for most. You forget she's pretty. Okay. There's something else about her I like. What do you... Well, I've been thinking when she sells this ranch, she gets a third, you get a third, I get a third. That's right. But whoever gets Hattie sort of gets two-thirds, don't it? You try that, Rourke, and I'll kill you. <laughs> I'm just joshing you. You really going to marry her, Cutter? I told her I was, didn't I? I didn't ask you what you told her. Shut up. Here she comes. Hello, Webb. Rourke. What are you all locked up for? Old oh, man Kelly ain't going to come sneaking home. <laughs> come on inside. Hurry up. What's we haven't got much time. What's the matter with you, Hattie? You're all upset. You'll be all upset, too, when you hear what I've got to say. Marshal Dillon from 
Dodge. Just one. He's got another man with him. A chest of something or other. Well, I'll be... This fixes everything. Why didn't you take care of that bratty kid like I told you? He sneaked off to go hunting. He wasn't even here. So how could I help him? And he ran smack into the marshal. Now we've really got our heads in a noose. Suppose the old man's dead when they find him. Well, if he's dead, he can't talk, can he? Oh, it's worse if he's alive. Blast you, Hattie. Can't you do anything right? You're blaming me? Who would I blame? I didn't put that marshal on our trail. Uh, it don't matter now who did. What are we going to do? We're going to have to get out of here fast. I'm all ready to go just as soon as I get a riding skirt on. Wait. You ain't going nowhere. What? You heard me. We can't be dragging a woman around. You'd wear out in no time. Now you're making sense, Cutter. We'd never get away with her holding us back. You're going to leave me here, are you? You're going to let me face those people? You know I'll go to jail, don't you? Oh, they won't do nothing to you. Tell them you got misled or something. They always go easy on women. You're going to run out on me. Oh, now, Hattie, you'd be better off here. I'll let you go and you can get on back to Abilene. And I'll come by as soon as they forget about all this. Oh, come on, Cutter. We're wasting time. They could be here any minute now. You cowards. You dirty, rotten cowards. Now, Hattie. Who is your mother, That's mister? That's enough, Hattie. I hate you. Go on, get out, both of you. I wouldn't have either one of you. Either one of us? <laughs> you didn't think I cared, did you? I'd have made one of you shoot the other before I was through. Pies don't cut three ways, mister. <laughs> now we all know, Cutter. What'd I tell you? Boy, there, that'll hold you. Come on, Rock, let's go. You dirty dog! Ah, oh, forget it, Hattie. Maybe I'll get to Abilene sometime. So long. I'll fix you. I should have known about you. You gonna talk all day? Come on. All right, get your hands up, both of you. Get them up in the air. And don't try anything. Hello, Marshal. You touch that gun and I'll kill you. Well, while you're killing him, what do you think I'll be doing, Marshal? Don't try it. Either of you. Hanging's bad, Marshal. I ain't going to hang. You don't have to hang. Kelly isn't dead. We found him in time. I don't believe you, Marshal. I think you've been here quite a long. You ain't even seen Kelly. Yeah. You just want to see us hang. I'm telling you the truth. Oh, no. Lawmen don't tell the truth. Not to fellas like us, anyway. Do they, Roy? No, I don't believe they do. Well, he can't kill us both, Roy. We'll draw at the same time. I'm telling you, don't try it. Why not, Marshal? Let's kill him, Cutter. No! <laughs> oh! We killed them both. Now, give me the gun, Hattie. I said, give it to me. Take it. You shot Cutter, Hattie. Why did you do it? I don't know, Marshal. Did you do it to help me? Or because he was running out on you? He's dead. What difference does it make? It could be murder, Hattie. You'll have to decide that, Marshal. Yeah. Cutter might have killed me. He might have. Go back in the house. You can wait in there. Now they're both dead. Do you care? No. No, I don't care. What's going to happen to me, Marshal? I don't know. I think I'll let Mr. Kelly decide that. Where is he? He'll be here tonight, probably. He's with Yorkie and Chester. Marshal... Will I go to jail? I don't know, Hattie. Depends on Kelly. He's a nice old man. He wouldn't hurt anybody. I'm sorry I got into all this. I wish I hadn't. Marshal.
Marshal Dillon? Yeah. I just had a long talk with Hattie Marshal. Well? She tried to kill me, you know. She had a hand in it. She'll go to jail for it if you prosecute her. I know. But, Marshal, I can't send anyone to jail. Not a woman. If she was a man, I'd shoot her, but... What do you want to do, Mr. Kelly? Yeah, I'll get her things and drive her to town, Marshal. I'll give her some money. And then Yorkie and I will come back here. Yorkie will just have to grow up without a mother. And about me, yeah, it don't matter none. All right, Mr. Kelly. I guess I wouldn't want to see her in jail either. We need women out here, good or bad. We need them. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, John McGovern, Joseph Kearns, John Daner, and Nestor Piva. Harley Bear is Chester. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. This Monday night, Herbert Marshall has the leading role in a story adapted from Daphne du Maurier's collection called Kiss Me Again, Stranger. It's the eerie story of the birds describing strange happenings on an otherwise quiet English countryside. Here at this Monday night on most of these same stations, when CBS Radio presents the Summer Theater. Yes, this Monday night, starring Herbert Marshall. And remember, there's action as a policeman really finds it in 21st Precinct, Tuesdays on the CBS Radio Network. One way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. everything, Chester? Well, there might be more later when they finish sorting the mail. Hey, where's that telegram? Oh, what telegram? I thought I'd put it right on top. Let me take a look. Oh, yes. 
Here she is. Might be important. I will soon see. Well, it's from Bill Hickok. Up in Abilene? Yeah. Uh, what'd you say, Mr. Dillon? Peters and Gridler headed for Dodge. Keep them there, but don't arrest them until I get there with murder witness. Or I'll write Washington all I know about you. Signed Hickok. Oh, then Mr. Hickok's coming here, huh? Well, that's what he says. Well, how do you recognize those two men, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I expect I'll recognize them all right. Oh, you know them. Yeah, we've met. Teeters and Gridler are gunmen, Chester. The kind who kill as easy as most men shake hands. Just about as often. Too bad you can't just put them in jail. Yeah. Well, we'll start meeting the trains. There's one in at noon, sir. Good, then we'll meet it. What will we do if they are on this train, Mr. Dillon? Nothing, Chester. I'll find them later and talk to them, but not in a crowd like this. Yes, sir. You know, every time I see a train, I am just overpowered with the urge to travel. Oh? Where to? Anywhere. Anywhere but Kansas. <laughs> well, I don't think you'd like it back east any better. Why not? You just have the urge to come out west again. <laughs> I know you're kind. Mm, I suppose you're right, sir. But still, it'd be good to walk down a street that wasn't all heat and dust and that wasn't crowded with a lot of grimy men looking for trouble. And I wouldn't mind seeing some women, married women, with kids and parasols and Wait a minute, Chester. And... There they are. Where? They just got off the end car. Those two headed for the depot there. One of them tall? Yeah. That's Teeter's in the black hat. The other's Gridley. I'll just step around the corner here and see which way they head. Yes, sir. There they are. Yeah. Looks like they're going to the Dodge house. Now, let's follow them. Yep, that's where they're going, all right. Now, let's wait here. I'll let them get a room, and then I'll go talk to them. But if you can't arrest them... Then I'll just try to make them feel welcome to stay in Dodge. When do you think Mr. Hickok will get here? Oh, uh, be a couple of days anyway, Chester. Uh, look, right now, I want you to go back to the depot and ask the ticket agent to let me know if Teeters and Gridlers start to leave any time. You can describe them to him. All right, sir. And then go to the stage office. Yes, sir. And go to all the stables, too. If they rent or buy any horses, I want to know about it right away. I'll tell everybody. Also, tell them to keep quiet about it. I'll uh, be back at the office later, huh? All right, sir. You know, what can I do for you, Marshal? Two men came in here just a minute ago. One of them was tall, black hat. Well? Well, what, Marshal? You were here. Did you see them? Those were gunmen. I could tell. The tall one's Teeters and the other one's Gridler. Those are the names they gave you? Yes, but there'll be trouble if you try to arrest them here, Marshal. Can't you wait until they're outside in the street someplace? No. What if they're after you? I've got nothing to do with men like that, Marshal. There's no reason in the world that they... Now, just take it easy. They never heard of you, and I'm not going to arrest them. But since you're a good, helpful citizen, maybe you can tell me what room they're in. Certainly, Marshal, certainly. Number 25. Up the stairs and turn to your left. Thank you very much. your gun away, Gridler. I just came for a little talk. And make your talk, Marshal. No, I ain't polite, Gridler. Let him in. 
can watch them better inside anyway. Hello, Teeters. What's on your mind, Marshal? I'm uh, just trying to think. Last time I saw you men was in, uh... Let me see, was it Tuscosa? Never mind all that, Marshal. Why are you here? No, I heard you were in town. I thought I'd drop by and say hello. News must travel pretty fast in Dodge. We ain't been here 15 minutes, all told. Well, maybe he was expecting us, Griddle. I happened to be at the depot. I noticed you got off, so I followed you here. All right. But we're not wanted, Marshal. <laughs> Matter of fact, a judge up in Abilene just turned us loose. Wasn't no witness to that killing. While Bill tried to frame us, but didn't work. Well, that just goes to show the law's fair to everybody, doesn't it? Why'd you come here, Marshal? Just to let you know that I'm still the law in Dodge and that I don't want any trouble here. And with men of your sort, I always like to mention that. We're not looking for trouble. Good, good. And you're welcome to stay here as long as you like. That's a funny thing to tell us. It's an open town, Teeters. Yeah, sure, Marshal. Sure it is, yeah. And I'll treat you two just like anybody else. If you stay out of trouble, the town's yours. Anybody who starts trouble won't be us. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'll be going now, gentlemen. Oh, uh, there are some pretty sharp gamblers here. Don't let them take all of your money. Well, don't you worry about us, Marshal. So long. There was no way of figuring how long Teeters and Griddler might stay in Dodge. If they took a notion to do some gambling, it might be a week or two, or they might move on in an hour. That night, however, they were still in town, Buck and Farrow at the Oliver Ganza. Everything looked fine until Chester came into the office about 10 o'clock. They're fixing to leave, Mr. Dillon, first thing in the morning. Oh, how do you know? Jim Bunch at the stage office. He just told me they came in and paid their fare to Sharon Springs on the morning stage. Sharon Springs, huh? And then they're headed for Denver. Looks like it, sir. All right, Chester. Uh, go tell Jim that I'm going to be on that stage tomorrow, too. If he likes, I'll ride shotgun for him. One of the boys can have a little time off. I'll tell him, sir. But are you going all the way to Denver? I'll follow him all the way to San Francisco if necessary. You can tell Hickok that when he shows up. Too bad he won't be here before they leave. And it'll be another day before he can get here. But that won't be too far behind us. Uh, stage leaves at 8, right? Yes, sir. I'll be there to see you off, Mr. Dillon. Fine. We'll meet at the Dodge House for breakfast, if you like. All right, sir. The stage looks like it's all ready to go, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. I don't see Teeters and Griddler, though. They're not inside, are they? I don't think so. No, they're not here yet. Just about 8 o'clock, they should be here. Well, it doesn't matter, Chester. If they've changed their minds, it's all to the good anyway. Want me to go ask Jim Bunch if he's heard from him, Mr. Dillon? Uh, no, no, let's just wait here. Mm. Oh, say, I forgot to tell you. Jim said the regular shotgun messenger has to go up to Sharon Springs anyway, but to thank you, just the same. No, good. Chester. Yes, sir? Look, up at the other end of the plaza there. Coming this way. Well, I declare... It's Sam. Yeah. Now what are they up to, I wonder? Well, they can't be taking the stage if they're horseback. No. Looks to me like they're fixed for a long ride, too. Sure does, Mr. Dillon. You're up early, Marshal. Yeah. So are you, Teeters. It's cooler in the morning. Now, for traveling, it is. So long, Marshal. What's the matter? Did you lose all your money last night? Yeah. Next time we'll follow your advice. So long. Will we go after him? Uh, Chester, you stay here and explain things to Wild Bill. I'll be on their trail. As soon as they're out of sight, I'll get my horse. You can tell Jim I won't be taking the stage. All right, sir. I'll leave as clear a trail for Hickok as I can. Yes, sir, I'll tell him. We will 
return to the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, young women are needed to enroll as student nurses and to take their places as graduate nurses in an ever-expanding field where opportunity unlimited awaits. Older women should seek careers as practical nurses where fine living and fine working conditions are in prospect. Ask at any hospital at the nurse's registry desk or at any qualified school of nursing. And now, the second act of gun smoke. I did my best to stay out of Teeters and Griddler's sight, but if they had suspicions of being followed and were watching their back trail, they'd have known I was there, all right. The land was flat. And we frequently crossed great patches of powder-dried dirt that smoked the air with dust under the horses' feet. After an hour, they began to swing slowly north. And by noon, it was clear that for some reason, they were riding in a great half-circle. They'd left Dodge headed west, and sure enough, just after sundown, they rode back into town from the east. I waited until dark, and then came in put my horse up. The office was empty, so I walked up to Delmonico's where I found Doc having supper. Oh, Matt. Oh, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Oh, thank you, Doc. Oh, you look hungry enough to even eat this food. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since breakfast, Doc. Well, a man ought to eat three meals regular, Matt. you get run down if you don't. <laughs> yeah, sure, Doc. Only sometimes you have to eat when you can. Oh, I told you have a hard day, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been riding, Doc. Riding around in circles. Oh, is that what the government pays you for? Oh, I'd like to have your job. <laughs> I wouldn't be too sure of that, Doc. It isn't always this easy. Yeah, I know, Matt. Just told me. What happened to you? Did you lose them? No, I didn't lose them. Man. As a matter of fact, they're coming in here right now. Huh? What do you mean they're coming in? Those two? Yeah. They're pretty hard-looking fellows. They are. Evening, Marshal. Oh, hello, Teeters. Griddler. Marshal. This is Dr. Adams, gentlemen. How are you? How are you, Doc? Yeah, how are you? Well, what's on your mind? You are, Marshal. What? That was you trailing us all day, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Why? I didn't want you to get lost. That's a lie. Then let's say that I didn't want you to get into any trouble. You're going to tell us what it's all about, Marshal? Well, you're not exactly the most reputable citizens in Kansas, and I just wanted to have an eye on you, that's all. You sure do. Because it's like I told you, you keep out of trouble, and you're welcome to stay here. Just remember one thing, Marshal. There's two of us. And next time you follow us, you might not come back. <laughs> well, taking chances like that's part of my job, Mr. Teeters. That's a poor job, then. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think so, too. Come on, Teeters, let's get out of here. Yeah. Well, they're not very polite, are they? No, but they're smart. Smart enough to figure something's wrong, anyway. Well, you think they might bolt, Matt? Yeah, it depends on how smart they really are, Doc. Right now, they're so curious, they might stay around just to see what it's all about. Oh, Mr. Dillon? Oh, hello, Chester. Oh, Pull up a chair. Mm-hmm. Pull up a chair, Chester. I won't have time. Hey, we better get right over to the depot. Oh, why? What's happened? Well, sir, I saw them ride back into town. The first thing they did was go to the depot and ask about a train. Oh, were you there? No, sir. The agent came and told me, told me like he'd promised. Train goes at 7.30, doesn't it? Yes, sir. And it's just about that now. I've been looking everywhere for you. Uh, Doc, if that waiter ever does come around, tell him to hold a steak for me, will you? I might just be back for it. Uh, sure, Matt. Yes, sir. And good luck. Yeah, thanks, Doc. Come on, Chester. Are you going to go on the train with him, Mr. Dillon? No. Hickok's sure to be here in the morning, Chester. If I can keep them off this train tonight, I doubt they'll try anything else till tomorrow. Yeah, but you can't arrest them. Yeah, I know. Well, then, I'll just face them off at Chester. 
So keep your head up. Yes, sir. There they are. Come on. You come just to say goodbye, Marshal? Not exactly. It is. Oh? You, uh... You can take the train tomorrow, if you like, but, uh... Not this one. Why tomorrow? Well, I've got orders to keep you in sight till then. Orders from who? It doesn't matter. But you have your choice. You can have the run of Dodge tonight, or you can spend it in jail. You know, you talk pretty loose for just one man, Marshal. Your friend there doesn't look like a gunman. Well, now, you can't always tell by looks, mister. I can't. You said you didn't want trouble, Marshal, but you sure starting it. There won't be any trouble. You do what I tell you. And if we don't... I'll kill the first one of you that moves for that train. You can die that way, Marshal. Maybe. But you won't both get on that train. Gridler. You know me. You know I'll do it. We can still make it, Gridler. No. It's not worth it. We can go tomorrow. All right. Marshal. Tomorrow it'll be different. Yeah, sure, sure. Tomorrow it'll be different. Chester and I met the noon train next day. But as I'd figured, Hickok didn't get off it. I questioned the man who rode the baggage car, and sure enough, Wild Bill and his witness had hidden out there the whole trip. As soon as the crowd left the depot, we walked down to the car. Crawled under it. Pounded on the door on the other side. It's Dillon, Bill. Open up. Oh, jump up, man. Come on, Chester. Yeah. Oh, Matt, how are you? Oh, fine, Bill, fine. Oh, uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Uh, Chester? Sam, come over here. This is my witness, Sam Trimble. Uh, howdy, Mr. Trimble. Mr. Trimble. Are you still here, Matt? Yeah, but we better move fast. Matt, that judge up at Abilene's crazy, but he's still the judge. And he says Trimble here has to identify Teeters and Gridler before I arrest him this time. But, Bill, they can't be tried twice for the same crime. I know that, Matt, but I'm after them for a second murder they did. I'd suggest we just go kill them, but I've been waiting a long time to see these two hung, and by glory, I'm going to do it. Now you will, if you're lucky. Uh, tell me, Mr. Trimble, do these men know you on sight? Well, I'll tell you how it was, Marshal. I, I was in this stable where I worked, over in Abilene, that is, and a fella come in for his horse, and I went to get it for him. I heard some shooting, and then two men ran right past me. I got a good look at them, all right. They, they, they just killed that fella, too. You mean you don't know Teeters and Gridler? I ain't never heard of them, Matt. There's no pictures of them I know of, but he can identify them when he sees them. Yeah, sure, but what about them? Will they recognize you, Mr. Trimble? Gosh, I don't know, Marshal. I hope not. They'd kill me on sight, wouldn't they? I hadn't thought of that. Well, you just do what we tell you to, and you'll come to no harm, Trimble. Dylan and I are a fair match for those two. If they start any trouble, we'll be on them so fast they'll die on their feet. Taking a terrible chance. I, I hadn't thought of that. Easy, Trimble, easy. An hour from now, we'll have them in jail with their teeth pulled. I sure hope so, but uh, how are you going to do it? Just go find them, that's all. As soon as we get them locked up, I'll buy you the biggest steak you ever ate, Trimble. Come on, let's go. I took Hickok and Trimble over to the Texas Trail, where we decided we'd wait while Chester located Teeters and Gridler. Then we'd just walk in on them and get it over with fast. I introduced the two men to Kitty, and we ordered a couple of drinks for Trimble, who was getting jumpier by the minute. <laughs> What are you two heroes doing? Getting this poor man drunk enough to fight him? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, Miss Kitty. He just lacks faith in it, that's all. Ah. I wouldn't have come if I'd thought about it. I sure would. Look, Trimble. It isn't often a man has both mine and Matt Dillon's guns behind him. You're as safe as you'd be in church. 
I don't go to church. Uh, well, here, Mr. Trimble, have another drink, huh? Uh, I, I will in a minute. I'm going out back first. <laughs> Whatever you're up to, it's making him mighty nervous. Yeah. Well, I'll admit he usually leads a quieter life. He'll brag big, though, once he's back in Abilene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell me, Bill, do you plan to stay in Abilene long? Oh, I don't know, Matt. Charlie Utter keeps talking to me about Deadwood. Oh, it's as dusty up in Deadwood as it is in Kansas. Yeah, I know, Miss Kitty, but Charlie thinks some of that dust is made of gold. Ah. Hey, What's well, that? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'll go with you, Matt. All right, stay in here, everybody. Peters and Riddler. I was just crossing the street and saw them run out of the alley there. All right, come on. There he is. Yeah, it's Trimble. What happened, Trimble? The, the, the shot. I was going to run away. And he got scared and ran right into him. Yeah, we shouldn't have let him alone at all. They said they saw me with you, Mr. Hickok. They said that that's all they needed to know. And then they shot me. Chester, go get the doc. Hurry. Yes, sir. Tell me, Trimble. They were the men who killed that fellow in Abilene. You recognize them all right? No. No. I never saw these two before. It wasn't them. I... Well, what? <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have come. I I got killed for nothing. Tremble. Tremble. That's no use, Bill. Yeah. He got killed for nothing, all right. They must have figured he was a witness to some murder they did commit. Well, anyway, they'll hang for Tremble now. Let's find them before they get out of town, Matt. We'll find them even if they do. Hickok and I walked out of the alley and into the plaza. There were a couple of citizens who'd heard the shooting and had seen Peters and Griddler run out of the alley. Told us that they'd gone into the Dodge house. And we followed. From the look on the clerk's face as we went past him and up the stairs, I knew that they were in their room. When we reached it, Bill stood on one side of the door. An eye on the other. Think they'll fight, man? Well, let's ask them. I told you they'd follow us, Peters. Now well, we're trapped, sure. Shut up, I said. And they got us to the street on the line. Open the door. Throw your guns out. There's no use trying to fight. There's no use in hanging neither, Marshal. You can just take us the best way you can. No. Our chance hanging. We got off once. And... Dilly, get away from that door. I've listened to you enough. I ain't facing Dylan and Hickok both now. Get out! Hold your pants here, that door. Peters, you shouldn't have... <laughs> Wait, Matt. Could be a trick. No, I don't think so, Bill. Look. On the floor there. Yeah, he's been hit all right. Expected this. I saved us doing it, maybe. Riddler lost his nerve. Blast him. Shooting was too good for these two. I wanted to see him hung. Well, things don't always work out, Bill. Well, they sure don't. Not lately, anyway. Matt, I think I'll go up to Deadwood with Charlie Otter right soon after all. Maybe I can find me a little peace and quiet.
Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John McIntyre, Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, Joe Duvall, and Harry Bartell. Parley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> of the war orphans of Korea have never known peace or plenty. Their lives have gone from bad to worse. Now their future is in our hands. Without help, they cannot live. We can send them food through CARE, the American Package Sending Relief Agency. Send your contribution to CARE's local office or to CARE New York or CARE Los Angeles. This is Roy Rowan. This is the CBS Radio Network. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Now, Matt. That's it. Uh, I've got it. Almost. Ah! There it is, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, a little piece of lead. Just as we thought. You see? Now, that took you long enough, Doc. Now, nah, don't you blame me. You should have come here before. People never do go to a doctor until the last minute. I've carried that lead in my leg for over a year, Doc. It never did bother me any. The only reason I came up here today is because you weren't busy and I didn't have anything else to do myself. Aren't you through yet? No, I'm not through yet. I'm looking for my needle. I've got to take a couple of stitches in it first. <laughs> oh, yes. And if you're <laughs> talking like that just to get my fee down, you're wasting your time. You know, it, it's when I'm not busy that I'm poor and I have to charge more. Ah, yeah. oh, oh, there, now. That ought to hold you fine. Not much of a wound. It'll let it work right up next to the skin. I could have cut it out myself. Yeah, but you didn't. And <laughs> it's going to cost you $5. Five dollars. Well, you're the only patient I've had today. I gotta make out somehow. Oh, hand me my pants, Doc. How is he, Doc? Oh, he'll live, Chester. Worse luck. Uh, see, there's a fellow in the office downstairs who wants to see you, Mr. Dillon. Oh, who is it, Chester? He didn't say. All right. I'm ready. Uh, we'll finish our discussion at supper, if you like, Doc. Well, there's nothing to discuss, but I'll eat with you anyhow. <laughs> Thanks. See you later. Are you 
Marshal Dillon? I am. My name's Parker. I'm a special deputy representing the New Mexico Stock Raisers Your Association. New Mexico? Of course. Haven't you heard of the association? Uh, yeah, I've heard of it. I was just thinking you're a long way from home, aren't you? Perhaps. Marshal, I have a warrant here for the arrest of Dane Shaw. Dane Shaw. I never heard of that name around here. We'll let the marshal handle this, if you don't mind. Oh, we will. Huh? Well, now, you're a pretty high and mighty for just a... Just a easy, doggone... Chester, easy. Here's the warrant, marshal. Who issued this, Mr. Parker? We had Judge Blent of Santa Fe issue it. You had him issue it? Well, no. What I mean is we... Uh, well, uh, uh, read it. Read it. Yeah. Uh. It's got the judge's name on it and a seal. That looks okay to me. What makes you think this Dane Shaw's in Dodge? I didn't say I thought he was in Dodge. You're the one looking for help, mister, not me. It's a warrant and you're a marshal. And we think Dane Shaw may be in or near Tascosa. Tascosa? That's a long ride from here, Mr. Parker. Isn't there someone closer than I am? No, I was told to deliver the warrant here. I see. Now, what's this Shaw wanted for, anyway? Rustling, murder, banditry. All of that? He once rode with Billy the Kid. Does that explain it? Not quite, Mr. Parker. We hold those men equally responsible. Every one of them... We? The Stock Raisers Association and others. Ah, I see. Now, you say Shaw once rode with the Kid. You mean he isn't still with him? Shaw left the gang just two years ago. Who told you he did? Pat Garrett. Pat Garrett? Well, if he said so, it's probably true. We've got to put a stop to that gang, Marshal. New Mexico is like an armed camp till we do. But Shaw isn't with the kid anymore. He's of the same breed. And he'll be back, maybe with his own gang. Yeah, that's possible. In any case, the man's wanted and you have the warrant. Why don't you come down to Tascosa with us, Mr. Parker? <laughs> no, no, that's not my job. I'll wait right here in Dodge. Yeah, I thought so. Any idea what Dane Shaw looks like? Six feet, black hair, about 180 pounds. That's not much help. Anything else? They say he has a knife scar across his ribs on the left side. Well, that's something. Where's he from? Who knows where any of those men come from? They all lie, anyway. Why, they say Billy the Kid claims to have been born in New York. Well, maybe he was. Oh, nonsense. How do you know? Well, I was born in New York, for one thing. And you couldn't both have come from the same town. I'd hate to think so, Marshal. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Parker, you keep nice and cozy here in Dodge, and we'll ride down to Tascosa for you. Now, oh, Marshal, I don't think that's quite called for... Chester, after... go get our horses. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> Tascosa lay on the Canadian River a couple of hard days' ride south. Until recently, it had been a Comanchero trading point. Now it was mostly a center for cattle thieves looking for a place to spend their money. I hadn't been there for several years, and when we rode in, I was surprised to see how much the town had grown. Now, at least they got some trees down here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, and a couple of new buildings under them, Chester. Looks like there's another one being started. Mm, it's going to be a big one, too. Doesn't look like a house, though. I wonder what it is. Oh, we can ask in the saloon over there. <laughs> the Red Deer. That's a pretty fancy name. Maybe we can find out if there are any respectable citizens in this town. There don't seem to be anybody here at all, sir, respectable or otherwise. How about that? Oh. I sure could use a drink, Mr. Dillon. Well, I figure we've earned one. Beer. Oh, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> one beer, one whiskey. Right. There, now. That's the best-looking thing I've seen yet in this town. Here's how. Ah, uh, Tascosa's changed some. <coughs> you been here before? Yeah, uh, some time ago. Um, uh, what's the new building they're putting up? Hmm? Oh, 
That's going to be a schoolhouse. A schoolhouse? In Tascosa? Here's a few men who moved into town with their families. Kids need a school, so it was Nat, of course, got it organized. Nat? Nat Temple. He owns the Red Deer here. Oh, I see. I see. He uh, must be sort of a leading citizen here, then, huh? In most ways, I suppose he is. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'd like to talk to him. Where is he? Out back, building a fence. Door's right there. Oh, thanks. There's your money. See you later. Sure. Hello. Mr. Temple? Nat Temple. I'm Matt Dillon, and uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. I'm glad to know you. Barkeep told us that we'd find you out here. Yes, Mike Parsley, he's a good boy. I gathered from him that uh, you are the right fellow to come to, Mr. Timble. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I'm looking for a man. You are? Why? I'm a U.S. Marshal, Dodge City. We don't get the law down here often, Marshal. <laughs> no. The man I'm looking for is Dane Shaw. Do you know him? Nobody by that name around here? I expect he's changed his name. And how are you going to tell him from anybody else? Uh, He's six foot tall, black hair, weighs 180 pounds. Could be most anybody, that build. He's got a scar across his ribs. It isn't often you see a man without a shirt, Marshal. What you want it for? He used to ride with Billy the Kid. He quit, but they think he might be planning to return to New Mexico with a different bunch, one of his own, maybe. Then it'd be better to stop him now, if that's true. I agree. That's why I'm here. Well, wish I could help you, Marshal. What are you going to do? Uh, I don't know. Stay around for a day or so, I guess. Maybe I'll hear something. Fine. You know, it'd be too bad since that fella quit the kid if he went back to the same old outlaw life. Sure. But he probably will. Men don't often change. Some do, if they get the chance. Take Mike Postle in there, the, the barkeep. No. Oh? What about him? Uh, Mike used to carry a gun for Harry Gunter. Gunter calls himself a rancher down here, but he spreads a mighty big loop. You mean he's really a cattle rustler? Yeah, everybody knows it, but nobody's proved it yet. And one reason was because of Mike. He sort of kept everybody off Gunter. How? Mike Postle's pretty fast with a gun. I see. How come he's tending bar for you, Temple? Well, I'll tell you. He had decided himself to stop working for Gunner, and one night he was telling me about it, and I helped him decide the rest of the way. Ah. And then you gave him a job, huh? That's right, Marshal. He'll make out fine if Gunner lets him alone. Well, that was decent of you, Temple. I hope it works. But being a lawman, I suppose you don't think it will. <laughs> well, a lawman isn't all bone, Mr. Temple. Lawman could arrest... Mike Postle right now for what he's done. You can't arrest everybody. But anyway, if I were handling it, I'd go after the head man, Gunner. <laughs> they don't seem to think you're way over in New Mexico. Well, I hear Pat Garrett's after Billy right now, and he'll get him with any luck at all. Pat's a good manhunter. Maybe. But they also want this fella Dane Shaw. Yeah, there's a warrant for him signed in Santa Fe. Yeah. If Pat does stop Billy, there's no point in letting Shaw come back with a new gang. If that's what he aims to do. Well, he might have it in mind. Well, Marshal, that's your problem. Right now, come on inside and have a drink on the house. Oh, thanks, Mr. Temple. It'll be a pleasure. And then I'll tell you where you can get something to eat that won't poison you. I'm saying, I think I'm going to like Tesco after all. Sure you are. Pretty good turkey, Mr. Dillon. You should have tried it. And they must have a Chinese cook in that place. It's better than the usual feed trough in a town like this. Mm. Yeah, let's sit here a while, Chester. All right. Just think, Mr. Yeah. Dillon. Someday Tascosa may be as big as St. Louis. <laughs> I doubt that, Chester. Well, as big as Dodge, then. Uh, that's a little more likely. Ah, here come some citizens now. They sure are. Looking for trouble and ain't even dark yet. Yeah, maybe they just want to cut the dust in their throats, Chester. Mean-looking bunch, if you ask me. I'll do the talking, man. 
Hey, Gunner, we're behind you. If he ain't in here, we'll find him. Did he say Gunner? Yeah, he did, Chester. Come on, let's watch it. Over here, Chester. Yes, sir. You come here for a drink, gentlemen? No, Postal, we didn't come here for no drink. And state your business, Gunter. You're the first man ever walked out on me, Postal. I don't like it, and I don't aim to tolerate it. That all? There's two reasons you're coming back. I'm not interested in your reasons, Gunter. One is I need your gun. I'm through selling my gun. And the other is you know too much about my business. Your business is your affair, Gunter. You know I don't talk. Maybe. But you're still coming back. That's so? Which one of you's gonna bring me back? You're pretty handy with that six-shooter of yours, Postal. Ain't any one of us fool enough to go against you. That's about what I figured. But you can't shoot the whole bunch of us. Don't sure try hard. And you'll die trying. I'm telling you, Post will be back in camp a day after tomorrow. We ride in after you. Wait a minute, Gunner. What do you want, Timber? You've caused enough trouble already. I ain't through yet. Gunner, if you come back here, you'll have to face me. No, Timber, no. Shut up, up, Mike. Now, just remember that, Gunner. I'll be here, too. And you'll both die. Come on, men. Who are those two? I never seen it before. Just a couple of grub line riders, I guess. Come on, Let's go up to the bar, Chester. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Good boy, now you've seen him, Marshal. That's Harry Gunner. Well, Gunner's not my business, but uh, I wish you luck with him. Mike and me will face him down. I'll face him, Temple, not you. No. I helped get you in this. By heaven, I'll see you through it. It's not your fight, I tell you. It's my fight. I believe any man who wants to make a change deserves all the back and anyone can give him. I'll see you get it. You'll just be killed for nothing. Besides, you're a married man. Being married has nothing to do with it. Maybe we'll both be killed, but that's better than giving in to a man like Gunter. Mike, I never told you going straight was easy. You should have been a preacher, Temple. I'm going to get my supper now. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> I'd make a fine preacher, I wouldn't. But if business don't pick up some here, maybe I'll have to give it a try. Well, the town's growing, Temple. Business ought to be good. Well, it's growing, Marshal, a little at a time. <laughs> when I first came here, there wasn't more than a couple of adobe huts to the whole place. When was that, Temple? Oh, when you first came here. One year and nine months exactly, Marshal. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got work to do. Let's get some air, Chester. All right. He's a mighty nice fellow, that Matt Timble, isn't he? I, I mean, willing to back up Mike Postle that way. He, he's a man of his word. And, and building a new school and all that. Married, too. Funny thing, Mr. Dillon, I can't quite figure out if you like Timble. I like him fine, Chester. Only his name isn't Timble. What? It's Dane Shaw. He's the man we're looking for. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, tomorrow night on most of these same stations, CBS Radio presents Dick Powell in the role of Richard Diamond, private detective. Remember, Richard Diamond, private detective, calls on you via CBS Radio tomorrow night. Now the second act of Gunsmoke.
The idea of taking a man like Nat Timble in and sending him back to New Mexico to face a jury of scared and vengeful cattlemen didn't sit too well with me. Anyway, I decided I had to wait it out at least until Harry Gunter made his play. Two days, Gunter had said. And the night before the final day, Temple asked Chester and me to a little dance they were having to celebrate the start of the new schoolhouse. And there we met Ms. Trimble, a fine-looking woman with a strong face and steady blue eyes. If you'd like some punch, gentlemen, my husband's serving it right over there. Uh, yes, sir, I'd enjoy sampling a little, ma'am. I'll be right back. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Huh? Oh, my goodness. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. I'd also enjoy fetching you a cup of that punch. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chester, but I'll have some later. Well, sure, ma'am. Anytime. I... Uh, I'll be right back. I'd uh, be foolish not to take advantage of your husband's being busy, Miss Timble. Would uh, you do me the honor? No offense, Marshal, but I'd rather get a breath of air outside. Why, certainly, ma'am. Would you accompany me? Why, of course. <sighs> nice evening. You think it'll hold, Marshal? Oh, it won't rain. Not for the next couple of days, anyway. That's not exactly what I meant. I was wondering how nice tomorrow evening will be. I, uh, afraid I don't quite follow, ma'am. After Harry Gunter and his gang ride in. Oh. Well, now, I wouldn't worry about that, Miss Timble. My it's, husband's uh... involved, Marshal. I'm bound to worry. Of course. It's not that I don't want him to back Mike Postel and fight alongside him. He's got to do that. But I don't want him killed. He's the finest man that ever lived, Marshal. Yeah, sure. Sure, Miss Timber. He believes that a man's got a right to change. And he's willing to die for that. I know. Tell me. Do you think he's right, Marshal Dillon? In spite of what the law might say, do you think he's right? I think he's right, ma'am. I had a feeling you would. But uh, maybe things will work out all right tomorrow. Maybe everything will be fine. I hope so, Marshal. Anyway, I'll bring our son up to know his father for the rare kind of man he is. Oh? I didn't know you had a son. We haven't yet. What? I haven't even told Nat. But we're going to have one, Marshal. Oh, I see. Shall we go in now? And I'll be your partner for the next dance, if you like. What? Well, I'd be proud, Miss Temple. Real proud. Next morning early, Chester and I saddled up and rode out past the edge of town to the south. There, we pulled off the trail into a clump of scrub cedar and waited. Beyond us lay the Canadian River, and across it, broad vegas of spring-fed meadow grass. As we watched, a buffalo, cow, and calf came to the river and drank. And then they suddenly moved off upstream and disappeared in the mesquite. And a moment later, six horsemen came out of the distance, riding hard for the river and for Tascosa. I reckon that's him, Mr. Dillon. You, uh, don't have to do this, Chester. I know it. Any objections to me using a rifle? There are no rules in this game. I'll feel a mite cozier behind the wind, Chester. Eyes open, Chester. Yes, sir. Come on. Marshal, my name's Matt Dillon. Them the fellows we thought was bums, Gunner, the other day at the Red Deer. Yeah. Get off the trail, Marshal. You got no business with us. Turn around and ride back where you came from, Gunner. Mike Postel's staying in Tascosa. Postel, eh? So you're in on this, too? I've dealt myself in, Gunner. Now do as I say. And keep away from Tascosa from now on, or I'll get a posse and come after the bunch of you. <laughs> 
don't need any lawmen down here, Marshal. Who's that? It's Kimball and Mike, oh, Mr. Dillon. Mike. How did they know we were out here? Looks like we won't have to go into Task Coast, Marshal. We can settle this right here. You were missing this morning, Marshal. I kind of figured we'd find you hereabouts. You and Timble both ought to stay out of this. This is my trouble. It's a little late for that now, Postal. Well, the odds are down, Gunter. They sure are. I ain't facing all them. Come on, Gunter. We'll catch Postal later when there ain't such a clock. Hey, we are. Not me. I'm going. Shut up. Timble, you're responsible for this. I'm proud of it, Gunter. Get him and Postal, men. Get Stop it, first. Gunter! Stop. Should we go after them three? No, let them go, Chester. They won't be back. Our temple's been hit. How is he, Marshal? He got hit bad. Chester, go see if Gunter and those other two are really dead. Yes. I told him not to come along. He wouldn't listen to me. Here, let me pick him up and get him back to town. No. No, it's uh, no use. He, he's done for, Apostle. Are you sure? He was dead before he hit the ground. We finished him, sir. All three of them. It'd take more than three of them to be worth that temple. I'm sorry, Apostle. Done enough for me already. Why do you have to come here? This was my fight, not his. No, Apostle, not the way he looked at it. You see, Temple himself went straight a couple of years back. He did? Yeah. I came down here carrying a warrant for his arrest. You ain't gonna be able to take him in now, are you, Marshal? No, no, I'm not. You know, I'm kind of mixed up about you. Coming down here to arrest him and then meeting Gunner and them out here today. I'm not important, Postle. Just you remember what kind of man Temple was. I ain't likely to forget. I'll swear to that, Marshal. Good. Uh, look, you and Chester stay here. I'll send a wagon out from town. I, uh, I'm going in to see Ms. Tindall. You'll be going back to Dodge now, Marshal? Yes, ma'am, I, I will. I want to thank you for trying to stop it. It's my job. No, not quite. Well, I guess Mike will have to run things now. He's a good man. He'll make out fine. Sure. Tell me one thing, Marshal. Yes, ma'am. I know you came here to arrest my husband. I figured you did. If this hadn't happened today, would you really have taken him back? <sighs> Miss Temple, I, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. If I had, it would have been my last act as a lawman. You mean you'd have quit after? I'd have quit. If you're around in Tascosa again, Marshal... Come and see us. Me and the baby. I... I'd be proud to, ma'am. Real proud. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner and Tom Tully, with Harry Bartell, Paul Dubov, Helen Cleeb, and James M Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. 
Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Tennessee and Virginia are the home states for CBS Radio's Saturday Night Country Style just a bit later tonight. That's where the rural rhythm's coming from, but it's going out all over the country on most of these same stations. This is George Walsh speaking, and remember, you'll find Western adventure and music with Gene Autry Sunday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Take it easy, Mom. You know your young folks are going to eat when you give them sugar crinkles for breakfast. Yes, boys and girls love sugar crinkles. And no wonder, it's the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Makes breakfast more fun than a circus. Now, the reason sugar crinkles suit young folks to a tea is this. Some sugar-coated cereals they've tried seem too sweet. Others don't seem sweet enough. But when they dip their first spoonful of sugar crinkles, mmm, they've discovered a sugar-coated cereal that's just right sweet. And say, those young folks of yours love to dip into the pack and eat sugar crinkles as a snack, too. So better get several packages. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. <laughs> I got a horse to saddle, Mr. Dillon. I'm so hungry I could eat a whole hog. Well, all the hog you got this morning is cooking on that stick right there, Chester. Is it done? <laughs> that depends on how hungry you are. It's done. <laughs> sure will be good to get back to Dodge tonight and sleep in a bed again. Well, civilization's made you soft, Chester. Mm-hmm. Maybe so, but I get mighty tired of using my back for a mattress and my belly for a covering. <laughs> Obviously, Chester, you were born for greater things than rooting around on the prairie and living in the rain. It hasn't been raining, Mr. Dillon. No, no, it hasn't. But it will, Chester. Sooner or later, it'll rain. Yes, sir. Wish we brought some more bacon. Say, don't old man Granby live around here? 
Maybe we could borrow a little from him. Well, according to what I've always heard, old Granby wouldn't loan anybody anything. Mm. You really think he's a rich miser, like to say? Oh, I don't know, Chester. Sometimes a man's entirely different from his reputation. I only met Grampy once or twice. He seemed like a nice enough old fellow, though. Well, I wouldn't want to live out here all alone with nothing but a few horses for company. Oh, he's used to it. Well, even if he does have a lot of money hid away, there's no place to spend it out here. Granby's pretty old for the pleasures Dodge has to offer, Chester. Well, I hope I am never that old. At the rate you're burning yourself out, Chester, you never will be, so don't worry about it. Oh, now, Mr. Dillon, I live mighty quiet for a young fellow who's free and still full of blood. <laughs> sure. Hey, look over there. Huh? Now, that string of dust laying right on the ground there. Yeah, I've been watching it, Chester. It's not on the ground, though. There's a dry wash runs along there. Somebody's driving stock down it. Maybe it's old man Granby. That may be. Let's go say hello, huh? All right, sure. If it is old man Granby, we might just ask him about a little bacon, huh? Well, we can ask. There's no harm in that. Oh. Oh. Now, that's horses down there, Chester. Yes, sir. I can see their heads now. I don't see anybody driving them. Now, he'll be along in a minute. Now, let's wait here. There he comes. Yeah. Hello! He stopped. That's not old, Granby. Let's ride down and say hello anyway. That's Granby's brand on those horses, though. He must have hired him a hand. Yeah, maybe. Hello. Hello. Are you working for Granby? No, I ain't working for nobody, mister. Oh? Uh-huh. And where is he? Where is who? Granby. I don't know no Granby. Well, those are his horses you're driving. Oh, they are? Yeah. I ain't driving them. What do you mean? They got ahead of me in the wash here, that's all. I see. You a cowboy? Yeah, sure. I'm a cowboy. Well, how you don't look like one. You don't ride like one, either. You're asking the questions, mister. No decent cowboy would run another man's horses down a dry wash just because he didn't want to get up on the bank and ride around them. I told you, they got in front of them is all. How come you're not carrying a gun? Does a man have to carry a gun? No. I'll bet you're the only man within a thousand miles of here who isn't carrying one. Maybe I got a better conscience than the rest of you. Maybe. Look, mister, you've run those horses about five miles off of old Granby's place. You want to give us a hand, we'll run them back. I'm in a hurry. It won't take long. The old man might be a couple of days finding them if we don't. You worry about him. i got to get in to Dodge. We'll ride in with you. Afterwards. I ain't going to do it. Look a lot better if you did. I, uh, I'd like to, mister, but I can't wait. I'm leaving now. So long. You gonna let him go, Mr. Wait a minute, Chester. I'll let him hear what lead sounds like. Now, don't shoot! Don't shoot me! All right, then ride back here. Don't kill me, mister. I'm not gonna kill you. Unless you try to run away. Why would I try to run away? You just did. Chester. Yes, sir? Ride down the bank and have those horses off. Start them back up the wash. We'll be out of here by the time they're back. All right, Mr. Dillon. 
You stay right close to me, fella. And don't try anything smart. When we get to Granby's, if he says it's okay, then you can go wherever you like. I don't know Granby. Never been there. Well, we'll show you the way. Come on, let's get up on the bank. <laughs> Old man Granby can find his horses all right now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. But I want this cowboy here to meet him. We'll see if he's in the house. I'll wait for you. Get off that horse, fella. Go on. That's better. Come on. We'll take a look. Well, what are you waiting for? Nothing. You go ahead, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. John. Looks like I'll have to herd this man in. You've been kind of balky ever since we ran into you, mister. I don't like being dragged around. I never did. I just want you to meet old Granby. He'll be grateful for you. Helping run his horses back here. I know what you think, mister. You think I was stealing them horses. Well, I never heard of the old man. I was never near this place. Yeah, so you told me. But you're here now. I ain't afraid of you or nobody. Then let's go into the house. Come on. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Old man Granby, he... He's in there. Oh, well, what's wrong? Right in the room there, Mr. Dillon. He's hanging there. What? Somebody's gone and hung him right in his own house. I, I don't want to see him anymore. You go take a look. Pull your gun and hold it on this man, Chester. If he makes a move, shoot him. Yes. Now, you just stand there real quiet like. I ain't gonna do nothing. You sure ain't. And just because I happen to be in the country don't mean I killed nobody. Mr. Dillon will decide about that. Who is this Mr. Dillon, anyway? He's a United States Marshal, that's who. A Marshal? Looks like you run into the wrong people, fella. I'll hold your gun, Chester. Search it. All right, you... Here. Get around. All right. Turn around. The house is all torn up. He must have been looking for old Granby's money. I was never in that house. There's nothing on him. Not a thing. All right, Chester. Here's your gun. Catch it. Thank you. All right, now. What's your name, fella? Tremble. Joe Tremble. Where are you from? Up north. Up north where? All over. What are you doing down here, Trimble? Making a change. Yeah, sure. And some cowboy you ran into told you about Granby being rich. So you came here and kicked the old man around and hung him. And then tried to find the money. That's a lie. This is the first time I was ever near the place. I'm sure you did it, Trimble, but I wish I had more evidence. A court of law just might not convict you the way things stand. You gonna let me go? No. I'm arresting you. And you're gonna stand trial. And I'll do my best to see you hung. I didn't do it, I tell you. And I'll go free, too. You'll see. There's something mighty wrong about you, Trimble, and I can't figure it at all. But I'll sure find out. <laughs> It does your heart good, I know, when your young folks eat all of their breakfast cereal. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about new Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles, you know, is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Crisp golden nuggets of sugar-coated rice. 
They make breakfast more fun than a circus. Why, young folks love sugar crinkles so much, they disappear like magic. Now, you've had experience with sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you, and others that just don't seem sweet enough to the youngsters. Well, what a wonderful surprise sugar crinkles will be to your whole family. For new sugar crinkles really are just right sweet. Remember, sugar crinkles make great snacks, too. And there's even more good news about sugar crinkles. Right now, there's a full-size package of Charms, that wonderful fruit-flavored candy, in every special package of sugar crinkles your dealer has. Ten delicious fruit-flavored Charms, free of extra cost to you. So hurry. Get sugar crinkles soon as you can. Now back to Gunsmoke. We let Joe Tremble dig a grave up behind the house. Then we laid old Granby in it and covered him with dirt. I was pretty sure now that the old man had never had an extra dollar in his life and that he'd been killed for no reason at all. Anyway, Tremble had done a pretty thorough job looking for the money and he'd found nothing. On the ride into Dodge, I tried to figure out just what he was. But he didn't seem to fit anywhere. He wasn't a cowboy or a hunter or a gambler. Or even just a drifter. After we got him locked up in jail that night, Doc and I went over to the Texas Trail for a drink with Kitty. And I was telling him about it. Now then, uh, this fella Trimble, uh, how old is he? Oh, around 25, I guess, Doc. Mm -hmm. Then he couldn't be running away from home. (laughs) No, he's a little old for that, Kitty. Well, anyway, they'll hang him. Well, I hope the judge agrees with you, Doc. Why shouldn't he? All I got so far is circumstantial evidence. But then you should have shot him out on the prairie. (laughs) It's a good thing you're not a lawman. Well, maybe if I were, there'd be fewer killings around here. Uh, I, I doubt that, Doc. You going up to Hayes for the trial, Matt? Yeah, I'll have to, Kitty. That'll take a week, I suppose. Oh, Bob. Why, yes? Nothing. Only you've just been away for ten days. Oh, I have to earn a living, Kitty. You could make more money gambling right here in Dodge. Oh, now, Kitty, don't start that. Good evening, Marshal. Oh, Major. Ah, it's Kitty. Good evening, Major. Oh, I do, Major. I'd like a word with you, Marshal. Oh, uh, sure, Major. <laughs> so we can go over to the bar then. All right. Uh, I'll be back, Kitty. Doc. Uh, no hurry, Matt. Doc's got a lot of money. Oh, I, now I'll buy you one drink, Kitty. Just one drink, and that's all. Well, it's a start, Doc. <laughs> Let's go, Major. I had to come to Dodge on other business, Marshal. But I wanted to pass the word to you that we're looking for a man. Oh, the Army? Yes, a deserter. Oh? Not from Fort Dodge. Where was he stationed, Major? He was with the 7th Cavalry at Fort Lincoln. Oh, up in the Dakotas. Yeah, and for some reason, they think he headed south. Now, I don't have much of a description of him, just that he was a private, about 425, curly blonde hair, and uh, he had a scar on his left hand. Yeah, that fits. What's his name, Major? He enlisted as Joe Gould, but he's known to have used the name Trimble. Uh Uh-huh. Well, he's right here in Dodge. What? I got him locked up in jail. <laughs> well, uh, that's fine, Marshal, but how did you know? I think he murdered an old man who lived a day's ride north of here. I'm going to have him tried for it. Well, that won't be necessary now, Marshal. I'll take over custody of him. No, no. Hmm? Then he'd be tried at Fort Lincoln for desertion. I want him tried for murder. And i got to be there to present the evidence. You could go up to Fort Lincoln. Now the Dakotas are out of my territory, Major. Besides, this is a civil crime. The Army wants that man, Marshal. I'm sorry, Major. He's going to be tried in Hayes first. He is still a soldier, even if he did desert. Well, if the judge lets him off, you can have him. But not otherwise. 
Major, he tortured and hung an innocent old man, and I'm going to do my best to see him punished for it. Well, I'll have to take this up with my superiors, Marshal. Uh, you better hurry. I'm going to Hayes with him tomorrow. I hope you won't regret this, Marshal. I won't, Major. Not if Trimble is properly punished. I won't. I didn't wait till morning, but started off for Hayes with Joe Trimble that night. The trial lasted a week, and in spite of all the arguments I made, a judge finally decided that there wasn't enough real evidence to convict him. I even tried to make Trimble confess, but he was too smart for that. So there was nothing to do but bring him back, turn him over to the Army. I sent word to Fort Dodge, and the next morning, the Major himself appeared to take him into custody. Well, Marshal, it looks as though you didn't have much of a civil case after all. Uh, he killed old Granby. I know he did, Major. But after all, the law is the law. Yes, and in the Army, orders are orders. I'm just sorry your judge didn't convict him after all. Oh, is that so? Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Bring Trimble out, huh? All right, sir. Major, I'll give the Army credit for one thing. Uh -huh. What's that? Trimble and I rode back some 80 miles yesterday, and when we got here, he <laughs> wanted to sit up and play cards with Chester. Uh -huh. Yeah, there may be some bad men in the cavalry, Marshal, but they're all tough. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's yours, Major. Private Trimble, sir. You're under military arrest, Private. Not privileged to salute. Besides, you enlisted as Private Gould, not Trimble. Yes, sir. Report to the guard outside. Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute, Trimble. You, uh, know that you're mighty lucky, don't you? You should have died for what you've done. I told you I'd go free, Marshal. It'll catch up with you someday, Trimble. It always does somehow. That's all I wanted to say. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Marshal. I'll be getting along. Oh, uh, Major, hmm? uh, you said that uh, you were sorry that the judge didn't convict him. Why have you changed your mind? Well, I have orders from General Terry to return him to the Dakotas to Fort Lincoln. Well, he'll be tried there, but he won't be hung for just desertion. Now, oddly enough, Marshal, he won't even be tried. For some months, anyway. He won't? No. It seems that the 7th Cavalry needs every man available. They're leaving Fort Lincoln on an expedition against the Sioux and the Northern Cheyenne. Oh, the Sioux, huh? Yeah. I wonder if old Sitting Bull is still the chief medicine man with him. Sitting Bull? Yeah. No, I never heard of him. But I expect the 7th will be heading into Montana territory. Well, if they're after Sitting Bull's tribe, they will. He's always had a large camp over on the Little Bighorn. That's so? Yeah. Oh, by the way, who's in command of the 7th Cavalry now? Oh, an officer I served under a couple of years. I never did care for him. A General Custer. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. You know, what you are tomorrow depends on what you eat today. So, Mother, be sure the big and little Indians at your house always eat a good breakfast. And tell me, what could be better for breakfast than Post Toasties? Post Toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. But all of the talking in the world couldn't tell you how downright delicious post-toasties are. 
You have to taste those crackling crisp flakes. Yes, you have to taste that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted. Then you'll know how perfectly wonderful breakfast can be. Put Post Toasties on your shopping list right now, Mother. Just watch how your whole tribe goes for them. Remember, Post Toasties are the heat good cornflakes. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Now, Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just for every big and little Indian in your camp, a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heat good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor, toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. Nice day, man. Uh, The wind's gone down anyway. She was blowing last night. Uh, where were you, Doc? Uh, out at the Caldwell place. Mrs. Caldwell's expecting. Still? Mm. There was a false alarm last night. Oh, you ought to get some sleep while you can, Doc. Yes, I know. That's right where I'm headed. Doc Adams. Oh, hello, Ruth. I've been looking for you, Doc. Uh, Matt, this is Ruth Tucker. Sheely Tucker's son. Oh, hello, Ruth. We ain't met before, Marshal. No. How's Sheely these days? Uh, he's just like ever. But it's Ma I come to get Doc for. Well, what's the matter, Ruth? You know, she swallowed a nail, Doc. And it's hurting her bad. Mm, swallowed a nail, did she? Uh, how'd she do that? I told her not to, but she was fixing the chicken house anyway. And she had some nails in her mouth. Oh, you say it's hurting her? It's her stomach. 
She's got a terrible pain in her stomach. Oh, that's bad. I, uh, I'll, I'll write out with you right away, Ruth. As soon as I get my tools, may have to operate. You know Pa, Doc. You know how he is. Oh, yes. I forgot about him. Sheely doesn't like doctors, does he? He hates them. But he ain't there now. He's been out on the prairie the last couple of days. Oh? When will he be back? I don't know for sure. But Ma said to get you anyway. She doesn't want to die. Sheely'd cause trouble if he found me there, wouldn't he? He sure would. He'd beat you half to death. Well, maybe I better ride out with you, Doc, just in case Sheely comes home while you're there. Good idea, Matt. I think you better. Yeah, uh, Roof, uh, go over to the Alifraganza and tell Chester I want him to go with us, will you? Sure, Marshal. <laughs> Chester. Doc's still working on her. Well, there's no sign of Sheely anyway. Well, that's some help. What's the matter with a man like that, Mr. Dillon? Hating doctors the way he does? I don't know, Chester. Probably there weren't any doctors around when he was young. And what was good enough for his father is good enough for him. Some fool notion like that, maybe. Sheely always was a mean old cuss, except for his horses. He's always treated horses like they're human. Did you ever notice that? Uh, Sheely isn't really a bad man, Chester. He's just ignorant and prejudiced because of his ignorance. If he'd have been here, he'd let Miss Tucker die rather than have Doc operate on her. Yeah, probably. Well, that's bad. To me, it is. Maybe if Doc saved him someday, he might get over his ideas. Oh, Sheely's never had a sick day in his life, I know of. Oh, Doc, you all through? Huh? Oh, Yes, yes, I'm all through, Matt. How is she, Doc? Yeah. She's dead. Dead? Well, I guess her heart couldn't take it. I, I don't know. I, I had to operate, though. She'd have died sure if I hadn't. Oh, it isn't your fault, Doc. You did all you could. I know, but... I always feel maybe if I'd have done it better, things like this wouldn't happen. Well, you're not to blame, Doc. You, uh, want me to tell Roof? Yeah, I've already told him. He's in there with her. Oh, how'd he take it? Yeah, he, he didn't say a word, Matt. Well, we better be getting back to Dodge, I guess. Yeah, you must be plumb wore out, Doc. Yeah, I am. Doc. Hey. Eh? Uh, yes, Ruth. And you too, Marshal. You're going to have to help me. Oh, we'll help you, Ruth. What is it? It's about Pa. I don't know what to tell him when he comes back. Hey, that's right. I... I... Kind of keep forgetting about him. Just tell him the truth, Ruth. Doc tried to save your mother, but he wasn't able to. Nobody could have. You don't know Paul very well, I guess. He just won't stand for it. Well, there's nothing he can do about it now. It's all over. Not for him, it won't be. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean, Ruth? Well, when Paul says a thing, he means it. And he said none of us was ever to go near a doctor. Ruth, do you agree with your pa's thinking? No. And neither did Ma. But we didn't dare cross him when he was around anyway. I'm afraid of him, Marshal. You'll have to stay here and tell him. Yeah, well, I, I can't stay. I, I have to get over to the Caldwell place. That baby's due any time now. But you can't go uh, on. All right, Ruth, all right. I'll stay here till he comes back. Uh, Chester, you better ride into town in case anybody's looking for me, huh? All right, you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it's a funny thing. How a doctor can lose one life and maybe bring another into the world all on the very same day. Well, come on, Chester. We can ride partway together.
That ought to do it, Ruth. I want her buried good, Marshal. How about a, a cross? You want to put up a cross? Now let Pa decide that. Okay. Oh, my gosh, Marshal. Here he comes now. Yeah, looks like he's been riding pretty hard. Pa always rides hard, but he takes mighty good care of his horses all the same. He's never hurt one yet. I know. Hello there, Marshal. How are you, Sheely? What are you doing out here? What's this? Sheely, uh, your wife died. Ruth and I just finished burying her. She died? Uh, just a few hours ago. We didn't know when you were going to get back, so we went ahead and buried her. What'd she die of? Uh, she was holding some nails in her mouth and she swallowed one of them. Oh. Roof, take this horse into the barn and dry him off. Sure, Paul. Rub him good now. I will, Paul. Don't let him near no water yet. I won't. What are you doing out here, Marshal? I came out with Doc. With who? Doc Adams. He did everything he could to save her life, Sheely. He cut on her, didn't he? He tried to get the nail out, if that's what you mean. She'd have died from it if he hadn't. Cutting on her, that's what killed her. Look, Sheila, your wife was dying and Doc tried to save her. That's how it happened, no matter what you think. I've got no use for doctors. They're all croakers. That's what my old man called them, croakers. I kind of figured that's where all this came from. Sheely, have you ever thought that your old man might have been wrong? Not about them, he wasn't. Hey... How'd Doc get here anyway? Who told him to come? Your wife wanted him. After all the times I've told her to stay away from doctors... I guess she didn't want to die, Sheila. She wanted a chance to live. Yeah, sure. And he'd come out here and killed her. Poor defenseless woman. Doc Adams will pay for this, Marshal. I'm telling you right you now. You lay a hand on Doc and I'll run you out of the country, Sheely. Maybe it won't be a hand I'll use, Marshal. Try anything like that and you'll hang for it. I'll find you no matter where you go. He killed my wife with his bungling butchery. He's a murderer. There isn't a man in Kansas who'd believe that. Doc's a pretty valuable citizen around here, Sheely. Not to me, he ain't. It's an eye for an eye, Marshal, like it says in the good book. You even try it and I'll throw you in jail. I don't try nothing. Then you'll hang. Will I, Marshal? What goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go on your breakfast table is Post Toasties. Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe, and then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties heat good cornflakes, the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heat good cornflakes, Post Toasties heat good cornflakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrap. Post cereals, guaranteed fresh, or triple your money back. Now back to Gunsmoke. I 
I left Sheely Tucker standing by his wife's grave. And I rode back to Dodge. There was no use trying to convince the man that doctors aren't bunglers and murderers. I figured he'd have to experience the truth himself somehow. And there wasn't much chance of that, the way things stood. But what really worried me was his threat to get Doc. Ordinarily, Sheely was peaceable enough, but there was no telling what he might do now. Doc stayed at the Caldwell place that night and the next day, too. I thought he'd be safe there, and I didn't worry about him until the next evening. Kitty and I were having supper at the Dodge house. Matt, for a town that lives on the cattle trade, you'd think we'd be able to eat decent steaks. <laughs> you should have had the prairie chicken, Kitty. You didn't have to walk all the way from Texas. That steak I had got carried. It was too old to walk. <laughs> I've never eaten prairie chicken, Matt. What's it taste like? Oh, a little chicken. A lot of prairie. <laughs> if I didn't know you better, I'd say you've been drinking. If I know you, you'll order a steak next time anyway. I don't give up easy, Matt. Yeah, I know. Remember it, then. Sure. You don't know much about women, do you, Matt? Well, I'm learning. Yeah. But at the pace you've set, I'll be in my grave before you're out of first grade. Well, it took me ten years to learn how to handle a six-gun. Well... That's the nicest compliment I've had all day. <laughs> Drink your coffee. I gotta get out of here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Ah, oh, here's Doc. Ah, hello, Matt. Kitty. How's Mrs. Caldwell, Doc? Yeah, gave birth to a twelve-pound boy this afternoon. Ah, that's fine. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, that's not what I came to talk about, Matt. Somebody tried to shoot me on the way back from the Caldwell place. What? What? Who was it, Doc? Yeah, I didn't see him, and since I didn't have a gun, I rode straight ahead. Uh, fast. Where'd this happen? Yeah, about a mile the other side of the grove. I should have come out and ridden back with you, Doc. You should have, huh? Well, yeah, then, uh, you know something about this? Yeah. Sheely Tucker, huh? He came back after you and Chester had left, Doc. He made some threats. Yes, I might have known it, but... I'm not going to be a target for Sheely every time I go on a call in the country. I'm going out and see him, Matt. We'll have this out face to face. I don't think you can change his mind, Doc, but I'll go with you. And if he admits shooting at you this afternoon, I'll bring him back to jail. Maybe I'll bring him back anyway. Well, I should hope so. People around here would be in an awful fix without Doc. Well, then there's me too, Kitty. Oh, sure, Doc. I was thinking of you. We'll ride out in the morning, Doc. Yeah, good. There's somebody in the corral there, man. Yeah, it looks like Sheely. It is. Him and Ruth both. Come on. Oh, oh. Well, let's leave them here. They'll stand. Hmm. I got a horse tied down in there, Mr. Dillon. Now, he's down, Chester, but he isn't tied. No, oh, by golly, he ain't. Oh, say, look at that. Yeah, I broke his leg. Now, that's too bad. Oh, here we are. Oh, uh, Doc, I I'll go first in case Sheely gets excited. Oh, all right, man. Yeah. Go ahead, I'll close it. Hello, Sheely. Roof. Hello. You bring that croaker out here to kill my horse for me, Marshal? Uh, now, Sheely... Wait a minute, Doc. I'm sorry about your horse, Sheely. What happened? That bay's the finest animal I ever owned. I was just topping him off when he fell and busted his leg. No blame it. Uh, gee, that's too bad. It sure is. Roof. Go on up to the house and fetch me my rifle. Okay, Pa. A terrible thing to lose a horse like this. Sheely, if you like, I'll do the shooting. Oh, thanks. I'll kill him myself. It's my job. You know, it's a funny thing. 
We always shoot a horse if it breaks a leg, but we wouldn't think of shooting a man when he does. You croakers got other ways of getting rid of people. Yeah, I'll overlook that, Sheely, but I'll tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you. Well, you, you like that horse, don't you? Of course I do. Well, then, don't shoot him. What? Well, look, Sheely, that horse is done for anyway, so it won't hurt to let me try to fix his leg the same way I would a man. It just might work. You mean put a cast on him? I do. I never heard of putting a cast on a horse, Doc. <laughs> Neither have I. It's crazy. I don't like it. Hmm? It's up to you, Sheely. Well, I wouldn't have let you near my wife if I'd been here. Why should I let you fool with my horse? All right. All right, Sheely. Shoot your horse, and I'm taking you back to Dodge. What for? You're going to jail for trying to kill Doc yesterday. At least that's what Doc told me. Yeah, now, Matt, I didn't exactly Shut say... up, Doc. I ain't going to jail. I can't... Yes, even... you are. Unless maybe Doc changes his mind about charging you with attempted murder. Then I couldn't put you in jail. Oh? Yeah, no... No, uh, he couldn't then. Uh, you know, Sheely, I might get so busy working on this horse, I'd, I'd plain forget about everything else. I might even save the animal to boot. Well, make up your mind, Sheely. I gotta get back to Dodge. Well, all right. But you better make it work, Doc. I said I'd try. That's the best I can do. Ever. No matter who the patient is. Okay, Doc, you try. Try real hard, will you? I always do, Sheely. Real hard. Chester and Roof made a fast trip into Dodge for a plaster of Paris and some muslin to go under it. And when they got back, Doc went to work. An hour later, he had a heavy cast on the horse's leg. And after giving Sheely some final instructions, he was finished. He promised to come back in a couple of weeks and put a lighter cast on, and then we left. Sheely didn't say much, but I knew if anything went wrong with that horse, he'd be after Doc again. However, six weeks went by before anything happened. Doc and I were hiding out in his office with a game of chess we'd started a few days earlier. Doggone rook of you sitting there, Matt. If, if I move my bishop, you'll be right in on that queen. That's the only move you got, Doc. All right. There you are, Matt. See what you can do with it. <laughs> Couple more of those and I'll get that queen. Doc. Well, hello, Sheely. Doc, I've been looking everywhere for you, blast you. Why'd you put a sign on your door saying you were out? How come you're wearing a gun, Sheely? Man, it'd be a fool not to wear a gun in this town, Marshal. He'd be a worse fool to try to use it. Don't rile me. I'm in a bad enough temper already. What's wrong, Sheely? Uh, how's your horse? My horse is tied up right outside, Doc. What? Yeah, I took that second cast off myself. Then I rode him in here. Of course, I took it easy with him, Doc. Real easy. And he ain't even limping. Well, what do you know? By heaven, it works. Oh, that's fine, but uh, what are you so heated up about, Sheely? Well, you'd be heated up too, Marshal. If you'd been carrying a rotten tooth in your jaw as long as I have. You mean you're looking for a doctor, Sheely? Uh, I'm man enough to admit it, Marshal. Uh, well, now, Sheely. Uh, you just sit down right over there and I'll see what I can do. Okay, Doc. Hey, this is the one right here. Yeah. Try to get it out, will you? Well, I'll try, Sheely. That's the best I can ever do. Ever. That's good enough for me, Doc. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there's sugar crinkles at every place. Sure, new sugar crinkles 
make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar Crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar Crinkles, every golden crisp nugget of them, is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new Sugar Crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, Sugar Crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack, for your breakfast or a snack, Sugar Crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try Sugar Crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. So better get several packages. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Tom Tully. Parley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and tonight Paul Fries played Doc. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first time I saw Lena Wave, I should have resigned my job and gone to Texas on the fastest horse I could find. Handling a man is one thing, but uh, trying to handle a woman is another. Especially when she weighs some 200 pounds and is muscled like a mule and twice as ornery. Lena came to Dodge on a great draft horse with dark circles around its eyes. And she was leading an old jack mule that carried her boyfriend, Emmett Fitzgerald. And Emmett was a tired, pigeon-breasted little fellow with a green look in his face. They weren't a very handsome pair, but we were mightily impressed by him the day they rode up Front Street. I swear, Mr. Dillon, that woman must wear leather underwear. I don't know why she's leading his mule. The man doesn't look stout enough to run away if he wanted to. My, I'd sure hate to have her on my tail. Well, she's wearing a six-gun. And built like a buffalo. Well, she sure isn't the gentlest-looking woman I ever saw. Oh, that poor little man, Mr. Dillon. He somehow gives me the feeling he's being carried around in a bird cage. Now, quiet, Chester. They'll hear you. Yes, sir. Oh, I never thought we'd make it, Lena. You mean you never thought you'd make it? Get off that mule. Sure, Lena. Here. I'll help you tie him up, Lena. Ow! You stepped on my foot! I'm sorry. Lena. That'll learn you to be a gentleman. <laughs> you up there! Stop that! <laughs> Oh, 
are you laughing at? Why, nobody, ma'am. That's good. Because if I got the notion you was laughing at me or my man, I'd open you up. Oh, oh no. Oh, my, no. No, it, it, it was just something funny I heard the other day from a fella. What? What? What did you hear that was so funny? Well, I, I, I was sitting there, and he come around. The Think the... hard, mister. You remember, Mr. Dillon, you... Tell her, please. Dylan? Why, you must be the marshal here. Oh, that's right, ma'am. Well, now, marshal, I'm proud to know you. My name's Lena Wave. Shake! Well, how do you do? Do. Over here, Emmett. Sure, Lena. Marshal? It's yours, Emmett Fitzgerald. Emmett? Glad to know you, Marshal. Emmett's a gambling man. Oh, is that so? I want you to know he's honest, Marshal. Ain't you, Emmett? Sure, Lena. Say it. I'm honest. I only caught him cheating once, Marshal. Ain't that right, Emmett? I was in bed two weeks. She liked to kill me. Well, I'm glad to know that. Uh, about your being honest, I mean. Emmett will be running a game tonight. Right over there is as good a place as any. The Texas Trail. Uh, sure, sure. Glad to have you sit in, Marshal. And you can come, too, yes. if you watch your manners. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Emmett, I'd better feed you so you can get enough strength back to kneel them cards. Come on. Sure, Lena. <laughs> Chester's been in that game over there for two hours, Matt. He must be losing. Well, he usually does, Kitty. How anybody could concentrate with Lena hulking around, I don't know. <laughs> she does keep an eye on things, doesn't she? You know, Matt, I feel kind of sorry for her. Oh, she can take care of herself. What is that? She's being so big and not very pretty. After all, she is a woman. Uh, that's not too easy to tell, Kitty. You think she's in love with Emmett? Well, now, Kitty, I tell you, I haven't worked that out yet. Uh, I, I'm sure been studying on it, oh, though. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Every woman needs a man of some kind. Well, she's got one. Yeah. I feel sorry for him, too. Oh, Lena will take care of him. I know. But I'll bet he'd like to take care of Lena just once. After all, he's human. I tell you, that is not my hand. I had three aces. You accuse him of the cheating, and I'll shoot you dead. Oh, excuse me, Kitty. I better go fish Chester out of that. Emmett was dealing, wasn't he? I'll blow a hole in you, mister. Right now. All right, hold it, Lena. She's about to shoot me, Mr. Dillon. You bet I am. Lena, I don't know what it's like where you came from, but you shoot anybody around here, and you're going to go to jail. You'd put a woman in jail? For shooting, I would. For fighting? What? This is what. Well, now, here, he, he, he can put in jail for that, too, now. Now, here. This <laughs> oh, the game's closed, gentlemen, for half an hour. I need some beer, Emmett. Come on. Sure, Lena. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. 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 like that, it ain't fair. Uh, no, here, Chester. <laughs> Let me help you out. Oh. Come on. Oh. There. Well, are you all right? Why didn't you stop her, Mr. Dillon? She might have killed me. Well, I, I, I don't know, Chester. I never fought with a woman. Well, I have, and I don't want no more of it. Well, you can't hit her. What can you do with her? Leave her alone. That's what I'm going to do. You know, Chester, Lena could get to be quite a problem. Well, she ain't going to be my problem. I'm getting out of here. Oh, hello, Doc. 
Hey, you gonna have some breakfast? Oh, eh, no, I've already eaten. We'll have some coffee, though. Oh, good. They had me up real early this morning. No? Who did? A couple of men, Lena Wave, got mad at. Huh? She used the bottle on them. Oh, were they hurt bad? Oh, she bloodied them up some. It wasn't real serious, though. All they did was try to protect themselves. After all, what man's gonna fight a woman? Yeah, that's true. But one of these days, some drunk's not gonna realize she is a woman and he'll shoot her. Hmm. You wonder if it hasn't happened already? <clears throat> Oh, say, I hear Chester caught it all right when he accused Emmett of trying to cheat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found out later that it wasn't true, Doc. The other boys were just playing a joke on him. They switched his cards while he, he was under the table looking for some chips that he'd dropped. Oh, wonder all oh, that. Oh, if you ask me, a man that'll leave his hand while he crawls around on the floor deserves anything that happens to him. Well, just about everything did. Mr. Dillon? Oh, here he is. He'll tell you. Uh, uh, Mr. Dillon? Oh, say, you better come too, Doc. Huh? Uh, what's the trouble, Chester? Lena Wave. She just shot a man over at the Dodge house. What? Oh, say, we better get... Oh, Is the man dead, Chester? He sure is, Doc. Where's Lena? She's still there. Claims it was self-defense. Did you see it? Mm, yes, sir. I was right there. Lena was getting her room key at the desk, and this buffalo hunter come in and grabbed her. Well, he was pretty drunk. Uh, drunk? At this hour of the morning, he was drunk? Well, I guess he'd been up all night, Doc. Anyhow, he tried to kiss her. He must have been drunk. He got her gun hand behind her back, and then he pushed her up again in the desk. Oh, she was swearing at him something terrible. Well, how did she shoot him, Chester? Well, sir, she just ooched around and squirmed herself along the desk till she'd rubbed her six-gun around on the other side. Then she just pulled it out with her free hand and shot him in the belly. She did? Oh, oh my, she's quite a woman, ain't she? She sure is. She's waiting with Emmett right inside here, Mr. Dillon. Everybody else took cover. They're scared to death of her. What are you here for, Doc? Eh? You can't do him no good. Eh, well, I, I, I just come to take a look at him. Let's see. Oh, yes, he looks dead all right. He's dead. Why did you kill him, Lena? Well, I had to protect myself, Marshal. Nobody else would. Including Emmett here. I... I figured you'd take care of him yourself, Lena. You always do. Sure. But if you was a man, you'd do it for me. Oh, now, Lena, look how big he is. He ain't very big anymore. All it takes is a gun, Emmett. Sure, Lena. There are too many people carrying guns around here already. I'm gonna take yours, Lena. What for? I killed him in self-defense. He wasn't even armed. Except for that Bowie knife. You're forgetting something, Marshal. What? I'm a woman. So? So? You mean to tell me a woman ain't got the right to protect her virtue in this town? What do you men come to, anyway? Well, by, oh, by, oh, yes, she's got a point there. Uh, ain't no judge in the world that wouldn't call it self-defense. No, you're right, Lena. I keep forgetting. You know I'm right. Emmett? We ain't had breakfast yet, and I'm hungry. Come on. Sure, Lena. You know, I've been thinking, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what about, Chester? Well... Oh, Lena could have let that fella kiss her this morning, just a little peck anyway, and she wouldn't have had to shoot him. Yeah, she could have, but she didn't. I declare, she's enough to curdle cream. Well, I hope everybody leaves her alone from now on. Marshal Dillon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Nate Bannister. Well, I'm glad to know you. You won't be, if what I hear is true. Oh? Uh -huh. Jim Henry was my friend, Marshal. Is that so? Nobody's going to shoot a friend of mine and get by with it. Not even a woman. He was drunk, Nate, and he was treating her bad. And it's no call to kill him. In this country, a woman's free to protect herself any way she can. Yeah. That's what everybody I've talked to say. Well? Don't sit with me. 
You going to arrest her? No. Okay, then. Now, oh, wait a minute. What? Where are you going? I'm Marshal. I'm going to kill me a woman. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night on CBS Radio's Suspense, hear Jeff Chandler in Death at Strykerud Pond. It's an exciting trial in which a young man faces death because of his decisions made as a member of a World War II underground. It's a fascinating study in suspense, and it's yours to hear this Monday night over most of these same stations at the Star's Address. Monday, suspense. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Nate Bannister was obviously a buffalo hunter, same as his friend who had been shot that morning. He was a huge man with a heavy black beard and eyebrows so thick it was hard to tell if he was looking at you or not. I watched him as he stood in the doorway, having just said that he was going to kill Lena Wave. And I realized that a man that primitive was capable of doing anything, even shooting a woman. I wasn't sure how to stop it, unless I shot him first. The way I was brought up, Marshal, that's what friends is for. If somebody kill you, then they gotta kill them. You do any killing around here, Nate, and you'll be tried for it. Maybe. If you catch me. I'll catch him. Why you gotta protect women, Marshal? Just because they're so weak and puny. Is that Nate Bannister? Huh? You heard me. Why? Yes, ma'am. I'm Nate Bannister. Well, they didn't tell me you was so big. Who didn't tell you? How'd you know my name? You've been spreading it around that if the marshal don't arrest me, you'll shoot me. That true? Are you leaning away? I am. And if there's going to be any shooting, I want in on it. Now, wait a minute, Lena. I ain't going to get bushwhacked by no dirty buffalo hunter, marshal. Bushwhacked? I wouldn't do that to nobody. Especially the uh, lady... Lady? Yes, ma'am. He called me a lady, Marshal. Well, you are, ain't you? Of course I am. Yeah, what's the matter with calling you one? Nothing. I kind of like it. Just because you ain't pale and skinny like ordinary women? No. Of course I ain't. Why, I... I never seen a woman like you. Nowhere... You're kind of admirable. <laughs> Listen to him, Marshal. Ain't he a one? Oh, I mean it. I sure do. Oh. I sure do. No, you don't. I'm too big. Too big? Why, you want to be like all them little scrawny women? They can't do nothing. They're no good. They ain't. Oh, no. A real man needs someone uh, 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 better than that. He does? Of course he does. Like me? Yeah. Like you. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> you was going to shoot me a minute ago. Oh, no. I didn't mean nothing by that. Hey, come on. I'll buy you beer. We'll talk about it. Well, okay. Go on, Marshal. Yeah. Don't you worry about nothing, Marshal. Oh, 
Chester! Yes, sir? That jug of corn whiskey's still out back. Yes, sir, it was last time I looked. Go and get it. Those two make quite a couple, Matt. Look at them. They've been sitting there most all day. Yeah, a pretty shaggy pair of lovebirds, if you ask me. How's Emmett taking all this? Well, he didn't find him till a couple of hours ago. No? What happened? Who oh, where is he? Nate ran him off. He probably had done more, but Lena wouldn't let him. You know, Matt, I think underneath she's real fond of that little Emmett. Yeah? <laughs> and she's got a strange way of showing it. Women do sometimes. Well, it doesn't matter as long as she keeps out of trouble. She leads quite a life, doesn't she? Shoots a man in the morning and falls for his best friend in the afternoon. <laughs> she might have shot both of them if Nate hadn't started sweet-talking her. Well, he made her feel like a woman, that's what. Oh, sure. Nothing wrong with that, is there? It probably saved his life. All right, mister. Now you get away from What's her. What's the matter, Emmett? Yeah. You heard me. I thought you'd gone home. I ain't going home. Not without Lena, I ain't. <laughs> yes, you are. Lena and me is going to get married. I didn't say that. I ain't had time to tell you. I'm... I'm warning you, mister. <clears throat> Excuse me, Kitty. Yeah. I better stop this. <laughs> Look, fella. I'm going to kiss her. Watch. No. Hold it, Emmett. <laughs> oh! <laughs> All right, Emmett. Give me that derringer. Sure, Marshal. Chester! Yes, sir, here I am, Mr. Dillon. Get Nate's gun before he comes to. All right, sir, I'll get it. All right, then take him over to Doc's, huh? He doesn't look too bad hurt. No, sir, he ain't. I'll take care of him. Em. You shot him. I know. You shot him. Over me. Well, he was stealing you, Lena. And you went and shot him. I was kind of ashamed this morning when that other fella tried to kiss you. You're a man after all, Emmett. I couldn't stand losing you, Lena. Oh, I didn't care nothing about him. You didn't? No. I was just tired of not being treated like a woman. He called me a lady and kind of lost my head. That's all. Well, Emmett kind of lost his head, too, you know. All right, Emmett. Come on. You're going to jail. No, Marshal, please. Come on. Get going, Emmett. All right. My husband goes to jail. So do I. Your husband? Of course. We've been married ten years, Marshal. I always knew it wasn't a mistake. Well, he's still going to jail. Please, Marshal, don't take him. Of course I'll take him. He just shot a man, didn't he? He was only protecting his lawful wedded wife. You've got to let me go with him. Well, I can't leave him now. I've been waiting ten years for him to treat me like a woman. Oh, please, Marshal. Look, Lena, there's been nothing but trouble since you hit Dodge. Please, Marshal. When Nate gets patched up, he'll be gunning for Emmett here. Emmett'll kill him next time. All right, all right, Lena. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Get out of Dodge, both of you. Right now. You mean it? If you hurry. Oh, thank you, Marshal. Hey, let's go, Emmett. Wait a minute. What? Huh? Take my arm. All right. Now, Lena. Come on. Sure, Emmett. Sure. Go 
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg with Vic Perrin and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Mr. and Mrs. North of CBS Radio get into an arty crowd, an artful crowd, too, when mixed paints and mixed emotions make murder. Here are collector's item, Ham and Jerry's latest thriller, leading them a merry chase mid works of art before they nab their killer. It's on most of these same stations Tuesday night. On the same evening, you have a date for thrills with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Don't forget. George Walsh speaking. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Mr. Dillon, would you mind stopping at the Alapaganza here for a minute? Pretty early in the day, isn't it, Chester? Oh, I don't want a drink. Oh? No, the bar keeps holding some money for me. I won a little last night, and I didn't want to put it back in the game. Ah, but you want to get it now so you can put it back tonight, is that it? Yes, sir, I'm afraid it is. <laughs> okay. Mike? You come for your money, Chester? Yep. Hello there, Marshal Dillon. How are you, Mike? Well, here you are, Chester. Three, four, five, six. Thanks, Mike. Uh, here. Buy yourself a drink. Yeah, I sure will. See you tonight, Chester. Sure. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. I heard the bartender call you Marshal Dillon. Well, that's right. I got something to tell you, Marshal. Go ahead. It's important. Well, okay. You're going to die, Marshal. Who are you, mister? Wilbur Hawkins. I'm a whiskey drummer. First time I've been to Dodge, though. I worked around St. Louis till they sent me out here... Liked it better in St. Louis. There are lots of important people there. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? You're going to die, Marshal. I heard them saying so. You heard who saying so? Well, I don't know their name. It was dark, and they weren't there long. I didn't dare say anything, or they'd have known I was listening. And then, of course, I'd never heard of you till just now, that is. Uh, I... You're not making much sense, mister. Okay. Oh, it makes sense, all right. You see, I rode the Santa Fe out here from St. Louis... And one night, I was all wrapped up trying to sleep. And these two men came by and stood there in the aisle. One gave the other $300. 
He said it was to kill Marshal Dillon. But he didn't say where. So, of course, I didn't know till just now. Is that all you know about it, Mr. Hawkins? Yeah, that's all, Marshal. Hmm. I've done my duty now. I'll be going. Goodbye. Well, what do you make of that, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. He acts a crazy like. I don't know whether to believe him or not. No. But I suppose we'll find out soon enough. sound asleep already, and it's only just got dark out, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's got nothing else to do till Tom Smith gets here. Is that who you're holding him for? Well, I thought I told you, Chester. Yeah, but Tom Smith's sheriff of Tascosa, ain't he? Sure. Why? I thought this fellow was wanted in Abilene. No, they never heard of him in Abilene. That's why I wired Tom. Well, I'm going out back for a minute, Chester. I think I left my new bridle on the hitching rail out right there. Yes, sir. Well, I better get this place swept up a little, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> That's a good idea. There, Chester. Stay there. Hey, Mr. Dillon, you, you've been shot. Well, I was trying to play possum, Chester. I wanted to get him to come up where I could see him. Oh. But he's gone now. You scared him away. He ran down the alley there. Oh, he'll be lost in the crowd, but now... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it doesn't matter, Chester. What? He probably thinks I'm dead. So I'll just go on playing possum. How do you mean? Come on, let's go up to Doc's office. I'll tell you there. What would you say that whiskey drummer's name is, Matt? Wilbur Hawkins, Doc, but you never heard of him. This is his first time in Dodge. Well, you think he'd have sense enough to have followed those two men to find out who they were? Yeah, he was probably scared to death, Doc. Yeah, and anyway, he kind of acts like he got hit by lightning somewhere. Even when he's standing still, he gives you the feeling that he's sort of walking sideways like a crab, if you know what I mean. No, I don't, but uh, I'd sure think twice before asking you to explain, Chester. Well, what is it you have in mind to do now, Matt? Nothing, Doc. Nothing? No, Chester's going to do the work for a while. I'm just going to sit up here in your office and wait. Wait? Wait for what? Well, when Chester spreads the word around that I'm dead, whoever wants me that way is going to make his play. He'll come right out into the open and do whatever he's got planned. And then I'm going to give him a little surprise. Oh, Mr. Dillon, that's a wonderful idea. Now, now why didn't I think of that? You better get going, Chester. I'm kind of anxious to meet this man. Him and his gunman. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but only one thing. Ain't the boys likely to run a little wild when they hear you're not around to keep the lid on things? Yeah, they might. But we'll have to take the chance. Okay, sir. I'll get started. Well, I kind of think Chester's right, Matt. There's a lot of men in Dodge who are just waiting for an excuse like this. If it gets too bad, I'll just have to come to life again. <laughs> Tell me something, Doc. What are you going to do to... Uh... Entertain me while I'm waiting up here, huh? Say, I never thought about that. I... Oh, I suppose I gotta feed you, too. <laughs> You'd be a mighty poor host if you didn't. Well, how long do you figure on staying here, anyway? I don't know, Doc, but I don't think it'll be very long. Well, you, uh, want to play a little cribbage, or, uh, would you rather fix supper first? <laughs> You're the first dead man I ever saw with an appetite. Well, I'll go get the cribbage board, but I'm making no promises about supper. Doc, what time's it getting to be? Um, let me see. It's nearly midnight, man. Yeah. How long are you going to wait up? Well, until something happens, I guess. Now, Chester will let me know. Town seems quiet enough so far. 
Maybe nothing's going to happen. They didn't try to kill me just for the fun of it, Doc. No, no, I guess not, man. All right, answer it, Doc. After I get to the back room. It's, uh, maybe it's a patient. I'll be holding a gun on him anyway. I'm coming. I'm coming. Kitty, what are you doing here this time of night? I might tell you if you ask me in, Doc. Well, of course. Come in. Come in, Kitty. Come in. Where's the corpse, Doc? What's that? The body. I expected to find him all laid out. Oh, you mean Matt. You, uh, don't seem too upset about the corpse, Kitty. Oh, all that talk didn't fool me. <laughs> Just didn't make sense, Chester, running around telling everybody you've been killed. No, why not? I know Chester too well. If you were dead, he wouldn't be acting like that. <laughs> no, I guess he wouldn't. Where is he, anyway? I haven't seen him for a couple of hours, but most everybody else believes it, Matt. Now they do, huh? Mm-hmm. Good. I don't know what you're up to, but I figure someone's been trying to kill you. Is that right? Yeah. Ambush, Kitty. That's not the way he's telling it, Matt. Not the way who's telling it. I never saw him before, but there's a man standing at the bar of the Texas Trail bragging about outdrawing you. You mean he's admitting he killed me? I kind of thought you'd like to know. That's him, Matt. This is what you've been waiting for. Is there anybody with him, Kitty? No. He's alone, as far as I know. Anyway, you better come to life again, Matt. There's going to be trouble if you don't. There hasn't been any trouble yet, has there? No, but they're working themselves up to it. Yeah. Well, maybe I'd better not wait any longer. But I'd like to take that gunman's employer along with me, though. You can find out who it is, Matt. Beat it out of him. You better come with me, Kitty, so you can point this man out. Yeah. And you take cover in case he wants to fight. Any man who's coward enough to shoot you in the dark isn't going to face you now, Matt. Yeah, maybe not, Doc, but uh, you never know. There he is, Matt. Tall fellow in the black hat. He's kind of drunk. Okay, Kitty. I was just waiting. For you wait outside while I see how he's going to behave. Okay, Matt. Good luck. Thanks. I'm Marshal Dillon, Mister. Oh. Who are you? I'm Tom Rogers. I thought you was dead, Marshal. I changed my mind. What do you want? You've been bragging about shooting me. Just talk, Marshal. I didn't mean nothing by it. I was just talking. Mm-hmm. Kind of dangerous talk, don't you think? Everybody said you was dead. Well, I was waiting for you to come out of your hole, Rogers. You know, I don't like getting ambushed. Marshal, I never even seen you before. I didn't ambush you. All right, turn and face the bar while I take your gun. Go on. I ain't going to try nothing. You got the wrong man, Marshal. Okay, you can turn around. You can't arrest a man just for talking. The jail's right across the street, Rogers. You lead the way. Well, it was just talk, I tell you. You can't prove nothing. Get going. I swear I didn't try to kill you, Marshal. Straight ahead, Rogers. When we get there, you're going to do some more talking. I want to know who hired you. Nobody hired me. I ain't even got a job. Hey, Mr. Dillon, I want to tell... Mr. Dillon, what are you doing out here? Who's this fellow? His name's Rogers, Chester. He's been bragging about shooting me. I was just having a little fun. I ain't no gunman. It doesn't take much of a gunman to try to ambush a man. But I didn't do it, Marshal. I heard him talking about it, and I don't know why I started saying I'd uh, done Mr. it. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what, Chester? Mr. Dillon, I was on my way up to dock. I, I was coming to tell you something. Well? I, I've been over to Alaforganza. I declare I, I just don't understand it. Well, say it, Chester. Yes, sir. Well, there's a fellow over there, and he's been bragging about shooting you, too. What? Yes, sir, that's right. 
He's saying he outdrawed you and killed you. Of course, he's a little drunk. Yeah. Yeah, of course he is. Though it was Rogers here till I scared him sober. Sure. Sure, I've been drinking, Marshal. I wouldn't have talked like that if I'd been plumb sober. Here. Here's your gun, Rogers. You turning me loose? It's like you say, Rogers. You're just a big talker. What about the fellow over at the Alifaganza? I don't even want to see him, Chester. He'll shut up fast enough when he hears I'm still around. And you go on back to the bar, Rogers. Unless the men laugh you out of town. Yes, sir. I'm sure sorry I done it, Marshal. All right, get going. Sure, I'm going. I don't know what's the matter with me, Chester, not figuring this. I might have known there'd be at least a couple of drunks wanting the reputation for having killed me. Yes, sir. Doggone it. Now we're right back where we started from. Yeah. Hey, maybe that whiskey drummer was lying, too. No, you're forgetting I got shot at, Chester. And there's a man somewhere in Dodge still waiting to kill me. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... This Monday night on most of these same CBS radio stations, hear Ida Lupino and Edmund O'Brien in the stirring screenplay adaptation of The Star on the Lux Radio Theater. It's a hard-hitting drama about a has-been who attempts a comeback in a juvenile role. This will be Lux Radio Theater, drama at its best, Monday night at The Star's Address. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Where's a man down, living from day to day, waiting for a bullet in the back, and not knowing who to expect it from, or when? Makes you feel kind of helpless. And before long, in spite of everything you try to do to stop it, you get kind of spooky. And you start shying at the most ordinary noise, especially if it comes from behind you. No way to stay alive. Because this is the one time you need to be as calm and clear as you've ever been in your life. Well, I had a week of it. And nothing happened. Until Chester came into the office one day with a telegram from Sheriff Tom Smith of Tascosa. I thought I'd better get right over here at this, Mr. Dillon. Might be important. You told me it was from Tom Smith, Chester. Yes, sir. It is. Well, if you know that, how come you don't know what the message is? Oh, well, I didn't read it too close, Mr. Dillon. Here. <clears throat> Thanks. He's coming for his prisoner. He'll be here on the stage. Day after tomorrow, the way I figure it. Now, uh, anything else? What? Well, is that all it says here? Yes, sir, that's all. Now, there's just one thing you missed, Chester. What's that? The date it was sent. It got delayed somewhere along the line. Tom's due in today. He is. Yeah, what time is it? About noon, I guess. Well, that stage ought to be here right now. Come on, let's go see. All right. Sir. Well, there it is, Mr. Dillon. Must have pulled in just a minute ago. I don't see no passengers, though. Well, that may be because they haven't got out yet, Chester. Yes, sir. Right, here they come. Ain't that Tom Smith? Yeah, that's him. Well, who's that other fella? He looks kind of familiar. Now, that's Wilbur Hawkins, Chester, that little whiskey drummer. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, now, I've been wondering where he's been. Matt. Matt Dillon. Hello, Tom. Hey, how are you, Matt? Hello, Chester. Hello, Mr. Smith. Well, I'm sure glad that trip's over. Next time, I'll come horseback. Now, the stage is easier when you're taking a prisoner back, though. I guess you're right at that, Matt. And I hope you still got him. I'd hate to make this trip for nothing. <laughs> oh, he's there. Anytime you want him. Hey, where's Wilbur Hawkins going? Ain't he even going to say hello? You know that little fellow? Oh, yeah, we know him. He told me he's staying at the Dodge house. Crazy talkingest man I ever run into. 
I told him, Hawkins, if you tried thinking it a little first, you might make a whole lot more sense a whole lot faster. Well, he means well, Tom. Well, maybe. But he tells some mighty strange stories. Oh, what do you mean? Well, of course it could be true, but he told me he heard a couple of men in a bar talking about me. He didn't know who they meant till I introduced myself on the stage and he recognized my name. Well, what are you looking like that for, man? Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead, Tom. What did Hawkins hear? Well, he said this one fellow was going to give the other fellow $300 to shoot me. <laughs> Ain't that the darndest thing? Yeah, that sure is. I don't know, Matt. There's a lot of men that like to kill me, but I don't believe they'd be standing around talking about it that way. I kind of think he made it all up. No, he didn't make it up, Tom. Not quite. Huh? You know something about this? You mean someone is out to shoot me? Yeah. Who? I'll tell you about it on the way over to the Dodge house. You wait here, Chester, just in case he gets past us. All right, Chief. He ain't gonna get past us. But I can't figure, Matt... Why, Hawkins would want to kill you and me. Now, that doesn't make much sense, Tom. Mm -hmm. Now, here it is. Who is it? It's Tom Smith and Matt Dillon, Hawkins. What are you doing here? We want to talk to you. Open up, Hawkins. Tom, get out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, How did you know he was going to shoot, Matt? Well, I just sensed it, I guess. Look, I can kick that door open with one foot, and then you cover me. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I kill you! Kill him, Matt. Well, I tried not to. Hawkins. You hit me. No. I'm going to die. I had to shoot, Hawkins. But why did you want to kill us? Smith and me. A lot of people want to. Hear them saying. Nobody said nothing. You made all that up, Hawkins. You took a shot at me last week, didn't you, Hawkins? Didn't you? No, Dad. I can't kill anybody now. Why? Why did you want to, Hawkins? Tell me. I killed other men. Important men. I told them about it first. And then, then I killed them. Why, Hawkins? I don't know. I had to. I had to do it. Die. Uh, he's dead, Tom. Matt, what the devil was he talking about? I don't know. But it doesn't matter much. I don't understand it. I never saw him before yesterday. Now, Hawkins was a murderer, Tom. The kind that doesn't need any particular reason. Nobody will ever know why he did what he did. Yeah, he was crazy, if you like. Sure was crazy. You think he's done a lot of killing, Matt? Yeah, probably. That's the most dangerous kind of man there is, Tom. A murderer with... No reason at all. <laughs> Innocent looking little whiskey drummer.
Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Edgar Barrier, John Daner, and Vic Perrin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. You've heard fictional crime cases many times, but there's nothing like the real thing. We're talking about Night Watch. This Monday night, following the Bob Trout news, you'll be on the scene when a burglar is caught in the act. You'll hear him break a glass window in trying to get away. You'll hear the officers handcuff him and take him off to jail. You'll hear this authentic case unfold from beginning to end on Night Watch Monday night. George Walsh speaking. John Lund, as yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings you Colorful Mystery Tuesdays on the CBS Radio Network. to you by Chesterfield, America's most popular two-way cigarette. What a pair. Chesterfield king size at the new low price. Chesterfield regular. Around Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Mr. Dillon, I wonder what Dodge would be like if there wasn't always a crowd moving up and down Front Street. Uh-huh. Just look at them. Everybody going somewhere. <laughs> well, there are a lot of them that aren't going anywhere at all, Chester. Just drifting. Yes, sir, I guess you're right at that, Mr. Dillon. I know when I first come to Dodge, I sure didn't have nothing in mind. Leastwise, working for a U.S. Marshal like you. Oh, you must have had some reason to come here, Chester. Well, a uh, backwards-like reason, maybe. Huh? What do you mean? Well, it's like it wasn't to come here as much as it was to leave there. What? I say it's like it wasn't to come here as much as it was to leave there. Oh, oh you mean Texas? Yes, sir. Oh, oh. why? Mr. Dillon, Texas is mostly populated by my family. I got relatives, thick and thin relatives, all over Texas. Oh, <laughs> what's wrong with that? Why, it's like having somebody looking over your shoulder all the while that makes man spooky. Well, sir, I choose to do my sinning where nobody don't know me. Hello, Matt and Chester. Well, how are you, Doc? Where are you headed for, Doc? No place, Matt. I'm just walking around. Now, you see, Chester? See what I mean? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, now, what's the matter with just walking around? Does a man have to be going someplace every minute? <laughs> Anyway, you're a fine pair to be criticizing people. Sitting here like a couple of fat horny toads in the now sun. Now, slow down, Doc. Slow yeah. down. You're burning up all your fuel. Well, who's this fella? Which one of you men's Doc Adams? I am. Come on, I got a job for you. Well, is that so? But you don't look very sick, mister. It ain't me. It's a man in camp. Camp? A couple of miles up the Arkansas. We're holding the trail herd there. What part of Texas you from, mister? We got 3,000 head of San Saba Longhorn. And it's been a plum miserable drive all the way, and I ain't no temper to answer any more fool questions. All now, right, let's then, get don't going, answer. Don. Now, hold up a minute there, young fella. Now, 
Uh, what's the matter with this man of yours? You'll see when you get there. Well, tell me now, else how will I know what to take? Look, Doc, it wasn't my idea to come get you. Ken Talley made me come. Uh, and who's uh, Ken Talley? The trail boss. Now, you ready to go? Well, you tell me what's wrong with the man, and I'll go. Doc. Uh, what? Um, I think I'll ride out with you. Who are you? My name's Dillon. Well, you're the marshal here, ain't you? That's right. Well, we don't need no marshal out there. Chester, go get our horses, huh? We'll ride out with Doc. Yes, sir. I brought the Doc, Ken. How many doctors they got in Dodge anyway, Choke? That's the Doc there. Well, who are these other two? My name's Matt Dillon, Tully. This is Chester Proudfoot. How do you do, Mr. Tully? Dillon, huh? Eh? Well, I didn't send for you, Marshal. Yeah, I know you didn't. Then what are you doing here? That's the sick man lying in the blanket over there by the fire. You can get mounted and ride right back to Dodge, all three of you. We don't need Doc no more. Oh, no, you don't, mister. If that man's sick, I'm going to take a look at him. He's it. all right, Doc. Forget him. Come on, Doc. Well, Doc? He's dead, man. Mighty contagious disease, too. Oh? I've found that when one man gets shot, it usually leads to somebody else getting shot sooner or later. Who killed this man, Tully? How'd it happen? I don't figure it's none of your business, Marshal, but since you're so nosy, I'll tell you. He shot himself. That's a lie. He couldn't have shot himself. Why not, Doc? Because he was shot in the back. That's right. Uh-huh. You're going to tell me who did it, Tully? No, Marshal. I ain't going to tell you nothing. Tell her your man Choate here told us that you've had a hard drive up from the San Saba. Hard? We fought Indians and thieving Kansas jayhawkers and bad weather and stampedes the whole way, Marshal. But we're still ready to fight Dodge City if we have to. Well, you've been through a lot, Tully, and I know how edgy it's made you. All of you. But this man's been murdered, and i got to have the murderer. His name's Bud Cowan. Whose name? Him. There. Who killed Bud Cowan? It's no use, Marshal. I got 18 Texas cowboys here. Well, 17, and there ain't a one of them that'll talk. Look, Tully, you're a responsible man, or you wouldn't be trail boss. Now, you know what the law means. You know what it's for. Kansas law ain't for Texans, Marshal. We'll fight our own snakes. I'm not a Kansas, Marshal. I'm a United States Marshal, but the law's the same. It don't matter. No Texan's gonna get hung in Kansas, leastwise not as long as I'm around. And there ain't a thing you can do about it, Marshal. Yes, there is. Like what? You men are kind of hankering to buck the tiger in Dodge, aren't they? Of course they are. For three months, they ain't talked to nothing else. So if they don't get the Dodge, they're going to be mighty unhappy. Maybe one or two of them will decide to talk. Marshal, how are you going to keep 17 juiced-up Texas cowboys out of Dodge? They'll ride right over you. No, I can't keep them out, Tully, but I can fix it so there won't be anything for them when they get there. What do you mean? I'll close Front Street, every saloon, every gambling table, every store. I'll close them up tight. You do that? And if you knew me well enough, you wouldn't ask. Come on, Doc. Chester. You think it over, Tully. What a pair. What a buy. King-size Chesterfield. Now at the new low price. And Chesterfield regular. They're the quality twins. The same highest quality. The same low nicotine. Either way you like them, you get the same wonderful taste and mildness. A refreshing smoke every time. Change to Chesterfield. America's most popular two-way cigarette. Yes, the Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. What a pair. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. They satisfy millions. They're best for you.
It sure didn't take long for the word to get around, did it, Mr. Dillon? Ken Tolley followed us to town yesterday, Chester. He's smart enough to know how the businessmen would react. You mean he come in here and told them all about it? Yeah, of course he did. Oh, hello, Marshal. Hello, John. Well, here's the Dodge house, Chester. You better wait out here. Huh? Okay, sir. Mr. Green said they'd be waiting for you right in the lobby. Yeah. I'm glad you came, Marshal. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Green? Well, yeah. well, no, no, quiet, gentlemen, please. I'll do the talking. Marshal Dillon, as you can see, most of Dodge's leading businessmen are present here. Miss Tompkins, Mr. Jonas, Mr. Botkin, Mr. Teeters. Yes, sir. And I'm here as owner of the Dodge House. Marshal, you know why we're here as well as we do. Because I told Ken Tully I'd close Front Street. Huh? Exactly. And we won't stand for that, Marshal. We need that Texas money, and we're going to get it. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. A man was murdered out at that camp. Oh, he was just some Texas cowboy, Marshal. The prosperity of Dodge is certainly more important than him. Don't you agree, gentlemen? Now, wait a minute. You mean that you so-called good citizens of Dodge are putting a few dollars above the value of the law? Even above the value of a human life? Don't preach to us, Marshal Dillon. All the men you killed. Mr. Green, I never killed a man in my life except in the performance of duty or in self-defense. <clears throat> All right. All right, that's not important. We're wasting now. time, gentlemen. I'm hired to enforce the law, and I'm going to do it any way I see fit. Now, is that clear? Well, then we'll complain about you, Marshal. Sure will. We'll all write letters to Washington and have you fired. You will, huh? Good. Fine, that's fine. Then maybe I can get a little sleep for a change. Start walking around like an ordinary man instead of jumping at shadows thinking somebody's about to shoot me any minute. Yeah, go ahead. And maybe I can afford to have a few friends again instead of everybody looking at me sideways like I was some kind of a rattlesnake. Gentlemen, I might not have to kill anybody again as long as I live. Yeah, yeah, go on. Write your letters. You'll be doing me a great big favor. Oh, and just one more thing. There's just about enough money in this job of mine to pay for my ammunition. But I'm still going to close up Front Street. What did you say to Mr. Green and them other men yesterday? Huh? Why? Oh, I don't know. I'm just curious. Well, I said the same thing that you'd say, Chester. <laughs> At least I hope you would. Oh, yes, of course I would. And I sure do thank you, Mr. Dillon. I'm mighty proud to have you say that. <laughs> but you don't know what I told them, Chester. Oh, it don't matter. I trust you. You know what you're doing. Well, thank you, Chester. I'm glad somebody thinks so. Well, of course, I, I've seen you make mistakes sometimes. Well, I mean, nobody ain't perfect much. It, it, it's a simple thing for anybody. Uh, uh, well, why don't you go on to the depot and pick up the mail, Chester? Uh -huh. Yes, sir, by going that right, Santa Fe just come in over an hour ago. And I... Good morning, Marshal. Well, Ken Tully. Marshal, this here Sam Peoples are brought with me. Huh? Hello, people. Hello. Marshal, I done a lot of thinking the last day or so. No. Yes, sir. I've decided you're right about the law and all. 
So I went and brought Sam Peoples in. You mean he killed that man, Bud Cowan? He sure did. And these five cowboys that witnessed it, Marshal, including myself, all be glad to testify at the trials any time you say. Is that right, Peoples? Did you kill Bud Cowan? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what happened to your face? Fall off a horse or something? Yes, sir. I, I come loose off in the Bronx yesterday. Uh-huh. Okay, lock him up, Chester. All right, sir. Everything all right now, Marshal? Well, I'll let you answer that, Tully. <laughs> no hard feelings on my side. Just don't let him get away now. One murder is all I can produce for you. <laughs> See you later, Marshal. Well, come on, people. The cells is out back here. Uh, wait a minute, Chester. Yes, sir. Uh, bring him back here. Huh? Yes, sir. Come on, people. Peoples, tell me something. Are you a Texan? No, sir, I ain't, Marshal. And what are you doing with that San Saba outfit? Well, I run into them when they was bringing their cattle across the Cimarron, sir. They hired me on just for grub. And I wanted to get to Dodge real bad. Yeah, I see. That uh, bronc you fell off of yesterday, did he drop on your face? Yes, sir. Well, sort of. Mm -hmm. I'd sure like to see that horse. You would? Yeah. It'd be kind of interesting to see a horse that's got hooves like a man's fist. Yes, sir. There's not much you can do about this, is there, Peoples? No, sir. They're all going to swear I done it. Do you know who did? No, sir, I don't. I, I was out riding herd when it happened. And none of them fellas ever talked to me much, anyways. Well, you're in a tough spot. Yes, sir. Unless I can find out who did kill Bud Cowan, you're going to have to stand trial. But I'll do what I can for you. If that happens. Thank you, Marshal. I, I don't guess there's much anybody can do. All them fellas testifying. Well, we'll see. Uh, go get him something to eat, will you, Chester? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll be out on the street. Ken Tully's men are going to be feeling free to do about anything. I could picture Tully and his men when he got back to camp, laughing at how they'd put it over on me and the rest of Dodge. I figured Mr. Green and his businessmen had talked to Tully, but I was sure they didn't know Sam Peoples was an innocent man. And neither did they understand the kind of trouble that tampering with the law could lead to. For the Texans, the lid was off. They felt that they were running the town, that nothing could touch them. And all I could do was wait. So I went over to the Texas Trail and sat with Kitty for a while, watching the crowd. I'm glad you're here, Matt. Otherwise, I'd have to be drinking at the bar with one of those beat-up cowboys. Well, I hope I'm not costing you money, Kitty. You are, but I won't start. Anyway, it's better than trying to grin back at those cowboys. Well, those men have had a rough time coming up the trail, Kitty. Nobody asked them to come. <laughs> no, I suppose not. You know, Matt, I've worked in a lot of places, even the gold camps. Dodge is worse than any of them. Oh, is that so? Why? I don't know. Maybe the sun and the prairie take too much out of everybody. Seems like every man that comes to Dodge is out to get his own back somehow, even if he has to kill somebody to do it. <laughs> well, I guess I follow you, Kitty. All I'm saying is that maybe our hard life makes men kind of angry. They want to fight all the time. Well, something sure makes them want to fight, or at least get drunk. <laughs> Look at them. Hey, who's that coming this way, man? Huh? Yeah. Now, that's Ken Tully, the San Saba trail boss. Well, he sure looks like he wants to fight. Yeah, maybe he does, Kitty. Well, we'll soon see. We will return for the last act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. 
Tomorrow afternoon, almost 100,000 cheering people will pack Cleveland's Municipal Stadium for that great annual baseball classic, the All-Star Game. I guess there isn't a fan in the country who wouldn't like to be there. And you folks who are going will notice, towering above center field, the mammoth Chesterfield scoreboard. Now, if you visited the American League dugout tomorrow, you'd want to say hello to the Yankees' famous catcher, Yogi Berra. He's a Chesterfield smoker. Has been for seven years. And as he puts it, they're mild and they taste great. Yogi likes the regular size. Across the field in the National League dugout, there's another man you'd want to meet. The fabulous Stan the Man Musial of the St. Louis Cards. It stands 11th All-Star Game in his 11th year with Chesterfields. Now, he likes a long smoke, so he buys Chesterfield king size. What a pair they are. Musial and Barra. And what a pair these are. Chesterfield king size at the new low price and Chesterfield regular. It's America's most popular two-way cigarette. Try Chesterfields yourself. They satisfy millions. They're best for you. Evening, Marshal. Hello, Tally. You gonna introduce me to the lady? Nobody has to introduce anybody here, mister. My name's Kitty. Kitty, huh? Well, my name's Ken Talley. How about having a drink with me, Kitty? Sorry, I'm busy. Oh, come on, you ain't busy. You heard her, Tully. Go on back to the bar, huh? You're sure something, ain't you, Marshal? <laughs> Why don't you get going? Okay. Okay, I'll go. Sure, I will. Is he crazy or just drunk? I don't know, Kitty. Anyway, I'll bet he gets into trouble before the night's out. Well, if he does, there's plenty of room in jail for him. I take it you've already got a grudge against him. Yeah, I sure have. But it's not on my account. Huh? Who's? An innocent little fella called Sam Peoples. Sam Peoples? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Like a fight starting. Yeah. You stay here, Kitty. I'll be on the floor in a minute. All right, hold it there. Hold it. What's trouble, Marshal? You and this man settle your differences some other way, Choke. I won't have any gunplay here. Gunplay? Well, we weren't fighting, Marshal. Was we, Jim? <laughs> no. We was just haranguing each other, so... <laughs> Me and Jim always talk like that, Marshal. Don't we, ma'am? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why, look at that, Marshal. Kim Tyler's running off with the gal. <laughs> Sure. And I'll rub the rest of this bottle around in your face when you get up. All right, get out of the way, Kitty. Gladly, Matt. I fooled you, didn't I, Marshal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You sort of fooled me. Tully! Now, look at that, Marshal. That ain't no way to act. What's the matter with you, anyhow? All right, shut up! Marshal? Is Ada us here? You think you can whip all of us? No. No, I don't, Chote. Not eight of you. Well, then you're gonna get whipped. Come on, man. Just stay where you are, all of you. I'd be a fool to mix in a brawl with all of you men. I don't aim to try it. Looks like you ain't got much choice, Marshal. And we're gonna beat you about half to death. No, you're not. No? Well, what's to stop us? Don't look like nobody in here is gonna help you out. I'm carrying a gun, Choke. <laughs> oh, that. That don't bother us none, Marshal. Does it, man? Yeah. 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 See, Marshal? We don't care about your gun. There's too many of us. Aren't you forgetting something, Chote? What? I don't wear this gun to kill snakes with the way you men do. I'll have bullets in at least three of you before you get off a shot. And you'll be the first. What's the matter with you men? He's just bluffing. He's scared half to death right now. Chote, Chote. Forget about it, Chote. Don't be egging him on. Then I'll fight him. 
I ain't so bad with a gun. Don't try it, Chote. You shoot me, the boys will take care of you. Don't do it, Chote, I'm telling you. Ah, what's a Kansas Marshal? No. <laughs> Well, who's next? Any more of you men want to die in this place? All right, then get out of here and get on back to camp. Move. singing very loud this morning. How's your jaw, Telly? Busted. Doc said you busted it on this side right here. I'm sorry. I uh, guess I must have lost my temper. You sure did, Marshal. But the fight's out of me now. I'm plumb sober. You heard about Gil Choke? Chester told me. Choke shouldn't have gone up against you. No, he shouldn't. Well... Now he's dead. It don't matter none, I guess. What doesn't matter? Choate's the man that killed Bud Cowan, Marshal. That's why I made him come to town for Doc, kind of punish him that way. Oh? Uh -huh. Shot Cowan in the back. But I had to protect Choate anyway. You know how it is. What about Sam Peoples, Telly? Oh, him. Well, I'd have wrote you a letter from Texas, Marshal, saying it was a lie. Anyway, I'm selling them cattle. I aim to be out of here in two days, Marshal. Uh-huh. Okay, Tully. Get going. We uh, can be friends now, can't we, Marshal? You ever hear of a lawman with friends? We must have a couple. Yeah. Yeah, I have. A couple. So long, Tully. I'll tell Sam Peoples that uh, you didn't mean it. Here is our star, William Conrad. Thank you, George. You know, it's a wonderful cigarette we've been telling you about tonight. I mean, Chesterfield, of course, my cigarette. King size or regular, Chesterfields give you the taste and mildness you want every time you light up. So give them a try. They satisfy millions. You'll like them, too. Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Vic Perrin, John Daner, and Lawrence Dobkin. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Filter tip smokers, this is it. L and M filters. At last, a filter tip cigarette with much more flavor, much less nicotine. L and M's miracle tip contains alpha cellulose for effective filtration. It's the filter that counts, and L and M has the best. Yes, this is it. As Patricia Morrison puts it, L and M filters are just what the doctor ordered. Buy L and M filters. The light and mild smoke. Next week.
week at this same time, Chesterfield will bring you another story of the western frontier on Gunsmoke. This is the CBS Radio Network. Smoke, brought to you by L and M Filters with the miracle tip. King size, regular, both at the same low price. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, a transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Stage from Hayes got here, Mr. Dillon. Oh, that's good, Chester. There wasn't nobody on it, though. Oh, were you expecting somebody? No, sir, but that ain't the point. Oh? How can they run a stage line without no passengers? <laughs> well, I don't know, Chester, but the fewer people come to Dodge, the less trouble it means. Uh, yes, sir, but if people don't come here, you wouldn't have a job, Mr. Dillon. Oh, you think everybody in Dodge right now is an honest, law-abiding citizen, huh? Oh, no, sir. Is that what I said? <laughs> Is this the marshal's office? Yeah, I'm the marshal. Come on in, mister. Uh, my name's Pat Clay, marshal. Oh, how do you do? Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. Chester? Hello. Marshal, I got bad news for you. Well, nobody ever came here with good news, as far as I can remember. But what I got, well, it might get you killed. Oh, is that so? Now, now don't get me wrong. Not by me. No. No, sir, I, I don't shoot people. But you know somebody who does. Well, Jim Beetle, that's who. Jim Beetle? Here, Marshal, read this. They told me to bring it to you. Now, this looks like a court order. Who signed it? Judge Miller. You know him? Yeah, I know him. Uh, so Jim Beetle's squatting on some of your land you own up at Stone Point, is that it? Him and his wife, Marshal. You see, they moved into a sod house I built, and they won't leave. Well, how come they did that? Where were you? Well, to tell the truth, I let them. I didn't need it for a while, and he was homeless, and so I took pity on him. But I told them only for two months, and it's four months now. They won't leave, Marshal, and they say they'll shoot me if I ever come near them again. And you're saying they'll shoot me too, huh? Where do you meet him, Marshal? You'll see. All right, Clay. I'll ride out there tomorrow. Look at that, Mr. Dillon. What was Clay talking about? A sawed house? That's nothing more than a hut. It ain't even got windows, I can see. Yeah, it isn't much, is it? Hey, there's Beetle's wife now. Just, just come out here. What's she carrying a rifle for? Well, I guess Clay wasn't lying, Chester. 
I uh, think this is far enough. We'd better get on. Miss Beetle? Who are you? You know my name. I'm Marshal Dillon, ma'am, from Dodge, and this is Chester Proudfoot. Uh, pleased to meet you, Miss Beetle. Who are you looking for? Uh, nobody, ma'am. I, uh, I wanted to talk to you and your husband. Is he around? He's inside. Well, would you tell him that we're here? Mr. Beetle? What? Come out here. Don't forget your rifle. Where is that, Claire? Marshal from Dodd. What do you want, Marshal? Beetle, I've got a court order here that says that uh, you've got to move out of that house and off this land. Clay sent you. No, Clay didn't send me. But he got the order, and it's legal. And, well, it's my job to carry it out. I don't know nothing about all that. We ain't moving. Look, you can find some land of your own somewhere. Why do you want to squat on somebody else's? This is our land. All around Stone Point, here's ours. Bought and paid for. What do you mean, bought and paid for? Forty acres, paid a dollar fifty acre for it. Not more than a land is worth. We throwed in the hut and them hogs to boot. Who did? Who'd you buy it from? Clay's, who? Around now saying we don't own it wants us off of it. I told him last time I'd shoot him if he'd come near here again. Uh, Clay says that he was letting you live here for a while, helping you out. For $60, helping me out? I'm working this land, Marshal. Going to farm me some crops here. It ain't very good land, but we'll make it. Wait, if this is true, where is your deed for the place? Deed? You know, Mr. Beetle, that's that paper Clay gave us when we paid him the money. Oh, that. Well, do you have it? No. Oh, where is it? Well, he took it. What he did? What do you mean, he took it? Well, that was before he got mean about us moving off of here. Here's what happened. A few weeks back, Clay come by, said he'd be neighborly. He'd take a paper into Dodge and fix it up to the land office first. Something like that. Anyways, he took it. I see. Then your deed hadn't been registered. Huh? Marshal, I can't even read. I don't know what it was. Well, do you have any proof that you paid him the money? I don't need no proof. Other than I'm here and I'm going to stay. Huh. Where did you get the $60, Beetle? Work for it. Where's anybody get money unless they steal it? Clay stole mine. This land ain't worth twenty dollars. It's poor land. Then why did you buy it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you kind of like the name Stone Point. But I ain't moving, Marshal. Not for Clay, nor for you, nor for nobody. Well, if you can't prove it's yours, you're gonna have to move, Beetle. Marshal. My old woman's as good a rifle shot as I am. Practice every day. You don't know if I'm lying to you or not, do you, Marshal? No, I don't. Well, maybe you'll never know. But we ain't moving. Not alive, we ain't. All right, Beetle, I'll see what I can find at the land office. If your deed's been registered, well, then you're okay. You don't make no mind to me about that, Marshal. Or about who's lying or who ain't, neither. But we'll kill us anybody comes a bothering. Now, you get on back to Dodge. And you stay there. Nah, it's no use talking, Chester. Let's go. You tell Clay the same thing. I'll shoot him on sight. cigarette ever soared to such heights in so short a time. And still, L&M continues to break sales records everywhere, winning more and more smokers every day. What's the answer? It's the filter that counts. It's the filter that counts. And no filter compares with L&M's miracle tip for quality or effectiveness. This is why L&M gives you much more flavor, much less nicotine. A light and mild smoke. Remember, 
Only L&M gives you effective filtration. No other cigarette has anything like it. Buy a carton today and you'll say, This is it, L&M filter. This is it, something new. Now two sizes. L&M filter, new king size and regular too. This is it. L&M filters, L&M filters with the miracle tip. Join the trend to L&M. King size or regular? Both at the same low price. When do you think Marshal Dillon will be back, Chester? Well, he went over to the land office, Clay, looking up Beetle's deed. But he ought to be back most any time now. I should have told you them Beetles are nothing but liars. They sure fooled me when I first met them. Mm. They are kindly hard to get along with, I'll say that. I'd do it again, though. You would? I mean, help people out just because I got in trouble with them don't mean I ain't never going to help nobody again. I ain't that small a man. Mm. Oh, hello, Marshal. What'd you find out? Ah, oh, there's nothing at the land office. Well, of course there ain't. I went up to see Judge Miller. He's riding circuit through here now. What'd he say, Mr. Dillon? Well, the way things stand, the Beatles have got to move. Well, I can't feel sorry for them the way they acted. Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? I want you to ride out there and tell them they got a week. One week. Okay, Mr. Dillon. Well, that's settled. I, I sure hate to put you to all this trouble, Marshal, but a man can't lose his land. No, no, of course not. Even if it ain't the best land around. Well, I'll be going now. I'll, I'll see you next week after they've got off. Yeah, sure, Clay. So long. So long. Uh, that ain't going to be easy, Mr. Dillon. No, it isn't, Chester. Out in that flat country, you sure can't sneak up on nobody. And Clay says that sod hut's built like a fort. It's got no windows, and the door's four inches thick, and with a big bar on the inside, he says there's no way anybody busting in there. Yeah, it's solid, all right. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Dillon, maybe Clay's lying. Maybe they did buy it from him. Oh, that's a hard way to make $60, Chester. Sell some land and then get a hold of the deed and tear it up and then go to court and so on. Yes, sir, it sure don't make sense. Especially since they all admit the land's not much good. Well, somebody's lying. Yeah, but there's no way of proving who. Anyway, the law's on Clay's side, Chester. And I'll go with you. We'll tell them one week. And I hope nobody gets killed in this. Kitty. Hello, Matt. Sit down. I was supposed to meet Chester here. I thought I was in the wrong place when I saw you. I got tired of the Texas Trail, Matt. Got the elephants and might change my luck. Are you going to work here from now on? From now on's a long time, Matt. Yes, Chester. Just came in. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I'll give him time for a beer. I was talking to him this afternoon. He says you're taking on the Beatles tomorrow. Yeah, they've had their week. <laughs> From what I hear of them, I sure don't envy you that job. No, I'm not looking forward to it, Kitty. I met Jim Beetle once. He's a tough old turkey. Well, I wish I knew whether he's a liar or not. It's hard to tell with a man like that. He's a darn thin brain. Well, he's still smart enough to be a liar. So is Clay. Yeah? Clay's no killer, though. But I'll bet it wouldn't keep old Beetle awake night shooting somebody. No, I don't think it would. But why all this trouble over some land that neither of them think is any good? Maybe they're both crazy. <laughs> you know, I'm beginning to think they are, kidding. <coughs> hey, 
Hey, what's the matter, Kitty? You want some water? Huh? No, I'll be all right. <laughs> well, what started that? I don't know, Matt. <laughs> Suddenly got a whiff or something. Like, like breathing the fumes off a match. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Kitty, that's the best cough you ever had. Well, I'm glad you liked it. No, I mean for me it was. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, Chester's finished his beer. We got some work to do. Uh, good luck with the Beatles tomorrow, Matt. I think we'll have it, Kitty. Thanks to you. So long. <laughs> I wish there was a moon tonight, Mr. Dillon. A man can get shot in the moonlight, Chester. Well, the Beatles ain't gonna shoot us if we can't even find them. Well, it's right ahead of us. We better go afoot from here. Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, uh, you got everything, Chester? I got the bag of sulfur and saddle blanket, Mr. Dillon. Okay, now here's what we'll do. We'll sneak around back of the hut, and I'll help you up onto the roof. Well, that ridge pole might not prove stout enough for me and all that sod on it, too. What if it busts through, Mr. Dillon? Well, if it does, we're in trouble. You mean I'm in trouble? You're lighter than I am, Chester. Okay, sir. Now, there are only two openings in that hut, the door and the stovepipe. Mm. So far, they is. Look, if it's medals you want, Chester, you better go back to the Army. Well, forevermore, can't a man complain just a little? Yeah, sure, but later, huh? We're wasting time. Now, when you get up on the roof, you crawl over to the stovepipe. And pour that bag of sulfur down it. The coals in their stove will do the rest. And then I'll cover the pipe with this saddle blanket and just make it worse for him, hmm? That's right. I'll be waiting near the door for him. But you jump down and be ready to help me in case they come out fighting. This is going to make them awful mad, Mr. Dillon. You know what burning sulfur does to you. Well, I know what it does to Kitty. Well, you all set? Much as I'll ever be. I helped Chester up onto the roof and then moved around to the door and waited. My biggest worry was whether the Beatles would have time and think fast enough to come out armed and ready for trouble. The only thing I was sure of was that they'd come out. Sulfur fumes could drive a she-bear away from her young. I was thinking about that when I heard them inside. <laughs> Okay, Chester, they left their rifles. Come on down. Mr. Oh, get in. Oh, jump. Oh, I can't see it. Beetle, you and your wife stay right there. It's a marshal clear. Oh, Mr. Dillon. What the hell is on the roof? Yeah. <laughs> and Mark Clarell is getting a horse. You don't have to run. Nobody's going to hurt you. Mr. Dillon. Come on, hurry. I'm going to find my gun. You don't shoot us on Come on out of there, Chester. <laughs> you hurt? Well, I had my leg caught, but I got loose. I knew that doggone thing wouldn't hold. You're limping. How bad are you hurt? Oh, I just bruised it. It ain't nothing. Where's the beetles? That's them. You mean they got away? Oh, we weren't trying to arrest them, Chester. All I wanted was to get them outside unarmed so I could make them pack up and move out. <laughs> well, they've moved out. What with that roof all busted in? Oh, ain't it a mess? Uh, we'll carry out what stuff are theirs we can and load it on that wagon. They can pick it up and dodge. Tonight? No, we'll camp here tonight. Do it in the morning. I don't know about them beetles, Mr. Dillon. They ain't gonna quit this easy. Uh, maybe not. But at least we got them out in the open. I'm thinking it was more comfortable when they wasn't out in the open, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> This is it, L and M filters. This is it, light and mild. Coast to coast, smokers are saying better tasting filter tip cigarette. 
This is it. L and M filters. L and M filters with the miracle tip. Never before have smokers spoken so enthusiastically about a cigarette and backed up their words with record-breaking sales. Dorothy Kilgallen, the famous columnist, said, There's nothing like L&M's filter. Gives you more flavor, too. And this from actor Maurice Evans. My doctor suggested this filter. I recommend it to you as the best. Mrs. Charles Evans Hughes the third told us, Your L&M has the perfect filter. What a wonderful smoke you get. Yes, it's the filter that counts. And no filter compares with L&M's miracle tip for quality or effectiveness. Our statement of quality goes unchallenged. L&M is America's highest quality and best filter cigarette. Join the trend to L&M. L&M, king size or regular. And both at the same low price. Evening, Doc. Sit down and help me watch Front Street, Matt. <laughs> okay, Doc, I'll join you for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. yeah. Well, you got nothing better to do than sit out on the hotel porch here and stare at your fellow man? Fellow man? Oh, not my fellow man. All I have in common with most of these thieves and scallywags is fingers and toes and bones and skin and things like that. <laughs> I thought doctors were supposed to like people. Oh, yeah, well, who told you that? Some hard rock miner? Yeah. What does a miner know about doctors? Uh, you make it tough, Doc. I make what tough? Talk. Oh, I do. Oh, I make... Oh, I do. Well, I heard about how you talked the Beatles into getting off Clay's land out at Stone Point. Oh, you did real fine there. Well, we got them off anyway. They came into Dodge for their belongings this afternoon. Yes, I saw them, too. Oh, those poor... Oh, they, what are they going to do now? Uh, find some land of their own, maybe. You don't believe their story? I'm an agent of the law, Doc. It doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. The law demands proof. And they didn't have any. Mm. Oh, I understand, man. What? That, that's right down the street, Matt. Yeah. You better come, too, Doc. Uh, uh, yes. It's a little early in the evening for shooting, isn't it? Who told you that, Doc? Some hard rock miner? Uh, oh, well, I guess you're right, Matt. Yes. Well, anyway, maybe it's just some cowboy trying to bring down the moon. Well, there isn't any moon. Besides, there's, there's a crowd up there, too. What happened, Chester? Oh, I seen the whole thing. I wasn't 30 feet off. I was standing back there talking to Mr. Green about what his... What happened, Chester? Yes, sir. It's Clay, Mr. Gillen. Oh. You better get up there, Doc. Looked like he was shot bad. Who shot him? Jim Beetle. He walked right up to him on the street there and pulled out a gun and shot him twice. Uh, where's Beetle now? That first alley, he ran up there. Yeah. Doc, go take care of Clay. Oh, yes, yes, I'm going, I'm going. You come with me, Chester. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you wait here, Chester. Unless he gets me. Okay, Mr. Gillen. You come no closer, Marshal. You killed one man, Beetle. That's enough. Kill me a lot of men if I have to. Beetle. Throw your gun out. I told you, don't you come no closer. I have to, Beetle. Now, wait there, Chester. You get him, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, I got him. Find a couple of men and go take him up to docks, will you? Well, 
Here's Doc now. Yes, oh, was somebody else been killed here? Beetle, Doc. He tried to shoot Mr. Dillon. Clay's dead, huh, Doc? Yes, he was killed instantly, Matt. Two bullets right through his chest. Well, I guess the law wasn't much help to him after all. Well, you did what you could, Matt. Uh, Marshal Dillon. Yeah. My name's Keller, Marshal. I'm an agent for the Santa Fe Railroad. Okay, Keller, but if you want to talk, come to see me at my office later. A couple of men have just been killed here. It's Clay I want to talk about, Marshal. Oh? Yeah. His land out of Stone Point. Uh, what's your interest in Stone Point? The railroad's planning ahead, Marshal. We want to build a station at Stone Point. I came out here to close the deal with Clay. Close the deal? You mean you've already talked to Clay about this? Oh, over a month ago, Marshal. He said he owned all but 40 acres and was going to get that back. Oh, I see. Oh, he didn't want to buy his land. All we wanted from him was a free lease for where the station will stand. Well, that was fair enough, don't you think? Station there, Stone Point land, will become pretty valuable. Property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, you come see me at noon tomorrow, Mr. Keller, and I'll, uh... I'll have the rightful owner of that land in my office. But I don't understand. At see, noon we... tomorrow, huh? Oh, okay, Marshal. Good night. Chester. Yes, sir. Let's go find Miss Beetle. And tell her that Stone Point belongs to her. I know it's too late, and I don't suppose it'll do any good, but... I want to tell her how sorry I am. Yes, sir. That'd make me feel better, too, Mr. Dillon. And now our star, William Conrad. If you're smoking a filter tip cigarette, I'm certain you'll enjoy... L and M filters, either king size or regular. L and M's give you much more flavor, much less nicotine. They're just what the doctor ordered. Try them. King size or regular. Both at the same low price. <laughs> Gunsmoke, transcribed under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Jeanette Nolan, and Joe Cranston. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, likes to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. Hear gun smoke every Saturday, this same time, this same station. Hear the great new Perry Como radio show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, also on CBS Radio. This is the CBS Radio Network. by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. 
And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Chester. Mr. Dillon? Are you going hunting? No. I saw all kinds of wild turkey about a mile down the Arkansas yesterday. I ain't going hunting, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> What's the gun and all the shells for, then? Well, shotguns was made for more than shooting birds with. Yeah, that's true. Mr. Dillon, you ever hear me talk about Live Oak County? Uh, South Texas? Sure I have. According to you, it's a hideout for bandits. Yes, it is. And they've got a saying down there that if the law ever did catch any of them, there ain't enough good men around to act as a jury to try the bad ones. <laughs> well, that's very interesting, Chester, but you're a long way from Live Oak County now. Well, part of it's moved up here. What? Aza Ledbetter. He's in Dodge. Aza Ledbetter? Is he an outlaw? No, sir. But I seen him at the Long Branch, and there's only one thing he's here for, Mr. Dillon. Well, what? To kill me. Chester, are you going to tell me why Asa Ledbetter is here to kill you? It don't matter why, Mr. Dillon. Okay. I'm going to go in there and talk to him. I'd assume you didn't. I don't like people getting killed in Dodge, Chester. Even you. Now you wait here, huh? Hello? Oh, say, you're the marshal. Your name Asa Ledbetter? How'd you know that? Chester told me. Chester? Yeah, Chester Proudfoot. <laughs> well, okay, marshal, he got my name right, but I don't recall his. What? I never heard no Chester Proudfoot. Glad to meet you, though. Buy a drink? Oh, thank you. Say, there was a fella in here a while ago, I remember, because he was staring at me so hard. He heard me say my name, too. I was talking to a cowboy about finding work around here. Where are you from, Ledbetter? Texas. What part? Amarillo. Ever been in South Texas? No, never have. Marshal, what's this all about? Now, Chester thinks that you came here to kill him. Now, just look here, Marshal. I don't know this Chester fellow. Never even heard of him. I don't go around murdering people. I hope that's true, Lenny. Of course it is. And I don't like nobody dragging down my good name, Marshal. Nobody he is. is. <laughs> so long. You just asked anybody from Amarillo about me, Marshal. They can tell you. Chester? I feel like a darn fool standing out here. Are you sure you haven't got Asa Ledbetter mixed up with somebody else? Not hardly. Uh, he claims he never heard of you. Ah, he's been looking for me for years. Why, Chester? It don't matter why, Mr. Dillon. If I'm dead, all that matters is I'm dead. Why don't you take a few days off, huh? Go fishing or something. You don't believe me, do you? 
I didn't say that, Chester. Well, you'll be sorry, Mr. Dillon. You'll be real sorry. That whistling man, Bobby Haggard, really started something. Tonight, the Calypso Boys join in. Ready, amigos? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Kitty, that was a real good dinner. Mm hmm. <laughs> and thank you. Thank me. Well, I, I thought you were paying for it. You're the one who needs a vacation, not Chester. Oh, but you're a rich woman, Kitty. <laughs> Let's talk about Chester. Does he really think Asa led betters after him? Well, that's what he says. It's not like Chester to make up a thing like that. No. Max? You stay here. No, I'm going with you. It's a couple of drunken cowboys. Uh, you going after him? Mr. Gillen! Mr. Gillen! It's Chester, Matt, down there by the alley. Come on. Something over his arm. Looks like he's been hurt. Yeah. He shot me, Mr. Gillen. He shot me. One of those cowboys? No, Asa Ledbetter. What? I seen them cussed cowboys coming, so I ducked in the alley here. And Ledbetter was down at the end of it, just waiting for me. I think he just hired them fellas to set up a commotion so she could get a shot at Here, him. let me see that arm. Bullet went right in here, Mr. Dillon. It didn't break nothing, though. Ah, Chester, you've been hurt worse than us a dozen times. Now, look, if you ducked in the alley, you were probably facing the street, weren't you? Yes, I was. All right, then Ledbetter wouldn't have been behind you. The bullet entered from in front. It was him, I tell you. Or the wild bullet from those cowboys. You think I'm lying? Well, I think you're worrying yourself into seeing things. I'm going up to docks, if I can make it. Now, wait a minute, Chester. Where's Ledbetter staying? Well, he he told me the Dodge house, Matt. All right, I'll go talk to him. Sure, you go talk to him. How many times do I have to be shot around here before anybody believes me? been in your room here? Oh, I've been taking a nap, Marshal. Up until them drunks out there woke me up. Now, Chester says you tried to shoot him a few minutes ago. He's... Now, Marshal, I'm getting sick and tired of this Chester. What's he trying to do, anyway? He's pretty certain about it. Bound and determined to get me into trouble? I'd doggone if I know why. There must be some reason. Well, sure, and if there is, I don't know it. 
I'll be glad when I find me a job and get shut of this town. Never did hear nothing good about Dodge anyway. We try to keep it peaceful. Oh, sure, but it's like you say. Probably ain't enough good men left to act as jury to try the bad ones. Uh-huh. Now, just where do they say that, Lippert? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. You heard it before, ain't you? Yeah, yeah I've heard it before. It's a saying down in South Texas in Live Oak County. Well, that may be, Marshal. And I heard it in Amarillo. Now, ain't that possible? Yeah, I guess it is. Marshal, listen here. If I come here to kill a man, what did I be waiting around for? A change of weather? It don't make sense, does it? No. No, it doesn't make sense. Any part of it. How does it look, Doc? Well, it's just a scratch, man. A scratch? I suppose if I come in here scalped, you'd say the barber just give me too tight a haircut. Now, Chester, be brave, boy. Yes, there we are. In a week, you'll never know you got hit. Well, it's a mercy it wasn't my gun arm. Chester, I told you Asa Ledbetter was in his room the whole time. You mean he told you? I asked the desk clerk on the way out. Then he was lying, too. Chester, how long since you've had a good night's sleep? Now, Doc, don't you start that. Well, you admit you didn't actually see Ledbetter in that alley. But next time you'll see him all right, won't you? Whether he's there or not. <laughs> Have you finished doctoring my wound? Oh, now, wait a minute. Getting mad won't help you. Well, maybe it will. Well, where are you going now? Who cares where out I'm going? He'll get over it, Doc. Yeah, I hope so. The only thing I can figure is that he's got this lead butter mixed up with somebody else. Yeah. But it'd certainly help if he'd say why he thinks he's after him. Because... Matt? Yeah, what is it? Come over here to the window. Huh? What's going on? Look, down in the street. I'd say he's a lead better. And Chess just standing there about to shoot him. Yeah, I'd better hurry, Doc. I'm just getting plumb good and tired of you. Then why don't you do something about it? Yes, sir. You stay out of this, Mr. Dillon. I don't like gunfighting, no matter who starts it. I didn't start it. He come here to shoot me. Marshal, he is crazy. Ought to be locked up. Sure, I'm crazy. I should have called y'all before. Now, you gonna fight or not? No, I ain't gonna fight. You scared? I've got no quarrel with you. Are you scared? Leave him alone, Chester. No. Then tell me what this is all about. No. Now, Chester, why don't you just go off and, and get drunk or something? Hey, Chester. Now, will you draw? Now, will you? Oh, Marshal, I ain't going to take much more of him. I said, are you All right, Chester, draw? that's enough. Now, you come with me. You're a dirty coward. You come brother. with me, I said. You're with him, ain't you? You and Doc and everybody. Maybe you are crazy, Chester. Sure. Oh, sure. Well, where are you going? I'm going to get me a drink. Alone. <laughs> Say, where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your car? Getting ready for dinner? Oh, I see. Just relaxing in your favorite easy chair. Well, I'd say you're in a good spot right now to really enjoy a Chesterfield. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason. A cigarette made better and packed better... Smokes better, tastes better. 
And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Oh, man. Why, it's three o'clock in the morning, man. Yeah. You've been on a call. Well, I haven't been romancing the ladies. Yeah. Oh, man. Is Chester asleep? Yeah, he's asleep. But not in the office. Well, why not? Where is he? I locked him in the cell out back. You locked him in his... What? He got drunk, Doc. By sundown, he was as drunk as I ever saw him. Well, maybe he needed it, man. Maybe it'll bring him out all this. Well, something's got to. Yes, it does. Well, I'm going to go to bed. <clears throat> you better go, too. Yeah, I am, Doc. I think I'll use Chester's bed in the office tonight. I'll right, see you tomorrow. Yeah, good night, Doc. Chester, this here's a shotgun. Huh? All right, now get off that bed and get over to the window. Go on. Better. I'm going to sit down here and light the lamp now. But you just stand steady. The shotgun's right across my knees. Now, Chester, you and me, we're going... Marshal, what you doing here? Well, I was trying to get some sleep. Well, you don't sleep here. It's Chester's bed, all right. Where is he? Now, he's around. Somewhere. Where are you going? Stand still. Marshal, stand still. I mean it. Well, I was just going to close the back door here. You left it open. I want it open. All right. I'll open it wide. Here, Marshal, no call for it. All right, where's Chester at? I don't know where he is, Ledbetter. You're lying. Yeah, I'm lying. He got drunk this afternoon. You brought him over here. I thought you put him to bed, but since you didn't think but one place he'd be, right out there in a the cell behind you. You walk right past him on your way in, you Ledbetter. Get out of that doorway, Marshal. No. I'll shoot you if you don't. You'll shoot Chester if I do. Now move, I, I say. I can't oblige you, Ledbetter. I'm I'll sorry. I'll kill you, Marshal. Don't shoot again, Chester. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, you hit him in the head with the first shot, Chester. Pure luck. I heard you kick that door. It woke me up. So I wonder anything could wake you up tonight. Well, I don't feel so good, but I ain't drunk no more. Hey, you got me locked in here. Yeah, I thought of that, but I forgot to take your gun away from you. That was 
mighty careless of you, Mr. Dillon. Well, it doesn't matter now. You knew I had it. You were going to let him shoot at you so as he'd wake me up and I'd have a chance at him. I guess I was kindly wrong about you being again me. You know, it might have helped things if you'd have told me why Ledbetter was after you, Chester. I just couldn't, Mr. Dillon. Oh, why? It had to do with a lady. Oh. She's dead now. But I didn't want nobody talking about her. Saying her name. Nobody. Can you understand that? It'll be daylight soon, Chester. Let's go brew up some coffee, huh? Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Thank you. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. Vacation coming up soon? Here's how to pack more pleasure. Make sure you have a couple of cartons of Chesterfields in your suitcase or in your car's glove compartment. A touch tells you Chesterfields are firm, packed full. Your taste tells you they satisfy the most. So when you do your vacation shopping, ask your dealer for Chesterfields. Buy the carton. You know, the early frontier years were lusty and brawling, and men happily fought each other as a matter of course. But next week, it's the man who refuses to fight that causes all the trouble. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast was Lawrence Dobkin as Asa Ledbetter, Harley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. L&M. Yes, have an L&M. No other cigarette you can buy, plain or filter, gives you the full, exciting flavor you get through the pure white L&M Miracle Tip. Through the modern Miracle Tip, L&M tastes richer, smokes cleaner, draws easier. So light up, free up, let your taste come alive. Live modern, smoke L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gun Smoke. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Guns.
Smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Morning, Kitty. Well, you're out early today. I'm a working man. I have to keep regular hours. Oh, then what were you doing at the Long Branch at 2 o'clock this morning? Uh, well, sometimes it's a regular 24 hours, <laughs> just like you. Well, at least I make good money at it. <laughs> Kitty, would you really like to see me settle down and run a saloon? You might get to like it. All right, I'll do it. When? But I'm about 50. <laughs> I thought so. Good morning, Miss Kitty. Oh, hello, Chester. Here's a letter for you, Mr. Jones. Oh, thanks, Chester. Uh, the envelope says it's from Judge Rambo over in Wichita. Mm hmm. Anything important? Yeah, it's a court order for eviction. Yeah. Seems Brandon Teak didn't file legally on his land over by Wagon Mound. Did you say Brandon Teak? Oh, do you know him, Kitty? Everybody knew him, Ron Abilene. Yeah, he had a pretty bad reputation then, I guess. Doesn't he still? Well, I haven't seen him for some time, but uh, he's married now, and he's trying to prove up some land. Well, I don't envy you trying to put him off it. Brandon Teak never shoved very easy, that I recall. Well, uh, we'll ride out there this afternoon, Chester. Be sure your gun's loaded, Matt. Yeah, well, maybe I won't need it, Kitty. Want to bet? Uh, no, I guess not. <laughs> You ask me, Teak's gone to build himself a mighty nice place out here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's doing fine. Hello, Teak. Uh, hello, Marshal. Chester. How are you, Teak? What brings you out this way? Well, uh... Here, you, you might as well read it yourself. What's this? Court order. Immediate eviction. What's this all about, Marshal? I got my deed to this place. Yeah, but you failed to register it at the land office, T. Nobody told me about that. I'm sorry. You'll be a whole lot sorry you try to put me off this land, Marshal. Brandon, who are you talking to? Uh, uh, you stay inside, sir. It ain't nothing. Then it won't hurt if I come out. Uh, uh, this is my wife, Marshal Dillon and Chester Proudwood. How do you do, Mr. Ma'am? Is there trouble, Brandon? They say we got no legal right to this place, Sarah. I didn't register the deed or some fool thing. Oh, no. Oh, no, don't you worry. Ain't nobody gonna move us off, law or no law. It's a court order, Teak. I ain't wore a gun since I got married, Marshal, but I can sure go put one on. We're going to have a child, Marshal. Most any day now. And we ain't moving. We ain't starting over again. Oh, if we have to, we can do it. I'd rather die and see you go to fighting again, Brandon. Now you think on it. It's a hard thing for a man to swallow, but I can't go again. I ain't putting on my gun. Now, why don't you go in and tell her that? When will I tell her we got to get off the place? Oh, there's no hurry. What about that immediate eviction? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I'll be responsible for that. Well, I guess I ought to be, be grateful to you. No, no, Teague, not to me. <laughs> well, goodbye. Bye, Marshal. Chester. Bye, Teague. Oh, 
When are you going to put them off, Mr. Dillon? I'm going over to Wichita, Chester. I'll find out there. You've heard Bobby Haggard whistling it on radio and television. Right now, a country-style version. Okay, partners? Packs more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. Judge. Yeah. Marshal Dillon, what are you doing in Wichita? Well, I came to see you. Oh, that's so? It's about that court order you sent me, Judge. Which court order, Marshal? The one to evict Brandon Teak off his land near Wagon Mount. Oh, that. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, I remember. Uh, what's the trouble? Is he putting up a fight? No, he isn't. Well, he sure must have changed. I remember Teak around here. He was a wild one. Well, he's married now, Judge. As a matter of fact, they're expecting a child any day. A child? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I told him that uh, they could take their time about moving. Take their time? Yeah. That order was to evict them at once, Marshal. Yeah, I know that, Judge. There's no room for sentiment in the law, Marshal Dillon. What's right is right, and what's legal is legal. Look, Judge, Teak's been on that land for over a year. How come this business about failing to register his deed just came up? It was only recently brought to my attention. And who brought it to your attention? Uh, Lee Sprague. Not that it makes any difference. Lee Sprague, huh? He owns a lot of land around Wagon Mound, doesn't he? And he's filed on this. There's nothing irregular about it, Marshal, if that's what you're thinking. Well, legally, I'm sure everything's correct, Judge. You can't argue with facts, Marshal. Now stop being a sentimental fool and, and, and go do your duty. Brandon takes a changed man, Judge. He's done more than prove up that land. He's proved himself up, too. Homestead Act, 1862, paragraph 12. After one year, if the deed to such land is not duly recorded at the nearest government office... Oh, never office... mind, Judge. I know how it reads then start acting like it. I can hold even a United States Marshal in contempt of court, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure you can. You got a lot of power, Judge. But there's only one thing wrong. And what's that? You never learned how to use it. Marshal Dillon. I want to talk to you, Sprague. Come in. Thank you. How'd you know I was in Dodge today? I found out. It's about Brandon Teak, Sprague. Something wrong? No, not legally. Uh, <laughs> Judge Rambo made that pretty clear. Want to tell me what's bothering you, Marshal? Yeah, sure. 
I think Brandon Teak deserves that land more than you do. Marshal, I'm in the land and cattle business, and I'm making out mighty well. No man can accuse me ever doing anything illegal or dishonest. But everybody knows I practice sharp, and I'll go on practicing sharp, too. Even against a man like Teak, who's hung up his gun and settled down and tried to make a life for him and his family? What do you mean, his family? Uh, there's a child coming any day now. Hmm. Then he's better off in town, Marshal. What? My wife stayed in the country. That's why I lost her. Looks to me I'm doing Teak a favor. You got an awful easy conscience, Sprague. No use arguing, Marshal. You got your order. Now go put him off. No, Sprague, I'm not going to do it. What? I couldn't hold my head up if I had any part of the kind of law you and Judge Rambo want. You mean that? I do. I ain't going to let you stand in my way, Marshal. You're in for trouble. It's Brandon Teak and his missus both talking that fellow, Mr. Dillon. You recognize him, Chester? No, sir, I don't. He's a stranger to me. Ah. Looks like they're all head up over something, don't they? Yeah. Miss Teak hadn't ought to be standing out in the heat of the day this way. Will that Marshal Dillon settle this, Haley? He's got nothing to do with it no more. Ma'am. How do, Marshal? What's the trouble here, Teak? Well, you told me there was no hurry about our leaving, Marshal. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Where'd you get that badge, mister? Who are you? I'm Jim Haley, Marshal. Deputy Sheriff from Wichita. Wichita? Well, how'd you get here? I took the Santa Fe to Dodge, then I rented me a horse. Answer me, Haley. Judge Rambo sent me. I guess he felt the law needed a little enforcing down this way. You got a court order, Marshal, just like the one you had. It's plumb legal. And I want you people to pack up and be out of here by tomorrow. Just a minute, Haley. I can take care of him, Marshal. No, Brandon, there'll be no fighting. Now, sir, You I... ain't gonna do nothing except move, Teak, and right now. No! no. Woman, you let go of my arm! Uh, uh, oh, Sarah! Uh, now, now, wait a minute, Marshal. She shouldn't have grabbed my arm like that. I was only trying to do... Get his gun, Chester. Yes, sir. Is she hurt, Teak? You all right, Sarah? I'll be all right. She only grabbed his arm. He's gone and hurt her, Marshal, flinging her off like that. Chester. Yes, sir. Jump on your horse and ride for Dodge, huh? Tell Doc to get out here fast. <laughs> Never coming out of that house. Yeah. It's been a long time, hasn't it? She, uh, she shouldn't have grabbed me. I, uh, I didn't mean to hurt her. Haley, why don't you keep quiet? Nobody wants to hear from you. Look, Mr. Dillon, there's Doc. Huh? You don't look none too happy. Well, Doc, the baby's dead, Matt. Oh, my. It's too bad. Well, I didn't do it. I, I only pushed her a little. I told I... you to shut up, Haley. There wasn't a chance of saving the baby. It's her I've been working on. And she's going to be all right now, man. Yeah. Well, good for that, anyway. Hey, Doc, tell you, Marshal. Hey, yeah, Tick. I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, I, I'm sorry, too, but you, you can't blame me for Haley, it. Haley, I just now promised my wife I wouldn't kill you. Don't make me break it. Come on, Haley. I'm taking you to Dodge with me. Hey, now, look here. Ain't you forgetting I'm a lawman, too, Marshal? I'd like to forget it. It doesn't make me very proud of being one. <laughs> 
I come here to do a job, and I'm going to do it. I promised her I wouldn't kill you now, Haley, but you come back here, and I promise you I will. A man can only take so much. I'll be back. No, you won't. I'm throwing you in jail for a while. Jail? Teak, as soon as your wife's better, you come see me, huh? I don't know what I can do, but things aren't going on this way. <laughs> Where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your kitchen? Getting ready for Sunday supper? Maybe in your living room, relaxing? Or... Out driving? Say, be sure and watch the road. But remember, there's pleasure ahead when you smoke Chesterfield. When you satisfy yourself with Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. It stands to reason. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Hello, Chester. Hello, Doc. Where's Matt, Chester? In the office, talking to Lee Sprague. Sprague? It's a little late to be talking to him, isn't it? I'd say so. You sure Brandon Teak's coming to Dodge today, Doc? That's what he told me. There's a neighbor woman staying with his wife. Not that she really needs anybody now. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It's only been a week, but she's a strong woman. Mm. Well, here we are. Huh? Yeah, oh, my God, he did come. Hello, Doc. Chester. Oh, hello, hello Teak. How's the patient? Uh, she's pretty good, Doc. Being awful brave about it, but I know how she feels. Only time will cure that. I guess so. Yeah, Mr. Dillon's in the office, Teak. He wanted you to go right on in when you got here. Okay. Oh, hello, Teak. Come on in. You know Lee Sprague? Yeah, I know him. Hello, Teak. Uh, Sprague and I were over at the land office this morning. I think we got everything straightened out. What do you mean? Here. Take a look at this. What is it? That's a deed to the land you're on, Teak, and this time it's legally registered. Yeah, sure. In your name. That's right. You help him with this, Marshal? Well, I wanted to be sure that there weren't any loopholes, Teak. You know, if it wasn't for my wife, you people would have to shoot me off that place. Teak, I want to tell you something. Ain't you said enough, Sprague? No. Now, listen. I'm a greedy man, Teak, and I'll take anything I can get legally. But Marshal Dillon here has been talking pretty hard to me lately. Sure, and I've been listening to him, too. I guess I'd have gone right on, and I could have... I heard about your baby. Why should that matter to you? I lost my son, Teak. But I lost my wife, too. Are taking my land gonna help you? You tell him, Marshal. He's not taking your land, Teak. That deed's in his name, ain't it? Didn't you go along to be sure he didn't make any mistakes? There aren't any mistakes this time. Sprague can deed that land to anybody he wants to now. All clear. And it's yours. I'm not giving it to you. It's yours anyway. 
I'll, I'll tell Sarah. And I'll, I'll tell her she was right all along about, about not fighting. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, what about you, Marshal? Ain't there gonna be trouble you jailing a deputy sheriff? <laughs> well, as soon as he gets back to Wichita, I suppose there might be some trouble, yeah. <laughs> but don't you worry about that, Teak. I've always wanted to see California anyway. moment, our star, William Conrad. What's your idea of vacation pleasure? Mountains? Seashore? Lake? Wherever you go, here's an idea for your smoking pleasure. Take along a couple of cartons of Chesterfields. Chesterfields are firm, packed full, give you full-time flavor that's bound to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Vacation bound, buy Chesterfields, buy the carton mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, on the frontier, a horse thief was often caught and hung because someone else's brand was on the animal he'd stolen. But next week, a man is hung because his horse has no brand at all. But that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Vic Perrin, Helen Plead, Paul Dubov, and Will Wright. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Live Modern. Smoke l and Only with L&M can you enjoy the full, exciting flavor of today's finest tobaccos through the modern miracle of the pure white miracle tip. So light up, free up, let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, 
starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Shelby? No. Looks like some kind of tenderfoot to me. Who else is camping a grove of trees cutting no water? You have a little talk with him. He looks scared, Kringle. <laughs> Seen men look scared before. Hello, mister. Oh. Camped here all alone? Yeah. Scouting around for some homestead land. Good looking horse you got over there. He seems to be a good horse. He's all young. I think I'll take a look at him. Sure. What you men doing out here? Oh, you just ride around. We scout for things, too. Land? Uh-uh. <laughs> we ain't the kind of settle down to hard work like that. I had a little orchard back in Ohio. Raised apples. Yeah. Yeah, apples are fine. Wished I had one now. Hey, Kringle. Yeah? That there horse ain't got no brand on him. No brand? It washed off crossing the river. You're talking about washed off. It did. I ain't lying. <laughs> well, it don't matter, though. No. Go get your rope, Shelby. I'll get it. What's he need a rope for? Well, now, don't you worry about that, mister. We'll take care of everything. What are you going to do? I told you not to worry. Now, look, uh, I ain't done nothing. Well, of course you ain't. We're just going to save you from all that hard work you was planning on. No. All right, I got it, Shelby. Hurry up. Uh, look, let me Stand go. still. Let me go, will you? Maybe there's water in this grove, Mr. Dillon. Well, if there is, somebody's dug a well, Chester. Oh, you been here before? I've passed by. I swear I'm going to start toting me a water bag. <laughs> That's the easy way, Chester. I bet it is. Yeah, somebody's had a campfire here recently. Mm. Yesterday sometime, I'd say. Yeah. That big rain last night washed out all the prints. So. It sure did. Oh, God, there's got to be a spring here somewhere. I'm going to take a look. You're wasting your time, Chester. I don't mind. I never saw a man who needed the comforts of home more than he does. Mr. Dillon? Mr. Dillon, come here, quick! Huh? Look. Lynched. Scared me half to death. I seen him hanging there. It isn't a very pretty sight. If there ain't no horse around. Where's his horse? Yeah, he probably stole it. And then they caught up with him and took it back. Who do you suppose done it? I don't know. I don't know how we're ever going to find out. Now, well, come on. Let's cut him down. And get him into the ground. <laughs> Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Pa, 
packs more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better, and Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> What I'd do if I rode into a grove of trees and found a man hanging there? Well, I hope it never happens, Kitty. Mm. How can men do such things? No, it's easy. For some men. I hope you catch him. I'd like to, Kitty. Who was he, Matt? Well, we found an envelope on him. Yeah. His name was Hank Blennis. Must have been a newcomer. I never heard of him. Well, he wasn't wanted by the law that I know of. But I guess he was a horse thief, all right. They wouldn't have lynched him otherwise, would they? No. Then why don't you find out who's had a horse stolen recently? Well, they wouldn't likely be talking about it now, Kitty. Well, things could be worse, Matt. No, what do you mean? Suppose there wasn't any law at all. Then people wouldn't even have to hide what they do. Now at least they know they're doing wrong. Well, that doesn't seem to stop them much. <laughs> Marshal Dillon? Ah, uh, yeah. My name's Charlie Drain, Marshal. Uh -huh. I run cattle up north on the Republican River. Happened to be in Dodge on business, and I heard about that lynching yesterday. Uh, you know something about it, Drain? I know I don't like it. My own pa was lynched, Marshal. A mob strung him up by mistake. I was just a boy, but I seen him do it, and it's laid in my mind ever since. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. But, uh... What about this lynching? It's a big thing with me, Marshal. I can't endure seeing no lynchers get off free. Well, I don't like it myself, Drain. Then you do something about it, or I will. Now, Matt. Maybe you better tell me what you got in mind, Drain. A fella named Gil Mather. Got a little ranch over on Dove Creek. I've heard round about that he's had a horse or two stole recently. And I've heard that he's talked to hanging whoever stole him. Now, it looks to me like he went and done it, Marshal. I know, Gil Mather. Well, then maybe you better go bring him in. Or you will, huh? I'll see him dead. Now, I told you how I feel about things. I ain't fooling, Marshal. Drain, I got some advice for you. Is that so? Why don't you take a walk around Dodge and talk to some people, huh? You ask them what I'm like when somebody tries to crowd me. Then you go sit down somewhere and think about it. You think about it real hard. Now, I didn't know Gil Mather was married, Mr. Dillon. He isn't, Justin. Well, then who's that boy in the corral yonder feeding his horses? That's Billy Driscoll. He works for Mather off and on. Mather will fight. I'm not arresting him, Chester. I got no evidence says he did it. Well, what if he admits it? Now, that's not often a man admits to a crime, Chester. Mm, guess not. Hello there, Marshal. Chester. Oh. How are you, Mather? Oh, fair to Midland, Marshal. What brings you out here? I was told that you've lost some horses. I didn't lose them, Marshal. They were stole. Three of them now. Any idea who's been doing it? If I knew, there'd be a man hanging from a limb, Summers. There was one, Mather. What? 
About 20 miles north of here, a man called Hank Blennis. Was he a horse thief? Probably. Who hung him? Now, some people think maybe you did. No. No, it wasn't me. But horse thieves has got to be hung, Marshal. Mather Blennis was lynched Thursday. Where were you then? You questioning my word, Marshal? Where were you? Marshal, you got any evidence, you come arrest me. Meantime, I got work to do. Contrary, ain't he, Mr. Young? Yeah. It sure looks to me like he's hiding something. Well, I can't arrest him for that. Come on, let's get back to town. Doc. Doc, you asleep? Huh? Who, who said that? Oh, oh well, oh. Oh, it's you, man. <laughs> you uh, sure don't do much to dress this town up, Doc. Oh, what man's got a better right to sit out here and rest his eyes for a few minutes? Oh? I was up the entire night nursing old Mrs. Jackstone through a fever. Well, maybe we ought to tie a sign on you explaining that, Doc. Folks might not understand otherwise. No, folks can go hang. I'm here if anybody needs me. Well, a man would have to be mighty sick to need a doctor who looks like he's sleeping off a drunk. Don't harp at me, Matt Dillon. From what I hear, you're not exactly distinguishing yourself at your own trade. <sighs> well, you got me there, Doc. <laughs> yeah, you bet your life. And since you admit it, then I won't say any more to you. Well, me. good. <clears throat> Even though it does kind of look bad when people can go around stringing up anybody they please and with no interference from the law... Uh, yeah, well, thanks for not saying any more about it, Doc. Oh, I'm not one to twist the knife. Now, you know that. Oh, sure. Marshal Dillon, I want to talk to you. Uh, what's the trouble now, Drain? I'm tired waiting, Marshal. Something's got to be done. Drain, why don't you go back up to your ranch and leave all this to me, huh? Because you ain't doing nothing, that's why. You see them two men over there, Marshal? What? Them two standing over there. Uh, who are they? One is Kringle and one is Jack Shelby. And they feel as strong as I do about all this. All right, Drain. You don't have to go back to your ranch. I don't care where you go, but you get out of Dodge and you take your friends there with you. If I see any one of you around after sundown, I'll throw you in jail. I take it back, joking you, Matt. Uh, you are kind of up against it. You know, Doc, I just thought of something. Eh? What? That fellow Blennis was obviously a dude. He wasn't even wearing the right kind of clothes for a man who'd been out here very long. Maybe he wasn't a horse thief at all. Then why would anybody lynch him? Well, I'm going over to the stable, Doc. Maybe Moss Grimmick can help me. The fellow, Marshal, that's him. That's what he looked like. What kind of a horse was it, Moss? A little three-year-old bay, real young but plumb gentle. Had four white stockings, Marshal. Yeah, that gives me something to go on. There's another thing, too. That horse wasn't branded. What? Well, I raised him myself, and I just never got around to put no mark on him. Except for no good stuff I bought. What stuff? Oh, a fellow sold it to me, some kind of chemical powder... You wet it and then kind of paint your brain down with it and suppose to take the hair off. But it don't work. I tried it on another animal. It just washed right off. Yeah. And whoever's got that little bay of yours could put his own brand on him, huh? I'm a real fool, Marshal, believing you can brand a horse rubbing a little chemical powder on him. <laughs> well, we all get taken sometimes, Moss. I stopped Gil Mather from getting took, though. Oh, you did? Yeah. He come in here the other day and asked me about it. I told him. What day was that, Moss? Thursday. Him and the boy, Billy Driscoll, they come to town every Thursday, Marshal. Come in early, spend the whole day. Why? Something wrong? 
Hank Blennis was lynched Thursday. Well, you wasn't thinking Gil Mather done it, was you? Charlie Drain was, and he still is. I better go find him, Moss. Say, where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your car? Getting ready for dinner? Oh, I see. Just relaxing in your favorite easy chair. Well, I'd say you're in a good spot right now to really enjoy a Chesterfield. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> See nobody around at all, Mr. Dillon. Maybe they're in the house, Chester. Want for me to go see? I will tie up here by the barn first. All right, sir. Could be Mather and the boys eating their dinner, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> at least you hope so. Huh? Well, any man gets a little hungry now and then. Wait a minute, Chester. Why, there's Charlie Drain. Yeah. They was in the barn. Them other two fellows, they must be Kringle and Shelby you told me about. Yeah, that's them. What are you doing out here, Marshal? I'm looking for Gil Mather, Drain. He ain't around. Chester. Yes, sir. See if he's in the barn. I said he ain't around, didn't I? Go ahead, Chester. Yes, sir. Then don't any one of you try to stop him. Now, which one of you is Kringle and which is Shelby? I'm Kringle, he's Shelby. Why? Now, it's my job to know who people are, that's all. Well, now you know. Yeah, now I know. If you ask me, it's your job to punish criminals, Marshal. You're right, Dre. Well, you ain't been doing very good at it. I'm kind of slow sometimes. You're too slow. Mr. Dillon! Mr. Dillon! They're in there. Gil Mather and the boy, both of them. Don't stand in front of me, Chester. They're dead. These fellows went and hung them, both of them. Keep your hand away from that gun, Kringle. Well, you can't blame me. Me nor Shelby. It was Drain's idea. He paid us to come along with him, is all. Billy was just a kid. Why'd they have to hang him for? So he was a kid. He was keeping mighty bad company. Now, wasn't he? Drain, both the boy and Gil Mather were in Dodge the day Hank Blennis was lynched. Are you sure of that? There are witnesses. I don't want no more part of this. Come on, Shelby. Hold it, Kringle. Well, you ain't stopping me, Marshal. Is that your bay horse over there with the four white stockings? What about it? It's pretty smart of you to lynch a man rather than shoot him when you go to steal his horse. What are you saying, Marshal? They hung Blender Strain. I guess they figured helping you with Mather and the boy would put everybody off their track. So they lynched him. They done it. Why, you dirty no, dogs! Why, he killed them. He killed both of them. Sure, I killed them. They had it coming now, didn't they? Give me that gun, Trenton. I said, 
give it. <laughs> lynchers. All the time, there was nothing but a couple of dirty lynchers. He's crazy, Mr. Dillon. I hate them. What do you think? You're just dead in the barn there, Drain. I made a mistake. I can't help that. I only wish I could have hung these two. They deserved it. Just like them fellas that lynched my pa. I ain't never seen a man so mixed up. I hate lynching. Sometimes a man can hate too much, Drain. <laughs> Sometimes I can twist him till he gets where he doesn't really belong. I don't know what you mean. Well, it doesn't matter now. Not anymore. <laughs> In a moment, our star, William Conrad. When you shop for those last-minute vacation items, don't forget to pick up a couple of cartons of Chesterfields. You'll find it mighty convenient to have a carton or two along in your suitcase, or if you're driving, right in the glove compartment. Chesterfield packs more pleasure, more vacation pleasure, because it's more perfectly packed. So buy Chesterfields. Buy them by the carton. Mild, yet they satisfy. The most. You know, on the frontier, bullets cost eight cents apiece, so they were seldom wasted. But next week, it's a stray bullet that kills a man. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, Jack Moyles, and James Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live Modern. Change to L&M. Yes, have an L&M. No other cigarette you can buy, plain or filter, gives you the full, exciting flavor you get through the pure white L&M Miracle Tip. Through the modern Miracle Tip, L&M tastes richer, smokes cleaner, draws easier. So light up, free up, let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. 
Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. Marshal Dillon? Oh, come on in, son. I'm looking for Doc. Our Doc's office is upstairs. I've been there, been everywhere. Is it somebody sick? My pa told me to bring him out to our place. Oh, is it your pa that's sick? He wants the Doc bad, Marshal. Well, who is your pa, son? Ben Pitcher. You Ben Pitcher's boy? My name's Jerry. Oh, Jerry, your pa must be pretty sick if he sent for Doc. I know. He hates doctors. He don't believe in them. But he wants Doc to come, Marshal. Told me I had to find him. I've looked everywhere. I'll go with you. Well, you don't have to go. I'm going to ride out there with him, Jerry. When your pa sends for a doctor, something's really wrong. Come on. How do you like riding in the buggy, Matt? <laughs> Make you feel important? Sure it does, Doc. But the way you drive, I'd feel a lot safer on a horse. <laughs> you get used to it. Oh, I hope not. Oh, there you go. Hey, don't see anybody around, Matt. Now, you expect a sick man to be waiting on the porch for you? I'd expect most anything of Ben Pitcher. Yeah. You know, a man can change, Doc. Not him. Not Pitcher. Well, we'll find out soon enough. here, Marshal. I just came along to keep Doc company, Miss Pitcher. Oh. Where's the boy? Uh, Jerry said tell you he'd be along directly. Why didn't he come back with you? And he said that you gave him a list of stuff to buy while he was in town. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, so we're wasting time. Where's Ben, Miss Pitcher? He's over there. Over where? In the barn. Well, what's he doing in the barn? You ask him, Doc. I don't interfere in my husband's way of doing things. Oh, my, that woman could fair drive me crazy, man. Yeah, maybe that's what happened to Pitcher. Uh, between the two of them, it's a wonder the boys made out at all. Uh, Jerry seems okay so far. Yeah, if they have their way, they'll make a spook out of them, yeah. I could, all right. Pretty good barn he's got here. Yeah. Uh, Doc, I'll go in first, huh? What? You follow me. Hey, Pitcher. Hey, Pitcher. I'm back here. Oh, come on, Doc. Over here in this stall. I thought it was Doc. He's here, Pitcher. What are you doing in there with that cow? I thought you were sick. I ain't sick, Doc. Well, who is sick? My cow. What? Well, my cow's got the colic or something. I done everything I can for her. You mean you had me come all the way out here to doctor a cow? Well, I sure wouldn't let you doctor no humans. But a cow's different. 
I don't mind so much you working on a cow. Oh, you don't? No. Humans can get well by themselves, but cows is helpless. You're kind of pitiful. I ought to kick you right in the head, Ben Pitcher. If you're so smart, do something for my cow. Before she dies, dog. Uh, uh, all right, I'll look at her. But you sure don't deserve it, Ben. You ain't doing it for me. You bet I'm not. Now get out of the way and let me in there. Ten men. Men, medics. Medics, Medicare. Medicare, Medicare. Oh, excuse me, sir. What are you doing? Oh, I'm a memory expert, and I'm committing a fact to memory. Oh? What fact? Uh, oh, now you see, you made me forget. Oh, maybe we can bring it back. You mentioned Medicare. Does it have to do with medical care for dependents? Yeah, that's it. My boy just turned ten, and I'm on my way to get him an ID card so he can use it for things like uh, the Dependents Medical Care Program. Every dependent over 10 years of age should have an ID card. Oh, that's an excellent reminder, Mr. Uh, uh, uh... Oh, you can just call me, uh... Call me anytime you need help with memory problems, fella. Now, which way was I going when you came up? For your information, get the pamphlet, Dependents, Medical Care Program. <laughs> doing in there all this time, Marshal? Leave him be, Ben. He'll let us know if he wants any help. Well, I guess he's through. How's my cow, Doc? Here's your knife, Ben. Did you stick her with it? I did, and she's going to feel a lot better. You can give her all the water she wants, but don't let her eat anything for a day or two. Is she going to live? I don't know, Ben. If she dies... I ain't going to pay you. I wouldn't take money from you anyway. What's wrong with my money? It's not your money. It's you. What do you mean? Hey, Paul, I'm back. I got all the stuff in my wanted. You better have. Oh, Doc. Marshal. Sure. Say, Doc, you missed all the excitement. Yeah? What's that? It happened just after you left. Everybody was running around looking for you. What happened, Jerry? On this hill. She was walking down the street, and I guess the sun was too much for her or something. Anyway, she kind of fainted like, and she fell against the window right there at the general store, and it cut her arm real bad. Nobody could get it stopped bleeding. They couldn't? No. That's why they was looking for you, Doc. I told them you'd come out here, but they wouldn't believe me. Well, uh, what happened to Mrs. Hill, uh, Jerry? She died, Doc, just before I left. She died? Did you hear that picture? A woman died. If I'd have been there, I could have saved her. But she died. Don't talk at she me. She died because of you and your rotten, lying ways. Hey, take it easy now, Doc. I'll show you. Nobody eats me. Paul's got a knife. Oh, no, picture. Oh, he cut him. Oh. Picture. Oh. Oh. Here. Here, I got you, Doc. Yeah. You ripped me with, with that knife, Matt. Yeah. You hurt bad. It's bleeding. Help me in the house, Matt. I can look at it there. Sure, Doc. Come on. What about Paul? Let me know when he comes to. I'll come back and knock him out again. Pretty clean now, Doc. Yeah. Looks better. Still bleeding a little, though. I don't care for the mess you're making on that bed, Marshal. Go get me another pan of hot water, will you? You ordering me around my own house. I said do it. All right. Man. 
that? Yeah, Doc. I'm not sh- sure, but I, I don't think that knife ruptured anything. Oh, good. But a couple of those veins have to be tied off. And th- then I got to be sewed up. Oh? With a needle and thread in my bag. Oh, well, I'd do it m- myself, but I, I can't reach it easy enough. Oh, you, you mean you want me to do it? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how. You think I can? <laughs> oh, it's easy. Especially for a gunfighter. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I, can, I can bleed to death this way. Yeah. I won't have any trouble, Doc. I'll, I'll go get your bag. Now, here, you, you hold the cloth on it, huh? Uh, I've got it. Thank you. Marshal. Huh? Get out of here, pitcher. You you hit me awful hard. Did I? He jumped me first. You saw him. I was protecting myself. Pitcher, if Doc doesn't come out of this all right, I'm going to quit being a marshal, and I'm going to come after you as a plain man looking for revenge. You're threatening Now, I know it's right? wrong of me, but I'm going to kill you, pitcher. Now, where? Get out of here. Now, you stay out. Out of this house. I'm going. I'm going. It wasn't easy. And I felt like I had fence posts for fingers, but I finally got Doc sewed up. He lost an awful lot of blood, and he passed out before I finished, so all I could do was just sit there and watch him. Yeah, maybe that was the hardest part. In the morning, however, he seemed better, and he insisted that I take him into Dodge. So I made a bed in Pitcher's wagon and had Jerry drive the buggy alongside. He was in bad shape by the time we reached town, but I got him into his own bed and then sent for Kitty to help me out. I don't know what I'd have done without her for that next week. Matt? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming, Kitty. You know what he wants now? Oh, what? He's tired of drinking plain water. He says if we don't start cutting it with some good corn, he won't drink any more. I don't let him go thirsty. He won't hold out long. No public servants can tell me what's good for me. Send that lawman down for some whiskey. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Doc... We've gone to a lot of trouble to keep you alive. We sure have, Doc. Yeah, well, don't you worry about me. I'd get out of bed right now, only I like being waited on. <laughs> uh, who's that? Who's that? That's a dumb question. How'd I know? Go look. You know, Doc, I never thought anything could make you any ornerier than you've always been, but by golly, getting stabbed. Did it? <laughs> never mind, Gab. Just answer the door. Right? Oh, come on in. Oh, what manners. Come on in, I said. Oh, good heavens, man. All right, go ahead, Doc. Fire me. <laughs> Doc? Doc? Oh, in here. Hello, Doc. Why, it's Jerry. Well, here, here. Come in, son. Well, what are you doing in town, Jerry? I come for Doc. You what? Pa's sick. He's about to die. He's so sick. Oh, now, look. What is this? It's the truth, Marshal. Paul made me lie last time, but he don't even know I'm here now. He doesn't know you're here? He's too sick, Doc. It's like he's out of his head. He, he don't know nothing. Well, what about your ma? She know you're here? I didn't tell her. She'd have stopped me. Doc? Look, Jerry, your pa tried to kill Doc the last time. Now, Doc's still in bed. He can't go anyplace. Please, Doc. Why should he risk his life for your pa? Wait, wait. I'll come, Jerry. No, Doc. No. A man's dying. Doesn't matter what man. I'm a doctor. I knew you'd come. I knew you you're would. You're crazy, Doc. You'll open that wound riding out there. Besides, you're not strong enough. You're taking an awful chance. Jerry? What? How'd you get to town? I figured you'd need it, so I brought the wagon. I thought so. Well, you gonna help me, Matt? All right, I'll help you, Doc. <laughs> Have you ever sat in a club listening to someone hold the center of attention 
No doubt you've said to yourself, how does he do it? He's no smarter than I am. And you may be right. But he does have the power to command your attention. And this power may come from a thorough knowledge of the subject in discussion. This power through knowledge is available to you. The United States Armed Forces Institute provides opportunities for military personnel to continue their education while on active duty with the armed forces. USAFI courses are almost limitless. Why, there are over 200 courses in high school, college, and technical subjects alone. For a small initial fee, you may enroll in your first USAFI course. From then on, you can continue to take other USAFI courses at no further cost, as long as your progress is satisfactory. Take advantage of this opportunity. Develop your own power through knowledge with a USAFI course. The next time there's a big discussion at the club, you may hold the center of attention. Give you a hand, Doc. I can make it. There. Wish you'd let me carry you. I said I can make it. He's awful weak, ain't he? Yeah. Here, I'll get the door. Come on in. Ma's probably in the bedroom. It's over this way. Yeah, we know where it is, Jerry. Oh, I forgot. Is that you, Jerry? It's me, Ma. Where you been? What are you doing here? Jerry came after me, Mrs. Pitcher. We don't want no doctor. Your husband's sick? He's terrible sick. But you can't do him no good. Now get out. Now, wait a minute, Miss Pitcher. You look at Doc. You can tell he shouldn't be here at all, but he came. He came to help a man who tried to kill him. Nobody's going to stop him now. Come on, Doc. This picture. You get out of the way. Yeah, I'll get you a chair, Doc. Thank you. Pretty sick, right. Marshal, let's go, Jerry. Uh, now what? He's got a gun, Marshal. Let's go, I said. Here, here. I got her, Jerry. I'll kill you. You and Doc both. Here, give me that. No. There. Now you sit down. Go on. Jerry, you go see if Doc needs any help, huh? Okay, Marshal. You don't deserve Doc being here, Miss Pitcher. You don't deserve it at all. What? I've been thinking. All night I've been sitting here thinking. Oh? I don't want my husband to die. I can't have him die. Well, Doc's doing everything he can for him. Can you save him? Do you think he can save him? I don't know, ma'am. Mrs. Pitcher? How is he, Doc? He's past the worst. I think he'll be all right. Can I see him? Can he talk? Yes, but not for long. He needs a lot of rest now. You look like you could use some rest, too, Doc. Well, we'll go back to Dodge, Matt, and I'll, I'll sleep the whole way. Doc? 
He wants to talk to you. What is it, Pitcher? Ma. Ma says that you was here all night. I was, yes. She says you saved my life. Maybe I helped. Maybe. But what I want to say is that I ain't going to pay you. You what? I didn't ask you to. Doc saved your life, Pitcher. Maybe he did. But I ain't going to pay him. Doesn't matter, but why not? Because my cow died. No, for... Pitcher... How... Matt. Matt. Yeah, what, Doc? Don't bother. Let's go. Okay. Doc. Yes? He means what he says, Doc. I can't change him. It's all right, ma'am. I can't change him. But there's something I gotta say. Yes? I'm proud to have you in my house, Doc. I'm real proud. I can't say no more. Well, Doc. I've been paid, Matt. Paid pretty good. Smoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The script was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Meston. The music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns were by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Walsh speaking. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely.
Doc. Hey, Doc, you up? Hey, Doc. <laughs> You're going to sleep your life away, Doc. What's the matter? What's the matter, man? What time is it? 7.30. Now, put your pants on. Let's go up the street and get some breakfast. Now, come on. 7.30. Come on, roll out. It's daylight in the swamps. Come on. Oh, Oh, I guess I might as well. Now that you got me wide awake. <laughs> wide awake. Yes, well, I'm getting there. I sure don't see the sense in starting the day so it's all fired earlier. You're putting them on backwards, Doc. I am not putting them on I was just about to turn him around. Oh, and... sure you were. I've been putting my pants on for a long time without being told how by the village policeman. Yeah. Now, do you care which foot I put in which leg first? No, I think you can decide that for yourself. Yeah. Uh, say, where's Chester, anyway? Why aren't you hounding him instead of me? Uh, Chester ran into an old friend of his last night. Huh? Who's that? Oh, I've forgotten his name, but Chester went out to visit him for a couple of days. Yeah, well, out where? Out Fort Dodge. Yeah. Fort Dodge? No. Uh -huh. You mean he, he's in the Army? Yeah, he's got a pretty interesting yeah. job, too. Ah. Oh? He's a mess sergeant. Mess sergeant? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. In a couple of days of that, you'll have to go after Chester with a wagon. <laughs> well, he seemed pretty excited about the whole thing. Yeah, I can imagine well, the quartermaster's going to be excited, too, when he starts checking his groceries. Yeah. Oh, come on, Doc. You take more time than a woman. Come on. Well, I want to look my best. It isn't often somebody buys my breakfast. Buys it? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Doc. I'm ready. I didn't... Let's go. Mm. Well, no wonder you're so rich. Oh, yeah, well, sure. I'm rich, all right. Yeah, and I owe you. <laughs> well, at least you got something to dream about. Ah, well. See, it's a nice day. Yeah. Mm. It'll get hot, though. Uh, who, who's that woman driving the wagon? That looks like Hank Rutger's wife, huh? Well, yeah, it is. Rutger, you mean? Was oh, he that runny little sod buster out by Cottonwood Spring? Yeah, that's the one. I wonder what she's doing in time this early in the morning. Marshal? Oh, well, she's beckoning to you. Well, let's go see what she wants. Morning, Miss Rucker. Morning, Marshal. Doc. Yeah, good morning, man. You're up early. Yeah. Been quite some time since I've seen you and Tom. Always work to do when you're homesteading. You break your heart and you break your back and you end up with nothing. Even worse than nothing. Because the years are gone finally and you can't get them back. Uh, how's Hank? Hank? Uh, yes, ma'am, eh? You're your husband, Hank. Eight years slaving for him, working my fingers to the bone, and you end up with nothing. Miss Rucker, is there something wrong? Miss Rucker, I, I said, is there something wrong? I heard you. Hank's in the back of the wagon there, under that tarp. What? what? Here, Doc, I'll pull the canvas back. All right. Well, he's dead, Matt. Yeah. Shot in the back. How'd it happen, Miss Rucker? I don't know about things like this. What you're supposed to do, I mean. So I loaded him into the wagon and come into town. I figured you'd be the one to see. Now you figured right, but what happened? It wasn't me, Marshal. I didn't shoot him. Who did? I don't know. You don't know? I mean, I don't know his name or nothing. He was a stranger. Stopped by the place yesterday evening, just before sundown. Wanted to water his horse. Hank wasn't there. This fella kept looking at me and talking kind of funny. Then he saw Hank coming, and he rode on. Maybe then he's the one that Late doubled. last night, Hank woke up, heard something outside, thought it was an animal bothering the stock, went out, and pretty soon there was a shot. Well, how do you know it was the same man? Because he'd come by the house after. 
But I'll run him off. Oh. What'd this fellow look like? I don't know. Like any other man, I reckon. Nothing special. Except for his shoulders. Oh, what do you mean? He has the biggest shoulders I've ever seen on a man. Mighty powerful. Look, uh, Miss Rutgers, why don't you go across the street there to the Dodge house and take a room and get some rest, huh? You leave the wagon here, and Doc and I will take care of things for you, huh? I'm all right, Marshal. Uh, you go on now. Feels strange being alone. Hank wasn't much, I guess. Didn't treat me good, but at least he was always there. A woman needs a man. All right, I'll go now. Thank you, Marshal, for taking care of things. I'll stop by later, Miss Rucker. All right, Marshal. Well, uh, what do you think, Matt? I don't know, Doc. That woman's got something in mind she isn't telling us about. Well, here's our expectant father, the memory expert. And how do you feel, sir? Lousy. Oh? Why? You ever take care of eight kids while your wife is in the hospital having number nine? No. Take my advice. Don't. I haven't had a good night's sleep in days. I think my kids are part sponge. Oh, really? Why? Well, they drink enough water to irrigate a desert, and mostly in the middle of the night. Well, at least you don't have to worry about your wife. She and the baby are getting good treatment at the hospital, and thanks to Medicare, there won't be any expensive bills for you to pay. That's what bugs me, man. Why? It's such a bargain. You know no woman can resist a bargain. If your wife is bargain-minded, better get the pamphlet on Dependence Medical Care Program fast. Like another beer, Doc? No, just not, Kitty. People criticize me enough for this. <laughs> Doc... Oh, there's Matt. Huh? Over here, Matt. Oh, well, maybe I will have a beer after all, Kitty. <laughs> On him. Uh, hello, Kitty. How are you? Uh, hi, Good morning, Matt. You look tired. Yeah, I am tired. Uh, if it gets any hotter, they're going to have this country. Uh, any luck, Matt? No, Doc. I checked every room and house in Dodge, every liver stable. I even talked to some of the homesteaders out south of town. And nobody's seen a stranger who matches Ms. Rutger's description, if you can call it a description. Did she remember anything new? No, not much. I talked to her late this afternoon. She she thinks that he had reddish-brown hair, but she's not sure. Oh, just those shoulders, then. Yeah, that's all she's sure of. I guess she'd remember that, all right. Well, Matt, maybe you won't have to look any farther. Oh, what do you mean? That man over there at the end of the bar. What? We've been keeping an eye on him until you showed up. Oh. Who is he, Kitty? I don't know. Tonight's the first time he's been in here. Been staying to himself pretty much, just drinking and not talking. But he's got the shoulders on. Yeah. I think I'll go have a word with him. Evening, stranger. Evening. Uh, you're new in town, aren't you? I don't remember seeing you around before. You feel like Gavin, you better find somebody else, mister. I would if it was a matter of pleasure. My name's Dylan. I'm the U.S. Marshal here. That's supposed to bother me? It bothers some. Others not. And I'm one of the others. What's your name? Logan. And is that all? Just Logan? Bull, they call me. Bull Logan. Why did you hit town? Today? Just going through. Oh, from where? Out west, different places. Why? What difference does it make? None, maybe. You mind taking a little walk with me? Where? Across the street. Here. I'll carry your gun. What's the idea? 
You arresting me for something, Marshal? No, I'm just asking you to walk across the street. What's over there? A woman. You trying to get me into some kind of trouble? Logan, if this woman recognizes you, you're in plenty of trouble. Now, come on, let's go. You stand right there, Logan. I don't know what you're trying to pull, Marshal. But you're all wrong. That's possible. Oh, Marshal, I couldn't... Is this a man, Miss Rucker? What are you talking about? I never seen her before in my life. I thought you better take a look at him, ma'am. I don't know this woman. Now, what is this? What are you trying to set up here? Shut up, Logan. The man is... Shot Hank was real big. I reckon it stuck in my mind because Hank was such a little man. There's such a difference between them. All right, I'm big. What about it? You claiming you've seen me before? Stay where you are, Logan. He's not going to hurt you, Miss Rucker. Now, take a good look at him. Is this the man who stopped by your place yesterday afternoon who came back later and shot your husband? Well... No, Marshal. It ain't him. It's his shoulders, that's all. But other than that, he don't look nothing like that fella. I never seen this man before in my life. Look, if you're scared of him, don't be. I ain't scared of him. Why should I be? He ain't the same one. Well, you satisfied, Marshal? All right, Miss Rucker. Thanks anyway. I'm sorry to bother you. I'm going back out to the place in the morning, Marshal. There's things to do. And I think that fella's got clean out of the country by now. All right, ma'am. Do I get my gun back now? Yeah, here you are, Logan. Thanks. Good seeing you. Pleased to have met you, ma'am. Good night. Food. I'll tell you something, Matt. The mark of any civilization is its food. Oh, is that right, Doc? Dang tootin' is right. Now, you take France, for instance. Paris. Paris, France, you know. Their food is cooked just right. It's seasoned right and it's served right. And by golly, they're civilized. It goes together. Doc, you've been eating this same grub ever since you came to Dodge. Now, what's wrong with it all of a sudden? Well, look huh? at the stuff. What's wrong? Look, a plate full of greasy spuds and a few chunks of boiled leather. I tell you, man, it's enough to turn a man's stomach. It's no worse than usual. Now, go on, finish your supper. Ah, I wouldn't touch another bite of that with a ten-foot pole. No, sir, I'm telling you, Matt, this town will never be civilized until it starts eating decent food. Well, the way I heard it, the mark of a civilization is how it treats its women folk. Oh, how it... You think Dodge City rates any higher on that score? <laughs> no, I guess not. No, they're fancy women. They plague till they drink themselves to death. And their farm wives, they work to death. Why, a woman hasn't got a chance out here. Yeah, so I've been told. By a woman, of course. Mm, she was right. Whether it's the food or the women folk, this town is no gall dang good. <clears throat> Marshal Dillon. Oh, hello, Jeb. Well, how are things at the telegraph office, Jeb? Fine, Doc. I brought this telegram right over, Marshal. Uh huh? It's your answer to that circular you sent out on Bull Logan. Oh, yeah, thanks, Jack. Uh, what about this Bull Logan, man? Well, I thought he might be mixed up in the Rugger killing, Doc. Well, I thought you'd given up on that. No, I sent out a bulletin just on a hunch. I don't know. I think yeah. that's, uh, that's about all I've ever given. What is it, man? Wow. Huh? Look, he's wanted in California. Two counts of assault and suspicion of murder. The victim was shot in the back. 
I should never have let him leave town. Well, he didn't go far, Marshal. Now, what do you mean, Jeff? I ran into Ed Perkins on the way over here. He seen Logan just this afternoon. Where? Out by Cottonwood Crossing. And he said Bull Logan's gone to work for Mrs. Rutger. <laughs> Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joe, what are you doing? Oh, hi, Daphne. Just eating a midnight snack. What is that mess? That mess is a liverwurst, salami, lettuce, and peanut butter delight. Nightmare is more like it. What woke you up? My stomach was growling. What woke you up? You. Mm. And I was dreaming such a pleasant dream. Oh? What? I dreamed all of our savings bonds had matured and we were cashing them in. That kind of a dream I can appreciate. We were planning a trip around the world, and you bought me a fur coat, and I bought you that fishing tackle you want. Oh, it was gorgeous. Well, it doesn't have to be just a dream. Some of our savings bonds are ready to mature now. Joe, maybe we shouldn't cash them in. They can go on earning interest, you know, and it adds up fast. I know. That's why we started buying savings bonds, remember? With a bond a month on the payroll savings plan, our money is saved automatically. Stop waiting that sandwich under my nose. You're making me hungry. Well, fix yourself a sandwich, ma'am. I got all the makings right over here. All right. Move over, you bond-buying midnight maverick. I'm going to fix myself a humdinger. <laughs> Marshal Dillon, Miss Rucker. I, uh, I'm sorry if I scared you. No, no, you didn't. I just couldn't figure who it was. Nobody comes here at night. It must be kind of lonesome since Hank was killed, huh? Well, yeah. Yeah, it is. You managing all right by yourself? Well, I've had some help this week. Oh, some of the neighbors, huh? No. I... I took on a hired hand to help out. Well, you're lucky to find one. The boys can usually make more work in cattle this time of year. Well, I offered shares on the crop. A woman can't run a place like this by herself. No, ma'am, I guess not. You a local man, is he? Somebody from town? No. Just a stranger riding through. That's kind of risky, isn't it? Taking on a stranger? Well... What's his name, Miss Rugger? I reckon you already know, Marshal. Yes, ma'am, I already know. And did he tell you that he's wanted in California, maybe other places, too? No. Two counts of assault, suspicion of murder. Your husband wasn't the first man he shot in the back. What do you mean? It is the same man, isn't it, Miss Rugger? No. When you said you'd never seen him before, you lied, didn't you? Didn't you, Miss Rugger? Yes, I lied. All right, now, where is he? He's out in the barn. You stay here, and don't you try to warn him. That you, Martha? I said, is it? Well, Marshal, you're a long ways from town. You're under arrest for murder, Logan. So she told you about me after all. Not yet, but she will. I just got word back from California. It seems you're wanted out there. Now, don't try it, Logan. You're not taking me now. Is 
Is he... Is he dead, Marshal? Yeah. He's dead. I don't know why I said it wasn't him. I reckon I must have been crazy or something. Just seems such a shame, though. A shame? What was done was done. There wasn't nothing going to bring Hank back. I was left by myself. The bull here was big and strong. Seems such a waste. Him dead, too. I see. I got ground that needs plowing, Marshal. Seed to be planted. Life ain't easy for a woman alone. I don't know, man. Seems pretty easy the way you go at it. You go on back to the house now. I'll take care of things here. and directed by Norman MacDonald. Stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Walsh speaking. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> saddle, Mr. Dillon. I swear I'm so hungry I could eat a whole hog. Yeah? But with all the hog you got this morning's cooking on that stick right there, Chester. Is it done? Well, that depends on how hungry you are. It's done. <laughs> Thank you. E. <laughs> That's hot, ain't it? <laughs> it sure will be good to get back to Dodd tonight and sleep in the bed again, won't I? You know something, Chester? Civilization's made you soft. Well, maybe so. 
But I get mighty tired of using my back for a mattress and my belly for a covering. <laughs> Obviously, you were born for greater things than rooting around on the prairie and living in the rain. It ain't been raining, Mr. John. Uh, no, no, it hasn't, Chester. But it will. Sooner or later, it's bound to rain. Yes, sir. Wish we'd brought some more bacon. Say, Mr. Dillon, don't old man Granby live around here somewhere? Uh-huh. Well, maybe we could buy a little from him. According to what I've always heard, old Granby wouldn't lend anybody anything. Yeah. You really think he is a rich miser, like they say? Oh, I don't know, Chester. You know, sometimes a man's entirely different from his reputation. I only met Granby once or twice. He seemed like a nice enough old fellow. Mm. It's the same. I wouldn't want to live out here all alone with nothing but a few horses for company. Yeah, well, he's used to it. Yeah, but even if he does have a lot of money hid away somewhere, there's no place to spend it out here. Granby's pretty old for the pleasures Dodge has to offer, Chester. Oh, my gene, I hope I ain't never that old. <laughs> you know, at the rate you're burning yourself out, you never will be, so don't worry about it. Uh, Mr. Dillon, I live mighty quiet for a young fella who's free and still full of blood and stuff. Sure. Oh, I do. Uh, look over yonder. Huh? Over there, that string of dust laying right on the ground there. Ain't that funny? Yeah, I've been watching that. Not on the ground, though. There's a dry wash that runs along there. I think somebody's driving the stock down it. Mm. Maybe it's old man Granby. Yeah, maybe. Why don't we go over and say hello, huh? All right. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. If it is old man Granby, maybe we might could just ask him by a little dab of bacon, reckon? Well, there's no harm in that. Oh, Looks like horses down there. Yes, sir. I can see their heads now. But I don't see nobody driving them. They'll be along in a minute. Right, let's wait here. Yonder he comes. Now, that's not old Granby. Well, let's ride down and say hello anyway. Granby's brand on those horses. You must have hired him a hand. Yeah, maybe. Hello. Hello. You working for Granby? I ain't working for nobody, mister. Oh? And where is he? Where is who? Granby. I don't know no Granby. Those are his horses you're driving. They are? Yeah. I ain't driving them. What do you mean? They got ahead of me in the wash there, that's all. Oh, I see. You a cowboy? Yeah, sure. I'm a cowboy. Somehow you don't look like one. You don't ride like one, either. You're asking the questions, mister. And no decent cowboy would run another man's horses down a dry wash just because he didn't want to get up on the bank and ride around them. I told you, they got in front of me, is all. How come you're not carrying a gun? Does a man have to carry a gun? No. But I'll bet you're the only man within a thousand miles of here who isn't carrying one. Well, maybe I got a better conscience than the rest of you. Maybe. Now, look, mister, you've run those horses about five miles off of old Granby's place. You want to give us a hand, we'll run them back. I'm in a hurry. It won't take long. The old man might be a couple of days fighting them if we don't. You worry about him. I got to get into Dodge. We'll ride in with you afterwards. I ain't going to do it. It'd look a lot better if you did. I, um... I'd like to, mister, but I can't. I'm leaving now. So long. Well, forevermore, Mr. Dillon, you just going to let him go? Wait a minute, Chester. I'm going to let him hear what lead sounds like. No, don't shoot! Don't shoot me! All right, then ride back here. Don't 
Don't kill me, mister. I'm not going to kill you. Unless you try to run away. Why would I try to run away? You just did, Chester. Yes, sir? Ride down the bank and head those horses off. Start them back up the wash. We'll be out of here by the time they're back. All right, sir, Mr. Dillon. You stay right close to me, fellow. Don't you try anything smart. When we get to Granby's, if he says it's okay, then you can go wherever you like. I don't know Granby. I've never been there. And we'll show you the way. Come on, let's go. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe. Joe. Joe, stop reading that paper and talk to me. I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, I was talking to Mrs. Snyder today. You know, she's the one whose boy had 31% less cavities. Uh Uh-huh. Well, she thinks that we should buy bigger savings bonds. Uh Uh-huh. She says that when people can afford it, it makes more sense. Oh, she says there are a lot of different denominations. They start at $25, but then there are a 50, 100, 200, and even $500 bonds. Is that so? And then with the ones we've already bought through the payroll savings plan, we'd have quite a nest egg. Uh Uh-huh. Are you listening to me? Uh Uh-huh. Did you know that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and a third percent of the original purchasing price? Uh Uh-huh. I thought so. Joe, what did I say? Uh... You said that United States savings bonds are a safe, easy way of investing. I did. That they help guard our country's freedom. And? They're the best investment in America's future. I said something else, too. Oh, yeah. You said that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and one-third percent of the original purchase price. Well, now, how did you do that? Husband's trade secret. Old man Granby sure can find his horses all right now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, but I want this cowboy here to meet him. Now we'll see if he's in the house. Wait for you. Get off a horse, fellow. Go on. That's better. All right, come on. We'll take a look. Well, what are you waiting for? Nothing. You go ahead, Chess. It looks like I'm going to have to herd this man in. Yes, sir. You've been kind of balky ever since we ran into you, haven't you? I just don't like being dragged around. I never did. Well, I just want you to meet old Granby. He'll be grateful for your help and run his horses back here. I know what you think, mister. You think I was stealing them horses. Well, I never heard of the old man. I was never near this place. So you told me, but you're here now. I ain't afraid of you or nobody. Now let's go into the house. Come on. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Oh, oh, Granby, he, he's in there. Well, what's wrong? Right in the room there, Mr. Dillon. He's he just hanging there. What? Somebody went and hung him right in his own house. I don't want to see him no more. You you go take a look at him. Pull your gun and hold it on this man, Chester. If he makes some move, shoot him. Yes, sir. Now, you just stand right there real quiet like. I ain't going to do nothing. You sure ain't. Just because I happen to be in the country don't mean I killed nobody. Yeah. Mr. Dillon will decide about that. Who is this Mr. Dillon, anyway? He's a United States Marshal. That's who he is. A Marshal? A Marshal. Looks like you run into the wrong people, fella. Here, I'll hold your gun, Chester, and you'll search him. All right, sir. Here. Turn around. All right, take it easy. Now, the house is all torn up. He must have been looking for old Granby's money. I was never in that house. Ain't nothing on him. 
Not a thing. All right, Chester. Here's your gun. Here, gadget. Thank you. What's your name, fellow? Trimble. Joe Trimble. Where are you from? Up north. Up north where? All over. What are you doing down here? Making a change. Sure. And some cowboy you ran into told you about Granby being rich. So you came here and you kicked the old man around and then you hung him and then you tried to find the money. That's a lie. This is the first time I was ever near the place. I'm sure you did it, Trimble, but I wish I had more evidence. The court of law just might not convict you the way things stand. You're going to let me go? No, I'm not going to let you go. I'm arresting you and you're going to stand trial and I'm going to do my best to see you hung. I didn't do it, I tell you. And I'll go free, too. You'll see. Now, there's something mighty wrong about you, Trimble, and I can't figure it at all. But I'm sure gonna find out. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Hey, honey, I'm home. Daphne. Drop dead. Uh-oh, what's the matter, honey? Don't you speak to me, you you Don Juan. Don Juan? Daphne, I'm no Don Juan. No hobble espanol. Very funny. Ha, ha, ha. Well, it was no prize winner, but... No. Neither are you, you, you Lothario. I've often wondered, what's a Lothario? I don't know, but that's what the wives on TV always call their husbands. I guess it applies. Do you want me to go out and come in again? As far as I'm concerned, you can go for a long walk, preferably on a short pier. Well, oh, come on, Daphne, what's wrong? Your good friend Harry called, and he spilled the beans. Which beans? He said, quote, tell Joe he was right about those blondes. They're great, unquote. Blondes? That's what he said. <laughs> well? He didn't say blondes. He said bonds, savings bonds. What? Sure, I buy them on the payroll savings plan. And I told Harry he ought to do it too. Savings bonds have a guaranteed interest that pays back $4 for every three, which is a pretty good investment. That's a pretty good story too. It's true, so help me. That's why Harry's so happy. Savings bonds are great. Well, maybe you're right. You wouldn't really fool around with blondes, would you? You're too faithful and sweet and kind and... Fast talking. We let Joe Trimble dig a grave up behind the house, and then we laid old Granby in it and covered him with dirt. I was pretty sure now that the old man had never had an extra dollar in his life and that he'd been killed for no reason at all. Now, in any way, Trimble had done a pretty thorough job of looking for the money, and he'd found nothing. On the ride into Dodge, I tried to figure out just what he was. But he didn't seem to fit anywhere. He wasn't a cowboy or a hunter or a gambler or even just a drifter. Well, after we got him locked up in jail that night, Doc and I went over to the Long Branch for a drink with Kitty. And I was telling him about it. Now, how old is this fellow, man? Well, around 25, I guess, Doc. Oh, well, then he couldn't be running away from home. <laughs> oh, he's a little old for that, Kitty. Yeah, well, anyways, he'll hang him. Well, I hope the judge agrees with you, Doc. And why shouldn't he? All I got so far is circumstantial evidence. Well, then you should have shot him out on the prairie. Well, it's a good thing you're not a lawman. Well, Doc. maybe if I were, there'd be fewer killings around here. <laughs> I doubt it. You going up to Hayes for the trial, Matt? Yeah, I have to. That'll take a week, I suppose. Oh, Bob, why? Nothing. Only you've just been away for ten days. <laughs> oh, I gotta earn a living, Kitty. Well, you could make more money gambling. Right here in Dodge. Oh, no, Kitty, don't start that again, will well, you? Good evening, Marshal. Miss Kitty, Doc. Yes, Major. Hi, Major. I'd like a word with you, Marshal. Uh, sure, Major, sure. If you excuse us. Uh, we'll go to the bar there. I'll be back, Kitty. No hurry, Matt. Doc's got a lot of money. <laughs> I'll buy you a drink anytime, Kitty. Well, that's the best offer today, Doc. Let's go, Major. 
I had to come to Dodge on other business, Marshal, but I wanted to pass the word to you that we're looking for a man. Oh, the army, you mean? Yes, a deserter. No? Not from Fort Dodge. Oh, where was he stationed, Major? He was with the 7th Cavalry at Fort Lincoln. Up in Dakota, huh? Mm. For some reason, they think he headed south. Now, I don't have much of a description of him, just that he was a private, about 25, curly blonde hair, a scar on his left hand. Well, that fits. What was his name? He enlisted as Joe Gould, but he's known to have used the name Trimble. Well, he's right here in Dodge, Major. You what? I got him locked up in jail. Well, that's fine, Marshal. But how did you know that... I think he murdered an old man who lives about a day's ride north of here, and I'm going to have him tried for it. And that won't be necessary now, Marshal. I'll take over custody of him. Then he'd be tried at Fort Lincoln for desertion. I want him tried for murder, and i got to be there to present the evidence. Well, you could go up to Fort Lincoln. No, Dakota's out of my territory, Major. Besides, this is a civil crime. The Army wants that man, Marshal. I'm sorry, Major. He's going to be tried in the Hayes first. He's, he's still a soldier, even if he did desert. Well, if the judge lets him off, you can have him, but not otherwise. Major, he tortured and hung an innocent old man. And I'm going to do my best to see him punish for it. I'll have to take this up with my superiors. Well, you better hurry. I'm going to Hayes with him tomorrow. I hope you won't regret this, Marshal. I won't, Major. Not if Trimble is properly punished, I won't. I didn't wait till morning, but started out for Hayes with Joe Trimble that night. The trial lasted a week, and in spite of all the arguments I made, the judge finally decided that there wasn't enough real evidence to convict him. I even tried to make Trimble confess, but he was too smart for that, so there was nothing to do but bring him back and turn him over to the Army. I sent word to Fort Dodge. And the next morning, the Major himself appeared to take him into custody. Well, Marshal, looks as though you didn't have much of a civil case after all. Now, he killed old Granby. I know he did. But the law's a law, Major. Yes. And in the Army, orders are orders. But I'm sorry your judge didn't convict him after all. How's is that, sir? Now, Chester. Yes, sir. Uh, bring Trimble out, will you? Yes, sir. I will. <laughs> Well, I'll give the Army credit for one thing, Major. What's that? Trimble and I rode back some 80 miles yesterday, and when we got here, he wanted to sit up and play cards with Chester. Well, there may be some bad men in the cavalry, Marshal, but they're all tough. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's yours, Major. Private Trimble, sir. You're under military arrest, Private, and not privileged to salute. Besides, you enlisted as Private Gould, not Trimble. Yes, sir. Report to the guard outside. Yes, sir. Now, just a minute, Trimble. You know that you're mighty lucky, don't you? You should have died for what you'd done. <laughs> I told you I'd go free, Marshal. It'll catch up with you someday, Trimble. It always does, somehow. That's all I wanted to say. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Marshal. I'll be getting along. Uh, Major, mm -hmm. you said you were sorry that the judge didn't convict him. Why have you changed your mind? Marshal, now he won't even be tried. Not for some months, anyway. Right. You mean that the Seventh doesn't want him anymore? Oh, they want him all right. My new orders are to send him right up to the Dakotas. Oh? Uh -huh. Seems that the 7th Cavalry needs every man available. They're leaving Fort Lincoln soon on an expedition against the Sioux in the northern Cheyenne. The Sioux, huh? I wonder if old Sitting Bull is still the chief medicine man with him. I'm sure he is. But at any rate, the 7th will be heading into Montana territory. Yeah. Well, if they're after Sitting Bull's tribe, they will. He's always had a large camp over on the Little Bighorn. Yes, I know. Um, by the way... So who's in command of the 7th Cavalry now? An officer I served under a couple of years. I never did care for him much. A Colonel George Custer.
Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns were composed by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Wolf speaking. Join us again next week for another story of the western frontier of America in the 1870s on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Clay Richards. Clay Richards. Age 31. 31. Height 6 feet. Eyes brown, hair red. Eyes brown, hair red. Hey, how'd you like me to print his picture on these notices? I got a woodcut. Well, let me show you. Ernie! Yep? That's your marshal a copy of that front page. Interviewing Clay's wife yesterday, I noticed a tintype on the mantle, their wedding photograph. So, first thing you know, I snitched it. It's very thoughtful. Yeah, oh, I'll take it, Ernie. Yeah, here. And then I propped it up in front of me and carved me this woodcut. Ain't she prime? Ain't she just elegant? Real elegant. Good likeness, don't you think? Of course, he was seven or eight years younger with the Tintype. Yeah, it's a good likeness. Cuts his hair short. And Doesn't now, show what uh, makes a law-abiding uh, man like him try to rob a bank. Sort of Doesn't look like a man who it, murdered an old cashier and a Chinese remember. cook who just happened to sure be there. It over it, though. But it's a good likeness. Yes, sir, it is. A picture like this sure dresses up the front page, don't it? Yeah, it's a little masterpiece, Mr. Hightower. A notable contribution to the culture of Dodge City. Well, thank you, Marshal. Does fetch the eye, don't it? I'm printing an extra 500 copies of the weekly, and I bet I sell them all. Too bad the cashier's shot went wild. If he'd managed to kill Clay or even wing him, why, I bet I could sell a thousand extra copies. We must be thankful for the blessings we do receive, Mr. Hightower. Oh, I am, Marshal, I am. Why, just before it happened yesterday afternoon, I didn't know what I was going to fill my columns with. And then, like manna from heaven, 
Two murders and a bank robbery. Attempted bank robbery, Mr. Hightower. He turned and ran before he got his hands on so much as a dollar. Yes. Still as you say, like man. Dylan, I... I I'm talking to... business. What is it, Chester? Well, it can wait, I guess, Mr. Dillon. Uh, yeah, print Clay's picture on those notices, Mr. Hightower. Oh, where were we? Uh, eyes brown, hair red. Oh, yes. Also known as Red, Bricktop, and Sorrel. He uh, didn't answer to no other nicknames, did he? No, that's what they called him. All right, then in big letters, $400 reward. Dead or alive. And at the bottom, apply Matt Dillon, Marshall, Dodge City. Mm -hmm. uh, print 200 copies. How soon can I send Chester over for him? Uh, this afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Hightower. Chester. Think those posters will do any good? Richards is probably over the line into Oklahoma or Colorado by now. And Strawberry Roan, his is the fastest in the county. He has no money. He panicked and ran out of the bank before he got a penny. I think he'll try to get help from his wife or brother or a friend the first chance he has, maybe tonight. I say he's around here somewhere. I, uh, I'm sorry I turned on you like that, Chester. Why, that's all right, Mr. Dillon. Out all night with a posse, no sleep, man's bound to get touchy. No, it's not that. It's, it's the, the way, it's the way people use a thing like this. The men riding posse last night, they enjoyed it as though they were hunting fox or possum. High tower back there, he acts like it was a birthday treat, specially gotten up for him. Everybody finds a way to use it. Uh, what, what was it you wanted to tell me? Hmm? Oh, I, I got a kid, a, a little boy, locked up in the cell. Uh -huh. He ran away from home, back in Cottonwood. Ed Slade turned him over to me when he come through on the stagecoach just now. Kid about 12 years old. Who's is he? Widow woman, Miss Bonnie. She runs the boarding house in Cottonwood. Ed says the kid's always running away a little while, I guess. He flagged Ed for a ride on the road halfway between there and here. Soon as Ed seen him stand there with his bundle on his shoulder, he knowed what he was up to. So he told the kid he'd help him and then turn him over to us when he got here. All right, we'll send a telegram to the mother to come fetch him. Well, come on in, Chester, and shut the door. Mr. Dillon? You're letting in every horse fly in Kansas. Mr. Dillon, I think you better cancel the order for them notices. What? The Dutchman's coming up the street. And he's leading a strawberry roan, and Clay Richards is draped across his back. Like a sack of wheat across the saddle. Last time I saw him, two days ago, he was standing at the bar laughing his head off. A sack of wheat across the saddle. And followed by half the saloon bums and loafers in town. All right, Chester, make him keep back. All right, now stand back, you fellas. Come on now, back. Stand back. Ziegler. How'd it happen, Ziegler? My goat, my old billy goat, he pushes open the fence last night and runs away. Forget your goat. What about Clay? Yeah, I, I tell you. This morning, I go to look for the goat. I walk here, there. From near the river, I see Clay. He sits there. I say, hello, Clay. The gate. A dirty Dutchman. You know the dog. Clay was your best friend. He helped you buy your farm, so you kill him for your All right, all of you. Keep back, everybody. Kill Clay? Me? No, no. My brother, he was like... We was in the war together. Peter, listen. You killed him for the war. Not so. I killed nobody. Not, not since Gettysburg. Clay is dead already when I find him. I don't even own a pistol. Ziegler, inside, quick. Yeah, yeah. Chester, give me a hand with Clay. All right, all of you. Listen up. Shut up! I will not tolerate a disturbance. You know me. I got him, Chester. Take his leg. All right, kick the door shut. Marshal, I don't kill Clay. On this table, Chester. Oh, 
What'd you do with Clay's gun? His holster's empty. Gun? Clay's? I ain't got it. I don't even own one. Chester, see if it slipped out. While His we holster were... was empty coming up the street. First thing I noticed. Maybe it's yeah. over on the... Another customer? Why, well, that's three in less than a day. Oh, bountiful harvest. My fees this month will keep me in luxury. In luxury? Doc, I uh, want to have an inquest as soon as possible. Well, as soon as I finish the autopsy. Shouldn't take long with the practice I've had this week. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, late afternoon all right with you? I'll take him up to my office right now. Uh, no, thank you, Chester. I can carry him all by myself here. You just open the door there like a good fella. Uh-oh. 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 Yeah, Marshal, tell the city fathers... I'd like to make a deal when the corpses are as famous as this one. <laughs> Back in 53 in San Francisco, a fellow I knew earned a fortune, exhibiting the head of Joaquin Marietta. Tell him if they let me keep the remains, I'll do the autopsies for nothing. Shut the door, Chester. Ziegler, where is it you met Clay on the river? By the fort. This side, by the fort. Right out there, Chester, and see if you can find Clay's gun. Maybe he dropped it when he was shot. I did not shoot, Clay. Sure. I did not. I had no reason to. I did not. I did not. Now, you listen to me. Maybe you think Dodge has got so big, I don't know about everything that goes on here. Well, if you do, you're wrong. If you think I don't know about the bank having an overdue mortgage on your farm, you're wrong. $400 is reason enough for a struggling farmer like you. No. I could not do such a thing. I, I am a human being. To a peace officer, Ziegler, that's enough grounds for suspicion. But whether you did it or not... Well, we decided it's your trial. In the meantime, you just stop yammering about it. Trial? Me? Even when I shoot somebody, I stand trial. If they find it's justifiable homicide, and they probably will, Clay being a wanted man, then he'll let you off. And if not... Please, I am permitted to go now. Go? Are you crazy? I found this stock. I, I must look after it. You sit right down. You want to be lynched? You're trying to get yourself murdered? Have you forgotten about Clay's brother, Adam? Adam would not believe I shot him. What difference does it make whether he believes it or not? His brother's been killed. Everybody's looking to him to do something about it, and he knows it. You want me to guess where he is right this minute? He's in one of them saloons, lapping up courage to come in here and ask me to give you to him for a present. You want to know who's with him? Ever loafer, ever bum, ever slob in town. Slapping him on the back and telling him what a shame it is. Egging him on to kill you so that they can have some excitement and some fun. Well, maybe you deserve killing, but it's my job to uphold the law, and I'm not letting you out of here. What? I tell you, you might that's... spend your time trying to think up a better story. That is, if you intend to stay in this town. All right, now think back. Didn't Clay go for his gun before you shot him? I tell you, I didn't. If I'm not under arrest, you have no right to keep me here. I got to look after my farm. I go. All right, Chester, lock him up. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Come on now, Ziegler. Help me, senior. Help me, senior. Step out, Sonny. This cage is bespoke. Who's in there, Chester? Yeah, that little old runaway from Cottonwood. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Come over here, son. Come over here to me. I know who you are. <laughs> you do, do you? You bet. You're Matt Dillon. <laughs> Guilty. I know you right off. He just pointed out to me one day back home. Filler says you was the fastest gun thrower in Kansas. <laughs> Wyatt Earp wouldn't be awful interested to hear that, I'm afraid. Miller says you was faster than older. Faster than Wild Bill Hickok and Hay City and Fat Masterson or any of them. How many fellas have you killed? You don't keep score, son. It's something you try to forget. Not me. Someday I'll be famous like you. And for every feller I kill, I'll, I'll put a notch on my gun. People will see those notches and... They'll know they better not try. Why'd you run away from home, bub? Don't you know your mother's likely to worry about oh, you? Oh, she won't worry. She's too busy working. You ain't gonna make me go back, are you? You wouldn't do that, would you? Well... Because it wouldn't stop me for long. I'd only run away again. Oh, where are you off to in such a sweat? Oh, Texas, California, Mexico. Fella can accomplish things there, not like living in old Cottonwood. If you let me go, someday when I'm famous, you can tell people you helped get me started. <laughs> Well, well that's, that's a pretty strong inducement. Um, I'll have to think about it for a while. And uh, look, uh, while I'm making up my mind, I, I want you to give me your word. Word of a man who'll be famous someday that uh, he won't try to run away from me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to have 
Just to lock you up again. Oh, I'll shake on that. Good, good. Uh, Chester, I want you to go look for Clay's gun. Yes, Mr. Dillon. And uh, on the way, stop off and send that uh, telegram. You know? Hmm? Oh, that telegram. Uh, yes, Mr. Dillon. I'll Where's Ziegler? Right it's all right, Chester. Go ahead. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Where's that murdering dog? Oh, there you are, you... Not a single step further, Adam. I want him, Dylan. He murdered Clay, shot him down without giving him a chance. How do you know? Because Clay wouldn't have let anyone catch him off guard except a friend. A friend. And that Dylan give me that Dutchman. Try to take him. It's like that? It's like that. And it's true what the fellas say. You made a deal with the Dutchman to give him the reward and protect him if he'd kill Clay for you. That was the deal, was it? Yeah. The fellas say why I'd make such a deal? Dylan, it ain't no longer a secret around town that you and Francie warned each other. But Clay was in the way. You had him killed so you could get his wife. Do you deny it? No. No. It'll serve as well as any other crazy story to work you up. You think you're safe behind that star, don't you? Well, Clay have friends, lots of them. I'm coming back with them friends, and we'll get the Dutchman and you and anyone else who tries to stop us. All right, Adam. I'll be waiting. Yeah. You wait. I almost seen something pretty just then, didn't I, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, almost. About another... Find a whiskey ought to do it. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, many radio shows win high popularity with the prizes and cash they give away. But there's one show that's tops because the head man gives away as little as possible. What other radio program could it be but... The Jack Benny Show, so be listening. Here's the second act of Gunsmoke. Son? You say something, Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, open my drawer in front of you there. You'll find a small bottle of oil in there. No, no, the one to the right. Yeah, that's it. Now, bring a little brush, too, huh? Here it is. Thanks, bub. It's a right nice gun you have. Yeah, it's not bad, but a little stiff. Just a little stiff. Do you want to have a trigger? i never seen no gun without a trigger before. Oh, you're a mover trigger or a tie back against a guard. And all you have to do is uh, thumb a hammer. Yeah, hey, like that. It's faster. <laughs> yeah, that's better now. Remove the trigger. I remember that. What in the world for? Well, I remember everything you told me about the Texas holster and the spring holster and the double roll and filing off the site. It's just me, Mr. Dillon. Oh, any luck, Chester? No, sir, not any. I went to the store first and asked Mr. Denton what kind of ammunition Clay Richard used to buy, and he told me Clay had a double action forty-four. I scarred that riverbank a half mile each way from the ford and not a sign of it. I got that telegram off. You know who ought to be here pretty soon. It's only seven, eight miles from... Is that fire in town? Funeral services for Mr. Grinnell, the cashier. So soon? It's awful hot weather. Yeah. Um, any of your guns need oiling? Just I don't think so. You sure? When Adam left, he said he'd be coming back with some friends. I know. I stopped at the Oliver Gandy just now to rinse out my mouth. Adam was there talking mighty ugly and mighty big. He's got a size we'll follow him. Uh, when do you think? Any minute now, Mr. Dillon. It want me to take Bob out of here to one of the hotels, maybe? I want to see No, him. I think you'll be safer here, Chester, behind stone walls and dodging about the streets rubbernecking. You keep your head down, sonny. You hear? There's a... Matt! Matt, i got to talk to you. She ought to be in mourning. If she cared for Clay at all anymore, she ought to be in black. Matt. Oh, Lord, I find her more beautiful all the time. Matt, have you heard what they're saying? What are they saying, Francie? That you and me, that, that you made Pete Ziegler kill him because of... I'm sorry that got back to you, Francie. It's all over, Dodge. 
had him almost strangled me before they dragged him off. Francie, I didn't shoot, Clay. Francie, I beg you, believe me. I was the Shut shooting. up, Ziegler. The, uh, woman, Shut up, or I'll put you to death! Francie is just one of those crazy stories. They needed one, and they made one up. But, Matt, everyone believes it. On my way down here, people were pointing, whispering... Old women clucking their tongues at me. They believe it. They'll forget it as soon as this is over. They'll remember that even if we once did go with each other, it was finished and done with even before the war ended, before you even met Clay. No, they won't forget it. For the rest of my life, as long as I stay here, oh, I'll... Hold it a minute, Francie. Yeah, Doc, what is it? Oh, uh, am I interrupting? What is it, Doc? Uh, our topsy's finished. I examined his liver and lights as... This turn. is Mrs. Richards, Doc. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. I'm sure I have meant no disrespect for the departed. Well? Well, Clay was shot, all right, but from the nature of the wound and the coagulation of the blood, I'd say it happened sometime yesterday. I'd say the cashier's bullet didn't go wild after all. How could a dead man gallop away? Well, the wound wasn't what killed Clay. The ball hit the rib case and it bounced off. Twenty-two caliber it was. And what did kill him was the stab in the back. Right through the spine. Inflicted sometime this morning. Now, near as I can judge, by a small blade, oh, two or three inches long. It could have been a Barlow knife. Thanks, Doc. Yeah, please accept my condolences, Mr. Richard. You call the inquest any time you're ready, Marshal. Chester, close the door. You see? You see, I didn't do it. I didn't shoot him. All right, then you stabbed I... him, maybe. You said you never carried a gun. Look, Francie, go home and... Give matters a chance to simmer Matt, down. Matt, I'm going to ask you for something. Yeah? Turn Pete Ziegler out into the street. What? Francie, they're itching to get their hands on him. Let him have him. It'll prove that story's a lie, that you didn't make a deal with him. Please, Matt, I have to live here. Sammy, I have to live here. Matt? Matt, don't look at me like that. Go home, Francie. Go home or leave town or hang yourself or anything you like. Just go away. Matt. Away. Right now. I bought me a bottle at the Alifagans, Mr. Dillon. Would you care for a drink? No. Oh, I guess the funeral's over. There'll be others. Funny. No, I miss that bell. Awful quiet, ain't it? It's just what... Just about on schedule. Are you ready, Chester? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. I'd use a shotgun if I were you. It's more effective when there's a mob to be dealt with. Oh, yes, sir, I am. Ziegler, and you too, son. If trouble starts, lie down flat on the floor and keep your head down all the time. Don't go out to see what's happening. You understand me? Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right. Dillon! Dillon! Come out, Dillon! Come on! Chester, I want you to stand here in the doorway after I go out where you can cover the back door and me at the same time. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. Open the door. It's my duty to warn all of you that you're in the breach of the peace. Uh, I've sworn to uphold the law. I've killed men in order to do it, and I'm prepared to do so again. Give us a Dutchman, Dylan. Men! I ask you to be sensible and to leave quietly. But if you refuse to listen to reason, if you insist upon being fools, if you've already decided to act like wolves instead of humans... And there's nothing I can say to make you change your minds. All right, you want Peter Ziegler? Well, he's not more than 20 feet behind me, so come on and get him, any of you. One at a time or all at once. Come on. Which one of you wants to die first? You? You? You, Adam? Well, what do you say, Adam? You let him here. Don't let this star on my coat stop you. Come on. There, I'm not wearing it now. Well, come on, draw, Adam, draw! (laughs) 
You all right, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Get his gun. Man alive, I couldn't even see your hand move. Uh, uh, Marshal! Oh, don't tell me. Don't tell Doc, me. Doc, you make one single funny remark and I'll knock you down. You just take him to your office and get to work. Well, I, I never do mean to offend, Marshal. In my line of work, well, bodies, they're just so much lumber. Make all the jokes about them you please, but not to me and not in my hearing. In my line of work, there's nothing humorous about death. Give him a hand, Chester. No, no, no. I can handle the marshal. Thank you. Thank you. Just the same. Can you direct me to the marshal's office? Uh, yes, ma'am. Right here. I'm Marshal Dillon. Well, I left Cottonwood as soon as I got your telegram. I'm Miss Bonnie. Where's my boy? Oh, we have him, ma'am. Safe and sound. Here, let me help you down. Thank you. Hitch that horse, Chester. Right this way, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry he put you in all that trouble, Marshal. The truth of the matter is he is a wild one and no mistake. Takes after his father, one scrap after another. Uh, he was no trouble at all. I enjoy children. I like to have them around. Bob? Bob, your ma's here. Son? Chester, where's the boy? Did you let him slip past you? No, sir, Mr. Dillon. He never got past me. Look, the back door's open. He seen me and he hightailed it, the devil. <laughs> we'll round him up for you, ma'am. Don't worry. Oh, I don't know why I bother hauling him back. If he's run away once, he's run away a thousand times. This time he ran because I wouldn't buy him a gun. He wanted a real one. That boy's just gun crazy, I swear. I got him a nice Barlow knife instead. Barlow knife. I reckon it didn't signify and off he runs. Barlow knife? A kid. Chester finds that kid. Marshal, has he done something bad with it? Told him to use it careful. He promised he'd use Wait, it careful. No, no, never mind, Chester. He's got Clay's strawberry ruin. We'd never catch up to him. Oh, I try to bring him up right. I tell him to be good, but he don't listen. He just don't listen. Now, calm yourself, ma'am. Just calm yourself. Here's your little bundle, Mr. Dillon. What? Yeah, give it to me. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> Here, you're better at knots than I am. Open it, will you? For the moment he was born, he'd been nothing but tribulation to me. Now, please, ma'am. <laughs> What's he got in it, Chester? A shirt, stockings, a piece of sausage, and this. Forty-four double action. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. That's Clay's gun. Sonny didn't manage to keep it long, did he? Well, if he wants a gun that bad, he's bound to get hold of another one somewhere, somehow. Chester, call Mr. Hightower over. Hey! Hey, Mr. Hightower! Oh. Come on over. Mr. Dillon wants you. Marshal, could I have please a drink of water? What? Oh, Ziegler, I forgot all about you. Uh, Chester, where are the keys? Yeah, right there on the desk. Oh. There we are. It'll be safe for you to go home now. I, I can go back by the phone. Yeah, that's right. I'll send for you for the trial. Oh, Duncan should. Duncan should. Watch where you're going, you dumb. Excuse me. Yes, Marshal. Mr. Hightower, it appears that we can do business after all. Get some paper and a pencil. I want some notices printed. Fire away. Wanted for murder. Wanted for murder. Uh, what's the boy's name? Bonnie. William Bonney. William Bonney. William Bonney. Age 12. Height about five feet. Mm -hmm. Hair light, eyes blue. Mm -hmm. I don't suppose he's known by any other name. I know. Everybody just called him Billy. Or the kid. Also known as Billy. The kid. <laughs> Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Walter Newman, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in tonight's cast were Don Diamond, Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, and Howard McNair, with Richard Beals, Paul Dubov, Georgia Ellis, and Mary Lansing. 
Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Longtime favorites Amos and Andy are rising to new heights in their CBS radio series on Sunday nights. Heard on most of these same stations, Amos and Andy find trouble as constantly as ever and make it just as funny and as human as they have for more than 20 years. Be sure to hear Amos and Andy this Sunday, won't you? Right after the Jack Benny Show. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, there's fast, funny quizzing on the Bob Hawk Show every Monday evening. This is the CBS Radio Network. by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> This is close enough. Let's leave the horses here, Boyle. Okay. Don't forget your rifle. Yeah, I got it. That's him over by the corral. Looks like he's alone, all right. He's alone. Who else could stand being around them stinking sheep? Must be something awful wrong with a man like that, Joe. There is. We're going to set it right. Watch him now. I don't see he's wearing a gun. Probably got one hit out nearby. Hello? Your name Gideon Seek? It is. He's your sheep? Yeah. You got anybody helping you? I always work alone. I notice you ain't wearing a gun, Seek. I don't even own a gun. You don't? I don't believe in killing. Well, we do. Most men do. See, this is cow country. You know what that means? Oh, it's my sheep. we got to make an example of you. Other people might get ideas if we don't. Pretty soon the country turn white with them willies. But I only have a few. Only 24 of them. There's 24 too many. We're going to kill them, Sick. We're going to shoot every one of them. Oh, no. You go run into the law, we'll come back and shoot you. Well, you can't kill them. You try to stop us, we'll have to hit you on the head. I won't do anything. He's too scared, Cal. Come on, let's get to work. Oh, please. Please, don't kill those animals. You just stand right there. We'll be keeping one eye on you. You start the other end, boys. I'll start here. Okay. But you mustn't do it. You'll have a lot of meat left. 
If you eat sheep meat. I don't eat any kind of meat, but you mustn't kill them. Shut up. Let's get it done, boys. I'm ready. Go ahead, Dan. Stand back, Steve. You know. You sure Chester's going to bring my mail back, to? Well, he said he would. But though. where is he? The Santa Fe pulled in two hours ago. Oh, well, they have to sort it, don't they? What are you so anxious about, anyway? You expecting a lot of money or something? I could use a little money. Oh, and there's a man who owes me $20. Oh. Gideon's seat. He's just getting off his wagon there. Well, Gideon's an honest man. He'll pay you. Oh, I know that. I'm not worried about him. Good morning, Doc. Yeah. Marshal? Morning, oh, Gideon. How are you? Doc, I got bad news for you. Oh? I'd meant to bring in some sheep today, and I was going to pay you when I sold them. Oh, well, I can wait, Gideon. Well, I'm afraid it'll be a long time now, Doc. Oh, that's all right. Something happened, Gideon? I lost my sheep, Marshal. You lost them? I'm going to get some more as soon as I can, and, and I'll pay you, Doc. Now, you know I'll pay you. Oh, of course I do. Well... Goodbye. Go on, get him. Oh. He's a strange man. Yeah, he is. But how could a man lose all his sheep, man? I don't know, Doc. But I got to ride out that way in a couple of days. I'll stop by and have a look. That whistling man, Bobby Haggard, really started something. Tonight, we'd like to introduce a player piano that could have come right out of the Long Branch in Dodge City. Packs more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. Gideon know where he's around, Mr. Jones. He's probably in the shed, Chester. Mm-hmm. What's that big pile of dirt he's got out there? I don't know. Maybe he's digging a well. Oh, no, no. That's too much dirt for a well. Huh? Well, then ask him what it is. Uh, hello, Gideon. Hello, Chester. Marshal. Get in. Would you come inside? Ah, uh, no, thanks, Gideon. We were just riding by. <laughs> Chester was wondering what you're digging out there. Oh, well, uh... That's a grave. A grave? My sheep are buried there. Well, what happened, Kitty? They got killed. How? It doesn't matter, Marshal. I'm going to get some more when I can. Who did it, Kitty? Tell me. A couple of men. They shot them. They shot all your sheep? Yeah, it's no use asking me their names. I won't tell you. Don't you want them caught? No. Look, Gideon, I know you're a peaceful man. And that you never carry a gun and all, but this is a matter for the law. Now, you tell me who did it so I can go after him. No, I can't. Why not? 
I don't believe in killing, Marshal. I didn't say I was going to kill him. They killed your sheep, didn't they? You don't understand. Then you better tell us. I don't believe in killing for any reason, even for food. And I don't believe in trying to resist evil. What do you mean by that? Well, if a man strikes me, I don't strike back. But don't you believe in defending yourself? The men who killed my sheep will be punished. They will if I find them. No, Marshal. Their own conscience will punish them. Look, Gideon, you've got a right to think any way you want to think. But so have I. And I'm a lawman. I'm sorry, Marshal, but I can't help you. Those men aren't through with you yet. You get more sheep on here and they'll be back. And the next time they probably won't stop just with a sheep. I'll win in the end, Marshal. You're awful stubborn, aren't you? No more than you are. All right, Gideon. It's your funeral. Come on, Chester. You weren't looking for me. <laughs> oh, did you find something in that window to blow your money on? Now you talk like I'm a cowboy in with six months' pay. <laughs> I know better than that. Well, you don't act like it. I was only looking at those wool gloves, Matt. No? Mm-hmm. Oh, those would be nice company. Yeah. Uh, by the way, anything new with Gideon? Well, I haven't seen him since I was out there a couple of weeks ago. He interests me, that man. Yeah, me too. This not fighting back and all. Maybe he's got something, man. He hasn't got his sheep. No. But he didn't get killed, either. If he'd tried to put up a fight, they'd probably shot him. They're still free to do it, whoever they are. Well, maybe you're right. But at least Gideon's ideas are some different from anybody else's around here. Yeah, well, that's true, for sure. And it isn't wrong, just because it's different. No. Think about it, Matt. There can't be a fight unless both parties want it, can there? Hey, Kitty, look. Hmm? Getting off that horse, sir. Oh, it's Gideon. First time I ever saw him without his wagon. Yeah. He's going in to see Mr. Jonas. Maybe he's going to buy a new one. Maybe. Um, Kitty, I think I'll go say hello. Oh, sure, Matt. i got to get back to work anyway. Yeah, I'll stop by later on, huh? Good. Asking a lot of you to trust me, Mr. Jonas. Things going the way they are. Yeah, there ain't many men I'd trust, Gideon, but you're one of them. Oh, hello, Marshal. Mr. Jonas, how are you, Gideon? Hello, Marshal. You hear what happened, Marshal? Have you told him yet, Gideon? Oh, it's not important. Not important? His house burned down, that's all. Oh? And his wagon along with it. I'm going to rebuild. Mr. Jonas told me yesterday that he's going to put me on the books for enough material to get started. Oh, that's mighty good of him. Oh, glad to do it. Hard-working, honest fellow like Gideon. Must have been a pretty big fire, Gideon. Yes, it was. I mean, to burn your wagon up, too. I got an old wagon out back he can use. Now, you wait here now. I'll go see just how much material I got on hand. I'll get in. Well, what, Marshal? So they came back and burned your house down, huh? All right, they did. But I'm still not going to tell you who they are. They must want you out pretty bad, Gideon. But I'm staying. They'll kill you next. It's no use arguing, Marshal. <sighs> Hell, it beats me. I don't know what to do. Well, just don't do anything, Marshal. Like you, huh? They can't win. They're doing pretty well so far, Gideon. I can't beat it out of you, but I sure hate to stand by and watch a man let himself be destroyed. I guess we'll never understand each other, Marshal. No, no I guess not. <laughs> you listen
listening to Gunsmoke in your favorite easy chair or out driving. Oh, there you are, in the kitchen. Say, you want to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable? Have a Chesterfield. Enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better, and Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Chester. You better come outside. Oh, what's the matter? Well, there's a wagon out there and get in seats in it. He must be hurt bad. What? There it is. I seen it coming down the street, but there was nobody driving, so I tied the horse up at the rail. Well, what happened to get in? I don't know. I couldn't see too good in the dark and all, so I come to get you before trying to do anything. Uh. He's been shot, Chester. He's still alive? Yeah, but we better get him up to docks. Come on, give me a hand here. Yes, sir. All right. Do you think we can ride out and find where it happened? Maybe track him down? What, at night in the rain? Well, maybe now he'll tell us who done it. I doubt it, even if he lives. He sure does make it hard for the law, doesn't he? Yeah, he sure does. Draw me a beer, will you, Sam? Come in, sir. How's Gideon's seat today, Matt? Uh, Doc says he'll be all right in time. But he still won't talk? Oh, he talks all right. I just don't understand him, that's all. Well, I guess you're just going to have to let him have his way, Matt. Here's your beer, Mark. Oh, thanks, Sam. Bartender, bring me another bottle, will you? Oh, another bottle. He sure needs that. Yeah, he's pretty drunk, isn't he? Uh, he ought to be. Sam says he's been here since morning. It doesn't look like he's going to make any trouble, though. Well, I'm not so sure. He's been drinking like he's awful mad at something. Kitty? Huh? Who's that who just came in? Oh, I don't know. I knew I'd find you, Boyle. You had to come in and get drunk, didn't you? You leave me alone, kid. <laughs> Why'd you run off? Man? What's the matter with you? I told you what's the matter, and I'll leave me alone. You ain't quitting now. I'm through, I told you. I mean it. I can't stand it no more. I start something, I finish it, and I told you this morning I heard it ain't finished yet. I don't even like to be around you, Kel. You make me ashamed of myself. Now you listen. My horse is down the street. I'm a time next to yours, and then I'm coming back here for you. And you're going with me if I have to carry it. What do you suppose that's all about, Matt? I don't know. But I think I'll find out. Yeah. Excuse me, Kitty. Hello, Boyles. Oh. You're the marshal, ain't you? Yeah. What's bothering you? Plenty. But it ain't none of your business. What did you do to make you so ashamed of yourself? Nothing. You're a cattleman, aren't you? I'm proud to be one. 
I sure ain't no stinking sheep herder, no lousy sheep herder. No, and I don't think you're a coward either. What? But you're feeling like one. That's why you're ashamed of yourself. It's kind of hard to beat down a man who won't fight back, isn't it? How'd you find out, Marshal? From you, I guess. We ain't dead. Kel heard about that this morning, but I ain't going on with it. I'm through. I can't stand it no more. You finish your drink, Boyles. I'll be back directly. Where are you going, Mr. Dillon? Wait right here, Chester. I may need you. Yes, sir. Well, what do you want, Marshal? I've been talking to your partner, Kel. What? Kind of broken him down, what you two have been doing lately. What are you saying? It's made him ashamed. Now, you heard him. He can't stand it anymore. It's Boyles you're talking about. He's drunk. He always gets to feeling sorry for himself when he's drunk. Uh Uh-huh. You shot a man last night, Kel. You left him for dead. You better be ready to back that up, Marshal. I'm ready. All right, you can have Boyles. He won't fight. But you ain't taking me. You think I'm going to let you ride out of here? Enough talk, Marshal. Is he dead, Mr. Dillon? He's dead, Chester. But what happened? Who is he? There's a man at the bar of the Long Branch. His name's Voiles. He's drunk. Go lock him up. Boyles? Who's he? Like Gideon said, Chester. Boyles punished himself. And he was wrong about Kel here. I had to do that. So I guess we were both right. moment, our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. A cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, when frontier settlers cleared their land, they left the brush piled around their place and earned the name Nestor because from a distance it looked like a big old bird's nest. Well, next week, a Nestor causes trouble when he won't leave his land. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Ralph Moody, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Jack Moyles. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Only with L&M can you enjoy the full, exciting flavor of today's finest tobaccos. No other cigarette, plain or filter, gives you the full, exciting flavor you get through the pure white miracle tip. So light up. Free up. Let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Guns.
smoke. L&M, the modern cigarette that lets you get full, exciting flavor through the modern miracle of the pure white miracle tip. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal, the first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> It's a nice clear evening, Mr. Dillon. It'll be cold before morning, though. Maybe old Doc ain't too far wrong. Oh, what about? Well, he claims winter's coming early this year. He claims we'll have snow before the end of the month. <laughs> He's just passing along Indian talk, Chester. They're all claiming the same thing. Evening, Marshal. Oh, how are you, Chester? Miss Cobb? How do you, Marshal? Chester. Evening, ma'am. Get up there. You do declare, Mr. Dillon, that that ain't the most dilapidated old buggy I ever seen anywhere. Ah, uh, Jezra believes in getting full value out of things. Making do, as he calls it. Mm. Yeah, let's get something to eat, huh? Well, now, eating is something I get full value out of. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, let's sit over there by the window. Mm. That team of Jezra's could do with some eating. The way their bones are sticking out. Ah, uh, Jezra figures fat on a horse is a sign that grain's being wasted. Well, you shortly, Marshal. Okay. He must figure the same thing about women. Ms. Cobb's bones were sticking out some, too. Yeah, he probably works her half to death. Has to to run a farm that size without any hired help. Yeah, they sure do keep to their selves. Ah, uh, people just don't take to Jezra much. He's got a pretty cold way about him. And it's hard to say what she's like. Mm, that poor lady don't even open her mouth less than he tells her she can. Plain mousy, that's what she is. Well, what are you figuring to eat, gents? Well, what do you got? Uh, stewed beef and bile greens. Uh, well, uh, I guess that's what we'll eat, huh, Chester? Mm, all right, I'll bring it right out. Boiled greens. Boiled jimson weed. More than that. What? Hey, that was up the end of the street, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, come on, Chester. Open up here. Let me through, will you, please? 
Will you let me through? Hang on to that horse. It's mighty spooky. What's the trouble, Jesuit? Marshal, you've allowed this town to become a sink of iniquity, a whited sepulcher. How's that so? A town of painted Jezebel, scoundrels, and murdering assassins. The name should be changed to Sodom or Gomorrah. You all right, Miss Cobb? Somebody tried to kill us, Marshal. They were standing right over there in the shadows. Minerva, you'll kind of remember a woman's place. Marshal asked me. Silence. Sorry, Jezra. Did you get a look at him? We did not. The coward struck in the darkness. It was only a miracle we escaped. Uh, any of the rest of you see who fired those shots? Hey, you're the law here, Marshal. I demand an accountant of this outrageous assault. Jezra, do you know anybody who might think they got a reason to kill you? I never had an enemy in my life. Well, it looks like you got one now. <laughs> yourself of old-fashioned ideas. Why don't you live modern? Live modern. Live, live, live modern. Free up. Freshen up your taste. Smoke an L&M. Why are more people changing to L&M than to any other cigarette? Because only L&M lets you enjoy full, exciting flavor through the pure white miracle tip. L&M draws easier, tastes richer, smokes cleaner, so free up, freshen up your taste, get full, exciting flavor, live modern, smoke L&M. Make today your big red letter day and start to live the modern way, live, live, live modern, smoke an l and It's America's fastest growing cigarette. What you mean, Doc? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, i got to make this prescription look real authentic. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, these are fooling pills. I've got nothing in them but sugar and some chalk and a little gum arabi to bind them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of medicine folks get from you. Oh, no. It's the kind old Mrs. Prudlin gets. As long as she figures they help her. That's all that's necessary. At least they don't do her any harm. <laughs> nothing wrong with her anyhow, except in her mind. <laughs> Oh, there we are. We'll let that sit a while and dry, and then... Oh, say, you found out yet who fired those shots at old Jezra Cobb? No, Doc. Not a hint. That's a funny thing, Matt. I don't think I know a soul in Dodge that likes old Jezra. Yeah, I know, Doc. But nobody really hates him, either. They just stay clear of him as far as they can. Yeah, that's just it. He just isn't the kind of a man to rouse up strong feelings in anybody. Good or bad. Well, he must arouse some and whoever tried to kill him or kill her. I don't even know for sure which one they were after, him or his wife. Uh, you busy, Doc? Huh? Oh. Well, come right in, Kitty. Hello, Kitty. Matt, what are you doing here? Well, he's hiding from Jezra Cobb. What? <laughs> don't mind, Doc. Um, I'll step outside, Kitty. If oh, you... no, no, don't go, Matt. I just wanted to get something for a headache, Doc. Oh, it's too bad. Well, dip yourself some water there. <laughs> Here are some pills I just made up, Kitty. Oh, not Doc. Not... <laughs> the formula came straight from Boston. Well, they can take care of this headache. They're miracle pills. That's exactly what they are. Here you are. You swallow a couple of those. Oh, thanks, Doc. I personally guarantee those to stop the world's worst headache in one minute flat. Uh, yeah, they, uh, they've done wonders for uh, Ms. Prudlow. Mrs. Prudlin. Uh, pay no attention to him, Kitty. He, he's all upset over that shooting. Well, I could name a few people who aren't upset over it. Oh, which people? Some of the girls at the Long Branch. He drops in about three times a year. Jezra Cobb at the Long Branch? 
Old self-righteous Jezra. And every time it means trouble, he always drinks too much and he bothers everybody. Bothers him how? By trying to reform him. And it's the girls who always get the worst of it. He... Now, who'd have thought it? He calls them painted Jezebels. Says he means to cure them of their transgressions. Of course, the only cure he seems to know is to grab a cane and beat the daylights out of any of them he can get his hands on. I didn't know Jezra was that bad. You ask some of the girls, Matt. Daisy or Billy Bell. Yeah, I will, Kitty. Uh, Doc, could I have some of those pills to take with me? Uh, look, uh, Kitty, Doc was just playing. They're real good, Doc. My headache's all gone. What'd you start to say, Matt? Uh, nothing, Kitty. <laughs> N- nothing. Forty-eight hours, Marshal, and you've accomplished nothing. I demand legal action. You haven't helped things any by lying to me, Jezra. Lying to you? You told me you never had an enemy in your life, but two or three young ladies over at the Long Branch disagree with you. <laughs> Dance hall girls. Maybe so. But I'd sure hate to have them looking at me over a set of gun sights. Abandoned. Painting their faces. Cavorting in public to the devil's music. And stay away if you don't like it before you got a bullet in your back. It wasn't a woman who fired them shots. A woman wouldn't have to fire them, Jezra. She could get a man to do it for her. Then why don't you jail them girls if they're plotting to kill me? I don't have any proof of anybody plotting anything. You're in league with the adversary, Marshal. You're aiding and abetting the forces of evil. Let me tell you something, Jezra. I'll aid and abet anybody's right to live his own life according to his own lights. As long as he's within the law. Mr. Dillon, I... Yeah, what is it? Could I see you a minute? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, what's the matter, Chester? Well, it's Miss Kitty. She wants you over to the Long Branch right away. Oh, what for? Well, it seems there's a fellow there that's been drinking real heavy, Mr. Dillon, uh, talking too much. Oh? A- and Miss Kitty heard him say he'd been offered $300 to kill old Jasper. <laughs> of old-fashioned ideas. Why don't you live modern? Live modern. Live, live, live modern. Free up. Freshen up your taste. Smoke an l and Today, all over the country, more people are changing to l and than to any other cigarette. And it's all because only l and gives you full, exciting flavor through the pure white miracle tip. L&M draws easier, tastes richer, smokes cleaner. So free up, freshen up your taste, live modern, change to L&M. Make today your big red letter day and start to live the modern way. Live, live, live modern. Smoke an L&M. It's America's fastest growing cigarette. Yes, sir. He's playing poker over here with a house dealer and a couple of cowboys. You been in here before? Yeah, just during the last week. He's a drifter, I guess. Goes by the name of Puggy Rado. There. That's him, Matt, on the far side of the table. Uh-huh. Yeah, he looks like a saddle bum. He was making out real braggy for a while. Fastest gun in Texas, that kind of talk. But I guess he knew he'd gone too far when he said that about Jezra Cobb. He shut up tight right after all right, Kitty, I'll try to get him away from that table. Wait a minute. I think he's coming over here. Yeah. Ready? 
Reckon you're the marshal, ain't you? That's right, yeah. I reckon she heard what I said, sent for you. That's just what I figured you would do. Hold it, hold it, Marshal. You make one move toward that gun, and I'll put a bullet right in her back. You got your hands off me. Take it easy, Kitty. You tell her, Marshal. Tell her me and her leaving now. If anybody lays a hand on a gun, there's going to be a pretty corpse on the floor. Told you to let go. Take him out. Drop that gun, Rado. Not a chance. Are you all right, Kitty? Yeah, I'm all right. Thanks, Matt. Well, I had to kill him now. There was no time for anything else. Marshal. Marshal. Uh, was, was that the man? Yeah, it looks that way, Jesser. He was claiming somebody had offered him $300 to kill you. Why, that, that's the fellow who... Who what, Jesser? Why, he stopped in at my place last week begging a handout. Uh, did, uh, did you say $300? No, that's right. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> well, I got to be getting on home, Marshal. Got stock to tend to. Got a lot of things to tend to. Well, forevermore, what come over him so sudden? I don't know, Chester. But I think I can guess. a real proud barn yonder to be with such a poor built house, ain't it? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, good evening, Miss Cobb. Uh, I do, Marshal. Chester. Miss Cobb. Did your husband got home yet, Miss Cobb? He's out there in the barn. Won't you come in and set a spell? Uh, yes, we will. Thank you. Matter of fact, Miss Cobb, uh, you're the one we rode out here to see. Ah, that's right, kind of you, Marshal. Now you two set you down there at the table. Just this minute, took a wild plum pie out of the oven. Well, uh, no, no, thank you, Miss Cobb. Well, I my... don't often get to feed callers. You ain't going to deprive me of the chance. Well, maybe we could just taste it a little dab, Mister Dillon. All right, Chester. I uh. <laughs> Always had the impression that uh, you were opposed to visitors, Miss Cobb. Oh, I love to have folks come. Jezra ain't never been one to encourage it. Oh, I see. The righteous must turn their faces from the world. For the world is the cradle of sin. That's what Jezra always said. There you are, piping hot. My gracious, that smells good. Well, eat hearty. There's plenty more. It'll just go to waste. Jezra's never cared too much for plum pie. Miss Cobb. How long have uh, you and Jezra been married? Twenty-seven years, Marshal. Twenty-seven years. Uh-huh. And over those years, Miss Cobb, how many times did he beat you? Hundreds of times. For my transgressions, he told me. He used to read me from the good book that a husband's got a right to do that. I, I ain't never learned to read myself. But last month, I asked Reverend Blouse, and he said there weren't nothing like that in the good book. Well, uh, maybe Jezra's got his own version. He lied to me. That's what he done. And if he'd lie about that, then 
Well, I reckon you know, don't you, Marshal? Yes, ma'am. About you offering money to that drifter who rode through here last week. That you hired him to kill Jezreel. Yes, ma'am, I guessed it. Yes, I did, too. Well, I figured he did the way he acted in town. He come home and told me about you having to shoot the man. Then he asked me for our savings. And I got it for him. He sat down here and counted it. And when he seen it was the same as that fella had been talking about, $300, then he knowed for sure. Uh, what did he say? Oh, nothing much. He just sat here a while, smiling at me kind of in that cold way of his. His glory smile, I always called it. And then he got up and went out to the barn. And, of course, I knowed what he was going for. What do you mean? He was aiming to fetch a hickory stave. He always keeps some out there to mend fences. I declare, Mr. Dillon, a man like that ought to be... Well... I think, ma'am, maybe I better go have a little talk with Jezra. Won't be no use, Marshal. Just won't be no use. I think it will, ma'am. Listen to me, Marshal. You're wasting your time. I'm trying to tell you. When he went to fetch that stave, I knowed what he was aiming to do. And I followed him out to the barn. Yes? I stood real close, Marshal, so I wouldn't miss. And I pulled the trigger four times. I put the gun there in the cupboard. I figured you'd be wanting it. Jezra ain't never gonna beat me no more. You sit right back down there and finish your pie. moment, our star, William Conrad. If your daily routine never varies, chances are you're heading for a great big case of monotony. Everybody needs a break once in a while, and sometimes a vacation just once or twice a year isn't enough. But a break once a week would more than fill the bill. What could you do with that leisure time? Here's the answer to that. You can vary your routine with a fascinating and vital pursuit. Spotting planes for America's Ground Observer Corps. It's exciting... It's interesting, and just two hours a week of your spare time is all that's needed to keep up the 24-hour schedule of the GOC. Men and women from teenage up can help the Air Corps cover the blind spots in our radar system by volunteering for the Ground Observer Corps, a civilian component of the Air Defense Command. You'll be trained and supervised by officers and airmen of the Air Defense Command to spot planes in your area. Find out from your local civilian defense office how you can be a civilian ground observer. This has been a public service message by CBS Radio. And now, William Conrad. You know, when a bad man riding a good horse came into Dodge looking for trouble, well, likely as not, he got a bullet hole placed in him. And the horse went to the man who did it. And that was the West. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The script was specially written for Gunsmoke by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Meston. The music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Ralph Moody, Don Diamond, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke.
Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. To put a smile in your smoking, always buy Chesterfield. Made the modern way with Accuray. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Is there something wrong, Chester? Oh, there's going to be a fight up there by the stage office. You better come, Mr. Dillon. All right, what's the trouble? They're around back of the stage. You can't see them from here. Oh, who is it? A couple of passengers. One's a great big man with red hair, about the biggest man i ever seen. Who's the other one? Well, I don't know, but he's kind of old and real thin and poor looking, like he'd been rode half to death. Oh, that red-headed fellow will ruin him, Mr. Dillon. The size of a man doesn't matter much to a six-gun, Chester. They ain't armed. Neither one of them's carrying no gun. Ah, then they won't get into much trouble. Oh, wait till you see him. That big one. He's got hands like shovels, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, I can see him now. Oh, look how he's slapping that poor little fellow. If he really hit him, he'd kill him. Oh, stand there. Get your hands up. How can I beat a man who won't fight him? All right, move back, everybody. Let me prove it. All right, hold it, mister. That's enough. What are you saying that's enough? He ain't by far enough. This man isn't even fighting you. I'm trying to make him fight, ain't I? Why should he fight? Because we come in on that stagecoach together. And he sat there the whole eight hours and stared at the floor. He never said a word. Like that drove me crazy. I think it did drive you crazy. He isn't going to hurt you anymore, mister. But you better get out of here. I don't care what he does. You fight him, mister. You break him up a little. I'll watch. Nobody's going to touch him. Are you scared of this old crow? I said to leave him alone. You said? You're talking to Sam Keeler, mister. I'm a bear cat. People do what I say. You're talking to a United States Marshal. A marshal? Well, now. How come you're not wearing a gun, Keeler? Man's got to wear a gun. Most men do. <laughs> my hands do my fighting. And you're big enough to whip most any man alive, aren't you? I sure am. But you go unarmed so nobody can use his gun against you. He'd be held up for murder if he did, wouldn't he? Well, you figured yourself a nice big advantage, Keeler. But you're a coward. What? You're a coward! And I'd still be a fool to go up against you barehanded. You don't dare use that gun. You said so yourself. There are lots of ways to use a gun, Keeler. Marshal, I'm going to knock your head into a peak. And then I'm going to knock the peak off. Right now. Oh. <laughs> He dropped like a pole axe deer. You killed a man because of me. I haven't killed him. But he's going to be kind of touchy when he comes to, and you better get out of sight. Men are always fighting, hating each other. Who are you, mister? 
My name is Seth Tandy, Marshal. Oh, Tandy, if you don't like men fighting, Dodge is no town for you. Chester. Yes, sir? Throw some water on Keeler, and if he wants more fight, tell him I'll be in my office. Okay, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. Gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. An Accuray Chesterfield draws more easily, lets you enjoy all the flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. You enjoy cooler smoking. No hot spots, no hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoke and just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. Keeler come too, all right, Mr. Dillon. You didn't hurt him so very bad. And I haven't been worrying about it, Chester. No, sir. But it's been two hours. It's after dark. He couldn't have been unconscious all this time. No, sir, he wasn't. Uh, see, I stopped off to the town soil. I got me my winter haircut. No. Oh, you should have seen Keeler when he come to. My goodness, he is mad. It wasn't getting buffaloed so much as everybody laughing at him. Seems like he just can't stand that. He looked like he was about to go wild. Well, there'll be more trouble from him. Yes, sir. It's like this friend of his that showed up after the fight, a fella called Humbert. He just couldn't believe it when he seen Keeler laying there. This Humbert, he said somebody would get killed for it, sure. Uh-huh. Uh, Chester, I'm going to go down to the Long Branch and have a drink. Oh, well, I'll walk part way with you. Okay. What happened to that Seth Tandy? I don't know. He left. But there's something wrong with him, Mr. Dillon. Did you notice the funny look on him? Well, he's got eyes like a blind horse. What kind of man is he? All I know is he's the kind that lets himself get knocked around and doesn't seem to care one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, you want a drink? Uh, no, sir, I thank you. Uh, I got business. Uh, but you tell Miss Kitty hello, huh? Yeah, sure. Evening, Matt. Oh, Kitty. Uh, is this glass yours? Oh, one of the girls brought it over, but she's busy now. That beer pitcher's yours, too. Yeah. Well, I'll leave some money with you and you can give it to her. Huh? All right. They say the Santa Fe's going to start laying track of west of here soon. Yeah. More railroad, more people, more trouble. Uh, I'm sorry, Kitty. I'm in a poor mood. Uh, hang up your gun, Matt. Yeah? And do what? I'm too lazy to work for a living. Uh, I suppose keeping the peace around here isn't work. And then there's getting shot. Uh, it's been a long time since anybody put a bullet in me, Kitty. Just because you're learning to duck. <laughs> you know, up in Canada, they got a bird called a loon. And they claim that these loons really can duck a bullet. Why don't you go up there and study them a while? See how they do it. Yeah, might be a good idea. Yeah. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. Oh, hello, Miss Kitty. What's the trouble, Chester? That fellow Tandy, Seth Tandy. What about him? Well, some fellows seen him stumble out of an alley just now. They took him up to docks. What? He was all beat up. Oh, somebody had really worked on him. Who? Well, I don't know. Nobody's seen it happen. All right, let's get up to docks, Chester. We'll see you later, Kitty. Sure, man. Come in. 
Oh, hello, Matt. Chester. Well, now, how's Tandy, Doc? Well, there's nothing broken that I can find, but he's sure colored up. He's sitting in the back room there, if you want to see him. Mm-hmm. How'd he say who did it? Oh, he hasn't said a word about anything so far. Maybe you can get him to talk. All right. <clears throat> Let's stand back, Chester. Well, okay, Doc. Well, how do you feel, Tandy? Uh, Tandy, I want to know who did this. I'm sure it was Sam Keeler, but I want to hear it from you. No, Marshal. There's been enough violence. The next time he might kill you, Tandy. It doesn't matter. What? It's not important. Not no more. What's your trouble, Tandy? Maybe I can help you. Nobody can help me, Marshal. When a man loses faith in his God, he loses everything. I've lost my faith. I no longer believe. I, uh... You're a preacher? I was a preacher. Thirty years. Now, what'd you come to Dodge for? Oh, no reason except to get away from people that knew me before. I didn't want them to see me. Maybe start them doubting, too. I've got nothing left, Marshal. It doesn't matter what happens to me now. Now, uh, uh, Doc. I heard him. Well, tell him something. I don't know what to tell him. He's a preacher who doesn't believe in God anymore. Oh, Matt, I'm an ignorant frontier doctor. Sure, I can dig bullets out of people. I can sew them up, too. I can shove their bones back into place, but... Nobody ever taught me how to patch up a preacher who's lost his religion. Don't trouble yourselves about me, gentlemen. I'll be moving on. No. Not tonight, you won't. Now, you can do what you want tomorrow, but tonight either you or Sam Keeler's going to sleep in jail. Jail? I'm not going to let Keeler catch you again tonight. And if you won't say it was him, I can't arrest him. Oh. Well, did he do it? Marshal, I'll sleep in your jail. Maybe Seth Tandy didn't care what happened to himself, but he sure went out of his way to keep other people from having any trouble. If I'd have put Sam Keeler in jail that night, that'd have been quite a battle. And Tandy knew it. So we took him downstairs. And after we found him something to eat, we gave him a blanket and locked him in a cell where he'd be safe. Chester slept in the office with a shotgun by his bed. And after looking the town over for a couple of hours, I went to my room. It was just after daylight when I was awakened. Dylan! What? Wake up, Mr. Dylan! What? Mr. Dylan! Oh, Chester, stop the racket and come on in. The door's unlocked. What time is it, Chester? What are you doing here? It's Seth Tandy. He's gone, Mr. Dillon. What? Yes, sir. I went out to get us some breakfast, and he didn't feel like going, so I unlocked his cell and left him sitting there in the office, and when I got back, he was gone. Here, I found this note stuck on the door. Marshal, if you want to see Seth Tandy alive, come to Turkey Bend at noon, alone and unarmed. It ain't signed. No, it doesn't have to be. Sam Keeler, hmm? Yeah. What are you going to do? Do what it says, I guess. But you can't go up there alone, not wearing no gun, Mr. Dillon. He'll kill you. That Sam Keeler could kill anybody. And if I doubt what'll happen to Tandy. He don't care what happens to him. He said so himself. You'd be risking your life for a man who don't even care about living. Chester, go to the stable and get my horse while I'm dressing, will you? Then you're going to do it? And take the rifle boot off my saddle. I won't be needing it this time. Stop! Start 
Smoking with a smile with Chesterfield. Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfield's made with Accuray are A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. Gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. An Accuray Chesterfield draws more easily, lets you enjoy all the flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. You enjoy cooler smoking. No hot spots, no hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoke and just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. Maybe Chester was right. Maybe it didn't make sense. But still, I had to do it. It was about 20 miles upriver to Turkey Bend, and I got there about noon. I waited around for a while, and then Keeler's friend Humbert rode up. He was unarmed, too. He didn't say anything. He just looked me over carefully before he motioned me to ride upstream ahead of him. About a half hour later, we reached their camp. Keeler was there and Seth Tandy, sitting on a small pile of cottonwood logs, staring blankly at the fire. We got on and went up to him. He was there at noon, Keeler, real prompt. Marshal does things right, don't you, Marshal? Yeah, sometimes. Well, you done this right, you come alone and you ain't armed. You done your part... And I done mine, there's your friend Tandy. And he's still alive. What do you want, Keeler? I'll tell you, Marshal. You, you had everybody laughing at me back in Dodge. I don't like that. I can't stand people laughing at me. What's that got to do with Seth Tandy? Started over him, and it's going to finish over him. What do you mean? I'm going to beat him to death, Marshal. And you're going to stand there and watch me do it. Now, wait a minute. And, and when there's nothing left of him, I'm going to go to work on you. No. You shut up, Tandy. I don't care what happens to me, but the Marshal came risking his life. He did for sure, Tandy. Wait a minute, Keeler. Now, what do you want, Humbert? You told me you were going to have a little fun. You didn't say nothing about killing people. Why? I don't like this. I, I don't want no part of it. What's the matter with you, Humbert? I, I don't hold with killing people. I, I don't want to end up on a rope. You don't like it, huh? Now, don't you start nothing with me. Now, you leave me alone. I'll learn you to go against me. No! You are the Lord. You I didn't mean nothing. Get out of my way, Tandy. I want one of those logs. Put your head on me. Killer. I'll ruin you. Killer. Killer. Framed him, Marshal. You just saved my life on that log. Yeah. Your life and Tandy's and probably mine. I got a gun over here in my blanket, Marshal. I'll give it to you before it comes to. Okay. Marshal. Yeah, what, Tandy? You came here knowing you might be killed. Well, there's always a chance of that. But you came. Willing to sacrifice your life to save mine. And knowing mine's worthless. You listen to me. No man's life is worthless, Tandy. 
Whether he thinks so or not. I can see that now. Well, are you riding on from here? Oh, no. No, Marshal. I'm going back. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I praise the Lord. With our star, William Conrad. Put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as A, B, C. Because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder. Smoke much milder. Burn evenly. B, better tasting. Draw more easily. You enjoy more flavor. C, cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. No hot spots. No hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Remember, an Accuray Chesterfield is always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. You know, on the frontier, a man was hanged if he stole a horse. But our story next week's about a man who stole thousands, and he went free. Well, until then, good night. <laughs> Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Joe Cranston, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. This is it. L and M. Superior taste and filter. Superior taste from richer tobaccos. Tastier, light and mild. Superior filter. It's white, pure white. Added to L&M tobaccos, this miracle tip actually improves your enjoyment. Look for the big red letters. Smoke L&M, America's best. L&M's got everything. Get L&M today. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. Smoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. To put a smile in your smoking, always buy Chesterfield. Made the modern way with Accuray. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, 
There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. Transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job. And it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. <laughs> Good boy. Now hold it. No need drawing down on me, boy. I'm just a harmless traveler like yourself. How in blazes did you sneak up on me so quiet? Now, that ain't a friendly way to greet a guest. I'll be friendly to anybody who comes into my camp with fair warning and guns holstered. The bacon's burning. Well, you keep your hands where I can see them. Are you going to turn away a hungry traveler? If you're traveling, where's your outfit? Where's your horse? Over in the next gully there. You alone? You don't see nobody else. You ain't the type to ride the plains alone. You calling me a liar, son? Your bacon is getting cold. All right. Here. Bread's right there. Use your own knife. Thank you kindly. Oh, if I ain't the type to ride alone... What type am I? You look like a storekeeper or a gambler, maybe, traveling by request. <laughs> you don't feel to say what you think, eh, boy? Ah, say, now, this looks right good. Mm -hmm. Dip in the pan grease if you want. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Ray, that's some bay horse you got hobbled out there. You wouldn't consider selling. No. Mm hmm. Didn't think so. Only. Looks like he might be coming down with some kind of hoof trouble. Huh? Hmm. The way he holds his off rear. What do you mean? Yeah. Why, you're crazy. I don't see nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Let that be a lesson, boy. Don't never trust the stranger. <laughs> With a smile, with Chesterfield. Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. Gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. An accurate Chesterfield draws more easily, lets you enjoy all the flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without accurate. You enjoy cooler smoking. No hot spots, no hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. Marshal, Marshal Dillon, 
Oh, hello, Moss. Just about to send word up to your office. Oh, what about? Dutch George isn't Tom. It's his horse right there at the bay. Left it with me. Wants new shoes all around. Where is he now, Moss? Up to the Long Branch, most likely. Thought you ought to know. Is he still one? No, that jury in Ellsworth acquitted him. He's free. Blamed if I can understand him. Everybody in the state knows he's the biggest horse thief west of the Mississippi. Well, with operations as big as Dutch's, it's hard to prove. That's a good-looking horse he's got there. It sure is. Wonder who it really belongs to. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Well, thanks, Moss. You're here. Look at him, all clustered around like he was a governor or something. Yeah. Some poor man steals one horse, they string him to a tree. He steals a thousand to make him a hero. Well, he'll get caught too sooner or later, Kitty. I'll be back in a minute. Hello, Dutch. Hello, Matt. Have a drink? Just for old time's sake? All right, I'll drink to that. Pour it, Sam. Right, to old time. Ah, yeah, old times were all right, weren't they, man? Now yeah, what I can remember of them, yeah, yeah. It was a long time ago. You were just a kid. <laughs> Some kid. Always pestering me with questions. Bound to learn every trick I knew. Be just like me. Yeah. Oh, well, let that be a lesson to you. It was, Dutch. Well, then I did you a favor. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. But you know, my job kind of puts us on opposite sides of the street now, Dutch. Oh, I don't see why. I've got no trouble with the law. I'm a legitimate businessman. I hope so, Dutch, because if your business gets illegitimate around here, I'll come after you. In spite of old times... Yeah, I expect you would, and you would be a rough enemy, too. Have another drink? No, no, thanks. Matt, I didn't know you knew Dutch George. Well, it was a long time ago, Kitty. I only knew him for a few months until the sheriff caught up with him. Oh, that must have been a shock for you. Well, like he said, it was a good lesson. You know, the funny part of it is, Kitty, he's not really a bad man at all. Huh? He learned to be a horse thief back in the days when it was a game every frontiersman played with the Indians. Yeah, he just never gave it up. Well, I just hope when he does get caught, it doesn't have to be you, does it? Yeah. I hope not too, Kitty. <laughs> Come in. Howdy, Marshal. Uh, what can I do for you, son? My name's Jimmy McQueen. I got robbed. Oh, where was this? East of Dodge, maybe 20 miles. Night before last. I was just cooking my grub when this stranger comes up real quiet. It seemed harmless, but he slugged me when I wasn't looking. What'd he look like? Tall, maybe six feet. Strong looking. With a gray mustache and a... Arrow scar by the temple. Uh huh. What'd you lose, son? Thirty dollars, but that's not important. My horse is. He was a good one, Marshal, and I aim to find him and get him back. A bay with a white blaze on his forehead. That's right. You seen him? Let's go down to Moss Grimmick's stable. Your horse may still be there. <laughs> He come and took the horse right after I finished shooting him. I heard he left town afore dark last night. And we'll go after him. Now, now look, Marshal, you don't need to bother. You just loan me a horse and I'll find him. You know the man you're after, Jimmy? Don't matter none to me. It's Dutch George. Well, I still got to get my horse back. You leave that to me. I'll take you along to identify the horse, but that's all, you understand? I don't know why you're so particular, Marshal. The man's only a horse thief. But a very particular horse thief. 
And for the first time, we might have some real evidence against him. I don't want you ruining it. All right, Marshal, whatever you say. Ah, uh, Moss, give me Chester's horse, too. We'll pick him up on the way. Now, let's pull up here a second. Yeah, here's where he met his men with the herd. You see the ground's all trampled? Yeah, there must be a couple hundred head. Yeah, maybe more. I guess I don't rightly understand this Dutch George's way of horse thieving. He steals by the herd, Jimmy, from ranches or Indians. Well, where does he take them to? West, over into the line into Colorado. There he meets another bunch of his men driving a herd stolen from Colorado territory. And they exchange the horses, sell Colorado horses in Kansas, Kansas horses in Colorado. This fellow may be smarter than I thought. And tougher, too. Well, I think maybe we better camp here tonight. They're at least two hours ahead of us. That'd put them over on Crooked Creek, probably at the Forks. Why don't we go on? Come up on them in the dark. Now, we can do the same thing by starting early, a couple of hours before dawn. And our horses need the rest. Not to mention me. I'm sure we'll be happy to get down. You notice all the Cheyenne trail sign, Marshal? Well, some. Some? I've been seeing it all day. This territory's thick with Cheyenne. They must be camped close, too. How do you know so much about Cheyenne, son? Well, I was raised with him, Marshal. My pa worked at the Cheyenne Agency at Darlington. Maybe I underestimated you, Jimmy. Maybe you're not as green as you look. I told you I could handle this myself, Marshal, but you wouldn't listen. That's yeah, just as well. If you'll take care of the horses, Chester and I'll rustle up some wood for a fire. Sure, Marshal. There's a likely snag, Mr. Dillon, right over there. Okay, Chester, let's go see if we can carry it. Good and dry, it'll be... Mr. Dillon! What? Why, that little whipper's now... He, he's riding on. Yeah, I sure did underestimate him. What do you expect he's up to? He's probably headed for Crooked Creek, wants to face Dutch George alone. Then he's going to get hurt. Well, come on, we'll try to catch him before it's too late. <laughs> Sir Camp, Chester. On the edge of the bluff there. Yeah, but where's the horses? Yeah, down on the creek bottom, out of sight, probably. I count four men, three asleep and one on guard. Reckon that's all. Well, except for those riding night guard on the herd, yeah. I don't see the kid no horse. No. Maybe he's around somewhere in the dark. What are we gonna do? Um... You stay here. Now, when I get up by that big tree there, you make some noise, but just enough to draw the guard out, okay? All right. All right. Who's that? Drop it. Drop it, I said. All right, Chester. Hack. Is that you? Hack. It's me, Dutch. Matt Dillon. I got your man with my gun on his back, and I'm coming in. Now you throw all your guns on the ground beside the fire. Do you hear me? I hear you, Matt. All right, Chester, let's go. You too, Hack. All right, everybody, rest easy. Well, Matt, you got more nerve than I thought. Where's the kid, Dutch? What kid? The boy you stole the bay horse from. Well, I left him for all I know. You haven't seen him tonight? Around here? Is he on the trail, too? He's probably out there in the dark right now, drawing a bead on you. You sure you didn't plan it this way, Matt? It could save you a lot of trouble. You'll stand trial, Dutch, if I have my way. Matt, I don't want to see you get hurt. But I don't want to go to jail, either. Well, you'll have to decide that, Dutch. What about old times' sake? 
I decided about old times before I became a lawman. I see. Mr. Dillon, there's something going on down there in the creek bottom. There's a stampede. Somebody's stampeding the horses. Matt, is this some of your doing? Use your head. Why would I want to stampede them? I need them for evidence. We've got to do something. Stay still. You go down that bluff and you'll be trampled to death. Up here, maybe we're safe. Smile with Chesterfield. Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. Gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. An accurate Chesterfield draws more easily, lets you enjoy all the flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without accurate. You enjoy cooler smoking. No hot spots, no hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoke and just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. to death just like the other one. Well, Dutch, your night herders are dead. Your horses are gone. Looks like the Indians have put you out of business this trip. Yeah. <laughs> but you haven't got any evidence against me now. Even if you do find them horses, it'll be the Indians. Not Dutch George has them. Maybe you can arrest them. You know something, Dutch? In a way, I'm glad... I'd rather it was somebody else finally put you behind bars. Nobody's going to do that. Yes, Matt. they will, Dutch, sooner or later. Unless I can talk you out of this business. Now, Matt, what else would I ever do? Well, I don't know. Well, you got a long walk ahead of you. Oh, don't worry about us. We will find some horses somewhere else. I suppose you will. Well, come on, we'll bury these men. And then Chester and I'll head back to Dodge. Well, Mr. Dillon, Dodge looks just the same. You didn't expect it to change much in three days, did you, Chester? Oh, no. What I mean is it looks good. Chester, hmm? look up ahead there, in front of the office. Well, for it. that's Jimmy McQueen's bay horse. Yeah. Howdy, Marshal. Hello, Jimmy. I just brought your horse back, Marshal. There at the hitch rail. Much obliged. You're welcome. Well... Is that all you've got to say, Jimmy? Where in the world did you go to? Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. But I kind of had an idea I didn't think you'd cotton to, so I just left. Well, I guess your idea paid off. You got your horse back. Yeah. Funny thing, I found him running loose out on the prairie. Pretty lucky, I guess. Ah, uh, Jimmy. What, Marshal? I know you and your Cheyenne friends ran off those horses. And two men died. A man gets trampled in a stampede, that's an accident, ain't it, Marshal? Especially if he stole the horses to start with. Yeah, I guess it is an accident, Jimmy. Well, 
So long, Marshal. Mr. Dillon, that boy is sure tricky. I know it, Chester. Yeah, let it be a lesson to us. How? Never trust a stranger. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. Put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC, because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder. Smoke much milder. Burn evenly. B, better tasting. Draw more easily. You enjoy more flavor. C, cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. No hot spots. No hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Remember, an Accuray Chesterfield is always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. You know, a frontier peace officer was always ready to face someone who wanted to kill him. But on our next gun smoke, a marshal faces someone who wants to be killed. Well, until then, good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The special music for Gunsmoke was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Town patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were John Daner, Vic Perrin, and Jim Nusser. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day, change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. This is it, L and M. Superior taste and filter. Superior taste from richer tobaccos, tastier, light and mild. Superior filter. It's white, pure white. Added to L&M tobaccos, this miracle tip actually improves your enjoyment. Look for the big red letters. Smoke L&M, America's best. L&M's got everything. Get L&M today. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. To put a smile in your smoking, always buy Chesterfield. Made the modern way with Accuray. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, 
There's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. scared me. Oh, you were concentrating mighty hard on something in that window. <laughs> Mr. Jonas has some new lady shoes on display. You see them? Oh, yeah. Those narrow, square-toed ones, Matt. Which pair do you like best, the lace or the button? Well, tell me. <laughs> well, I don't know, Kitty. They're both fine. Well, you got to decide one or the other, Oh, Matt. no, I don't have to decide either. I'm not in the market for ladies' shoes. Huh. Well, neither am I. <laughs> what? Look at those prices. Two dollars and sixty-five cents for a pair of shoes? Did you ever hear such a thing? Kitty, I only stopped to say hello, not to <laughs> argue about ladies' shoes. Well, I still think somebody ought to complain to Mr. Jonas. Well, it's not my job. I got enough trouble as it is. Well, I'm going in and tell Mr. Jonas what I think of his prices. <laughs> Have a good time, Kitty. You bet I will. Ah, oh, hello, Chester. Uh, Mr. Dillon, uh, this here is Mr. Trumbull. Uh -huh. He come over to the office looking for you. How do you do? Marshal Dillon, you're a stranger here, Mr. Trumbull? First time in Dodge, Marshal. First time. Oh, well, what do you want to see me about? I want a badge, Marshal. I want you to make me a deputy. A deputy? Now, you look here, Mr. Dillon. Never mind, Dillon. Chester. Good. What do you want to be a deputy for, Mr. Trumbull? Well, I'm leading a party of immigrants up onto the south fork of the Pawnee. Oh, uh -huh. I thought you were new to this part of the country. Well, I've got maps, Marshal. Good maps. Furnished me by the Santa Fe Railroad. You work for the railroad? No, sir. I work for these immigrants. It's like this, Marshal. I got some ten families together, and I arranged to buy five sections of railroad land for them, about 30 miles northeast of here. I made all the legal arrangements, and I'm guiding them in. I see. Uh, what's that got to do with your wanting to be deputized? Well, I thought it might be a good idea just to... In case there's any squabbling when we get there. You know, over who gets which land, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. And uh, most parties draw straws before they ever see the land, Mr. Trumbull. Haven't yours? Well, yes. Sure, of course. Well, then why should there be any trouble? Well, <laughs> one of the men's having a little wife trouble, Marshal. You know how it is. Well, maybe I better ride out with you. No, oh, no, that won't be necessary. Everything will probably work out fine. Yeah, sure. Uh, where are these pilgrims of yours? Well, we're in camp down by the Arkansas. We're pulling out in the morning. Well, I thank you anyway, Marshal. Goodbye, Chester. Goodbye. Well, that man sure has got a lot of gall. Yeah, he's some confused, Chester. How do you mean? He can't seem to decide if there's going to be any trouble or not. Yeah, maybe we can find out for him. Come on. This year, this easy way Give Chesterfields this year So bright and gay Wrapped and ready They're the best to buy Cartons of Chesterfields They satisfy This Christmas Give everyone Chesterfields Chesterfields are easy to give Because they come ready to give 
in a bright red special holiday carton that's wrapped in its own colorful Christmas ribbon. Everyone enjoys Chesterfield's smoother, cooler smoking pleasure. So to all your friends this year, say Merry Christmas with cartons of Chesterfields. No wrapping, no tying. They're easy to give because they come ready to give. Chesterfields in the bright red special holiday carton. Wrapped and ready, they're the best to buy. Cartons of Chesterfields, they satisfy. Chester and I saddled up and rode down to the Arkansas. It was easy to find the immigrant camp. A dozen wagons were scattered through the cottonwoods, and there were campfires everywhere. But the people themselves were all gathered together in a big circle. We rode up to them, but nobody paid any attention to us. And then I saw why. In the middle of the circle stood two men and a woman. The men were bare to the waist and each was pressing his left forearm against the others, while the woman was binding their arms tightly together with a stout piece of cloth. In their right hands, the men held boy knives. What in the world are they up to, Mr. Dillon? Now, that's a way of fighting, Chester, tied together like that. One of them has to die, maybe both of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you stay here with the horses. All right, sir. Will you stand aside, please? Let me through here. You make that knot tight, Sidney. Do you have to go through with this? No man messes around with my wife. He didn't mean nothing by it. We was talking, that's all. Now get out of the way, Sidney. You ready, Keppert? You're a fool, Calhoun. But I'm ready. All right, hold it, you men. Stay out of this, mister. I'm a lawman, Calhoun. I don't like this kind of fighting. Now drop those knives. Both of you. I mean it. Here's mine, Marshal. Now, right now, yours, Calhoun. Well, can't fight none of our men. All right, you, Sidna. Take one of those knives and cut them loose. All right. Next time, I'll shoot you on sight, Keppert. I told you you're a fool, Calhoun. For keeping you away from my wife? Why don't you find one of your own? Wait a minute, Calhoun. I don't want any shooting. Now, I'm warning you, 30 miles isn't far from Dodge, and I'll come take you both back to jail if I hear any more about this. Now, you get back to your own wagons. All of you get back to your wagons. The party's over. Chester! Chester! Yeah, now where did he go to? Chester! Yes, sir, I'm coming, Mr. Dillon. Now, where have you been? No worries. No worries, huh? Well, I was only talking to a fellow over there. Huh? Now, that's Trumbull. Yes, sir. Now, what were you talking to him about? Nothing. I was just finishing a little talk we started the other day. It wasn't nothing important. No. Now, uh, you hiding something, Chester? Why, what would I be hiding? <laughs> I don't know. But I guess you'll tell me when you want to. Yes, sir. All right, let's get back to Dodge. <laughs> Chester. Yes, sir. If you have to pace the room like that, will you take your boots off? I'll sit down. You know, two days of this is about all I can stand. Yes, sir. Oh, hello, Matt. Chester. Hello, Doc. Ah, uh, Doc, I think I got a patient for you. Oh, well, now, you don't look sick to me. <laughs> no, but I'm going to be if you don't find some way to calm Chester down. He hasn't been able to sit still for two days. Yes, well... Well, now, what's the trouble, Chester? Nothing, Doc. I feel fine. 
Well, then why can't you sit still? It's sick people who have to sit still, not well ones. Hey, well, that depends on what you're sick with. I <laughs> ain't sick with nothing, I tell you. You know, Doc, I think he's got a wormy brain. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, forevermore. All right. I'm trying to settle my mind up about something. Now, are you satisfied? Are you? No. I ain't got the money. I don't know where to get it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, money for what? For to pay Trumbull with. Now, do you owe Trumbull money, Chester? No, sir. Not yet. No, not yet. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. But you both got to promise not to tell nobody else about it. <laughs> Trumbull says if anybody heard, I'd probably get beat out. But you'd get beat out of what, Chester? Land. Free If land. it's free, what do you need money for? For Trumbull to fix it up for me. Look, if, if I give him $50 for his trouble, he's got a way to arrange for the railroad to give me a half section of land. He showed it to me on his map the other day. I showed what to you? Yeah. Where my half section would be. <laughs> gracious. I'll show you the country. Ah, that's good. Now, the south fork of the Pawnee line is like this yeah. on here. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it is. And, and these immigrants is about five sections laying right next to each other. Right about Wait here. a minute, Chester. Did you say right next to each other? Yes, yeah, sir. That's what Trumbull said. Now, my half section lays on the end here. Chester, and come on. Come on. Ain't you interested in this? Yeah. Interested enough to ride out there. And don't worry about your $50. You're not going to need it. It was just after sunset when we hit the South Fork of the Pawnee... And a half hour later, we spotted the first immigrant wagon. A man was working nearby, trying to shape the foundation for a cabin from some red cedar he snaked up from the river. We got down and walked over to him. It was Keppert, the man Calhoun was about to fight for chasing his wife. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Keppert. Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. Glad to know you. Well, what are you doing out here, Marshal? There ain't been no trouble. Yeah, Keppert, I'm afraid there has been. What do you mean? Hey, look yonder. That fellow coming short is in a hurry, ain't he? That's Calhoun. He's got a rifle. I better get mine. Oh, no, you stand where you are, Keppert. He might shoot me. You saw what he was like. He'll have to shoot me first. Keppert! Well, now what's the trouble, Calhoun? I'm looking for my wife, Sidney. If she was here, you'd see her, wouldn't you? Maybe she's down by the river. You can look there, too, if you want. What's the marshal doing here? He was about to tell me. And then he can tell me, too. I came here to tell all of you, but I want to ask you something first. What? Do any of you have bills of sale from the railroad for this land you're on? Uh, no. No, not yet, Marshal. Trumbull just gave us a receipt and said the railroad would send us a bill of sale. Uh-huh. But you've already paid. Sure. Each man gave Trumbull $400 for a half section. And 25 on top of that for his services. That's right. What are you asking for, Marshal? I understand these sections lie right next to each other. Huh? They do for a fact. What's wrong with that? Well, I guess you don't know it, but when the government granted land to the railroad, it only granted alternate sections. Every other one. So the railroad couldn't sell sections lying right next to each other, could it? No. No, it couldn't. Yeah. Maybe that's why Trumbull hasn't given you any bills of sale. There aren't any. Why, he robbed us. Where is he now? I don't know. I ain't seen him since last night. Well, then I think we better start looking for him. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, what is it, Kepard? I got something to say. It's mostly to Calhoun. Oh, you two can settle your problems later. No, Marshal, we got to settle them right now. You'll see why. Now, listen to me, Calhoun. I ain't a man for much talking, uh, especially about women. But the way things are, I gotta say it. Say what? Your wife, Sidney. I never went near her. Never once. Now, that's a lie. No. No, it's the truth. I hate to tell you this, Calhoun, but it was her that come after me. What? I told her not to. I told her to stay away. I even said I'd show her up what she is if I had to, but I didn't do it. Not till now, I didn't. What are you saying? When did you see her last, Calhoun? At noon, when I come in for my dinner. Yeah. I saw her about two o'clock. Where? I was downriver about a mile, sitting quiet in a clump of elder, taking a little rest. 
Your wife rode by on the other bank. She was headed in the direction of Dodge. She was with a man. With a man? What man? Trumbull. With a smile, with Chesterfield. Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. Gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. An accurate Chesterfield draws more easily, lets you enjoy all the flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without accurate. You enjoy cooler smoking. No hot spots, no hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. Train's still there, Mr. Dillon. Way past midnight, it ought to be leaving any minute. Now run up and tell the engineer to hold it, will you, Chester? All right, sir. Marshal. Yeah. Look, coming out of the depot. It's Trumbull and my wife. Yeah. They don't see us. They ain't even looking this way. You let me take him, Marshal. No. He's rightfully no, mine. No, Calhoun. You might get excited and shoot him before he draws. I'll handle this. Now you two stay back out of the light. Hey, Trumbull. Marshal. Evening, ma'am. What do you want, Marshal? I want to talk to you. you. Don't have time. That train's about to leave. It's not going to leave. Anyway, you're not taking it. Oh. You're interfering because of Sydney here. Well, she's going with me, Marshal, and that's no business of yours. I'm arresting you for robbery, Trumbull. What? Give me your gun. No. I said give it to me. You know the way, Sidna. You killed him. You killed him. Jim! Is he dead, Marshal? Yeah. Shepard, see if he's got the money on him, huh? I sure will, Marshal. I, I, I didn't mean nothing, Jim. He, he he made me go with him. It was it wasn't my fault. You believe me, don't you, Jim? I don't even want to talk to you. But it's true. I found it. Here it is, Marshal. Yeah. Should be over four thousand dollars there. Good. We'll count it later and give it back to everybody. Marshal. Yeah, what, Calhoun? I'd like mine now. No, all right. Here. $425. Thanks. Sidna, take this money. What for? Take it. But why? That's all the money I got in the world. I don't figure I owe you nothing now. What are you saying, Jim? You know what I'm saying. Yeah, sure. I know. So long, Jim. Goodbye. Calhoun. What, Gibby? I got some money coming back. I'll lend you half of it. After all I done to you. Well, can't blame you much for that. I've been a fool, Keppert. You was right. No, that's over and done. But I can't take your money. 
That wouldn't be right now, would it, Marshal? Ah, you can decide about that tomorrow, Calhoun. We'll ride out and bring those other people back into Dodge. What for? So they can file for government land at the land office here. Free land. Should have done that in the first place. You know, I know of a fine section north of here that uh, I'd kind of like to file on myself. Why don't you? Well, one man couldn't handle it. It'd take two men to prove it up, you know. Two good men. Uh, I might show it to you sometime if uh, you're interested. In a moment, our star... William Conrad. Remember, friends, this Christmas, give everyone Chesterfields. Chesterfields are easy to give because they come ready to give in a bright red special holiday carton that's wrapped in its own colorful Christmas ribbon. Everyone enjoys Chesterfields' smoother, cooler smoking pleasure. So to all your friends, this year say Merry Christmas with cartons of Chesterfields. No wrapping, no tying. They're easy to give because they come ready to give. Chesterfields, in the bright red special holiday carton. You know, there are a lot of ways for a man to die on the frontier. But on our next gun smoke, a man dies the worst way of all. Needlessly. But that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Vivi Janis, Vic Perrin, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make Christmas their red letter day, their L&M red letter day. Give them the Christmas cards and full of America's best. Yes, give L&M's on Christmas Day to friends who smoke the builder way. L&M's got everything, the gift for Christmas Day. This is it. For Christmas, L&M filters and the handsome Christmas carton. No fuss with ribbons or paper. It's all wrapped and ready to give. This Christmas, give L&M Christmas cartons. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. 
Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> What's your hurry, Chester? Oh, hello, Mr. Dillon. Uh, I'm going over to the stable. No, what for? You leaving town? No, sir. Uh, Hank Young's over there. I got to see him. Well, I'm not doing anything. I'll go with you if you don't mind. Well, good. I run into Mr. Bowers, and he asked me to give Hank a message for him. No. Well, Hank is a real nice fellow, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> well, I didn't say he wasn't, Chester. Yes, sir, I know. But I was just thinking there ain't many fellows around here steady and peaceable as he is. I guess that's one reason Bars has kept him working at the ranch for so long. Mm-hmm. There he is. What? Cinching up his saddle with his back to us there. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mr. Jones, I'm going to surprise him. Walk easy, huh? Gotcha! Oh, no, 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 Hank, no! Look out, Chester! Oh. Not take it easy, oh. Hank. Oh, Marshal. I didn't know who it was. You shouldn't come up on me like that, Chester. Merciful goodness, I guess I shouldn't. Now, where'd my gun... Oh, there's my gun. It's a wonder it didn't go off, you hitting at me that way, Marshal. How come you're wearing a gun, Hank? I don't think I ever saw you with one. I've wore guns before, Marshal. No, I I meant around here. No, maybe not around here. Uh, Hank? Uh, Hank, Mr. Bower's going to be an hour or so longer than he thought. He is, huh? Uh Uh-huh. All right, you tell him I'll see him out the ranch. We've got work to do out there. So long. So long. So long, Hank. My. I guess I really upset him. Uh, something sure has. Hank ain't never acted like that before. We we're always kindly teasing each other. Well, I wouldn't worry Marshall, about it. No. Dylan? Yeah. yeah. I want to talk to you, Marshal. Well, go ahead. My name's Quillen. Ben Quillen. I've only been here a few days. I've been meaning to get acquainted, but uh, I thought I'd do a little scouting around for myself first. No. Uh, what's the name of that man you were just talking to, Marshal? Well, why? Oh, he kind of fits the description of the fella I've been hunting. You see, I'm a deputy sheriff. No. There's my badge. Deputy Sheriff, Prescott, Arizona. Huh? Yeah, I got papers to prove it, too. Hey, you've come a long way, Colin. I think it's going to be worth it, Marshal. Here. Take a look at this. What is it? It's a warrant for Ike Abbott. Prescott, Arizona, July 6, 18. Something. That's kind of smudge. You read the description. Hmm. Knowing Ike Abbott sound like your friend who just left? Sure does to me. Same height, same build. Same kind of face, brown hair and eyes. Just about everything. Is that true, Mr. Dillon? Oh, well, it uh, fits generally, yeah. But what's he wanted for? It's a warrant for his arrest, Justin. He's charged with murder. Hank? We well, heard he was hiding out around Dodge somewhere. He's been here about three years, hasn't he? Yeah, just about. Why didn't you make your arrest a few minutes ago, Colin? I wanted to be sure, Marshal. 
And I also want to talk to you first. After all, this is your territory. Hank's wearing a gun, Quillen. Does he know you? No. But I've been asking around about anybody from Arizona. He must have heard about it. Well, I guess I'll ride out and take him. No. What? Hank Young's ready to fight. I don't want to kill him. I'll go. You mean you'll bring him in for me? Well, if I'm sure he's the man you're after, then I think I can find out. Okay. Well, watch your step, Marshal. He's already killed one man. Don't worry, Quillen. So have I. Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. Sitting in the bunkhouse door, Mr. Dillon. I thought he said he had work to do. He had nothing special to do except get out of Dodge. You think he's going to make trouble? Well, I hope not. Hello, Hank. Marshal. Chester. Oh, Hank. Looking for me. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to ask you, Hank. You go right ahead, Marshal. You've known me about three years, right? About that. And you know, when I go after a man, I generally bring him back. So you do, Marshal. Is that why you put your gun away? Well, I declare, he ain't armed no more, is he? No, I ain't. Well, you tell me the truth, Hank. You always dealt fair, Marshal. I'll tell you the truth. Well, there's a deputy sheriff in town named Ben Quillen. He's got an Arizona warrant for Ike Abbott's arrest. I thought so. Was it murder, Hank? That how that warrant reads, Marshal? Mm-hmm. Figured so. What else you want to know? You still haven't told me why you put your gun away. Done some thinking on the way back here. You know they'd sent somebody after me, but if I killed him, I'd just have to face you next. I wouldn't be getting nowhere that way. All right, Hank. Come on, Chester. Let's get back to town. Well, Mr. Dillon, are we going to take Hank back to the I garden? said let's go, Chester. Chester. Good morning, Mr. Dillon. Ben Quillen been here yet? Oh, I just got here myself. Oh, didn't you sleep here last night? Well, see... No, sir, I didn't. Oh? Uh -huh. I ain't never going to set up all night playing poker again. Oh. Uh, I was kind of hoping you'd maybe outgrown poker. <laughs> I'm getting there. Morning, Marshal. 
Chester. Quillen. Good morning, Quillen. Well, Marshal, did he put up a fight? No, no, there was no trouble. But he is the man I'm after. He's Ike Abbott, isn't he? Yeah, he's the man. Well, I sure do thank you, Marshal. Now, if you'll turn him over to me, we'll be on our way and I won't be bothering you no more. I didn't bring him in, Quillen. You... Why not? Well, I guess maybe I didn't have the stomach to arrest a man who's been a friend. It has never caused any trouble around here. That don't keep him from being a murderer. And I've got a legal warrant for him. Then you'll go get him. I thought you didn't want no killing. He isn't armed. You've caused me to waste a whole day, Morgan. Why don't you go get your man, Quillen, and get him out of here? I don't want any part of it. You admit he's a friend of yours, Marshal. I just hope you're not trying to trick me somehow. Because I'll hold you responsible. <laughs> What's on your mind tonight, Matt? Well, Kitty, it sure isn't drinking beer and sitting around the long branch. You know, you sometimes act like you've been schooled in a slave market. <laughs> Drink your beer, Kitty. I'm buying. Oh, you are? <laughs> and I take it all back. Oh. What? Here's Ben Quillen. Now I know what's been bothering you. Marshal, I want to talk to you. Well, what's your trouble, Quillen? You gave me to believe there'd be no trouble with Hank Young or whatever you call him. Was there? He wasn't armed, Marshal. At least he didn't lie about that. And just what did I lie about, Quillen? About them four friends of his. What friends? I don't like being made a fool of, Marshal. I don't like going after an unarmed man who's hiding behind four shotguns. Ah, oh, I see. You trying to tell me you didn't know about it? No, Quillen, I didn't. You swear to that? Now, you can take it or leave it. All right, I'll believe you. Providing you ride out there with me. I can't face them men alone and be suicide. It's your party, Quillen. I'm not getting paid to make your arrests. You wouldn't be scared, would you, Marshal? I think we've talked just about enough, Quillen. All right. I'll telegraph Prescott. I'll get me some authority for some deputies. Wait a minute, Quillen. What? You meet me at the stable in the morning. I'll go with you. Here they are, Marshal. Waiting for us. How are we going to shoot it out against four men with shotguns, Marshal? You just keep out of it, Quillen. Hello, Hank. Gentlemen. This here ain't my idea, Marshal. The boys just heard about everything. I can't talk them out of a fight. That's right, Marshal. Ain't nobody taking a friend of ours off to Arizona. Warrant or no warrant. Now listen, you men. Hank Young's a friend of mine, too. Isn't that right, Hank? I always thought so, Marshal. But you know me well enough. If any man needs taken in, I'll take him in. Be kind of like walking into a cannon, won't it, Marshal? Maybe. But more than one of us will die. Now, yeah, hold on. I don't want a lot of blood spilled over me. Just just because I killed a man 12 years ago is no reason any of you men should die now. Wait a minute. Quillen. What? You got that warrant with you? Of course I have. Let me see it. Well, come on, let me see it. Well, I don't know what for. Give it to me. You seen it once. What are you looking for? Well, is something wrong with it? Now, nah, it's legal, all right. Then give it back. Yeah. Hank, I've changed my mind about taking you today. Now, uh, wait. Shut Marshall. up, Quillen. Will you come into my office three days from now, Hank? We'll settle this thing then. Okay, Marshal. 
Sure, it's okay, Hank. We'll be right along with you. Won't we, boy? We'll be right along with you. We ain't backing down one bit, Marshal. You better remember that. Where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your favorite easy chair? Or... Out driving? Oh, there you are. In the kitchen. Say, you want to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable? Have a Chesterfield. Enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Let's go, Chester. Did you finally get your telegraph? Yeah. Just in time, it looks. I know. That's quite a crowd waiting for you. Think there'll be trouble? Yeah, there could be. Anything you want me to do? No. Uh, you better wait here. All right. But you be careful now. Them friends of Hank sure look like the mean business. Yeah, sure. Marshal, I've come in, like you said. I know you would, Hank. Let's get this over with, Marshal. I've waited long enough. You've waited too long, Quillen. What? Hank, I want your friends to wait across the street over there. We ain't moving, Marshal. All four of you go over there and wait. Now, will you do what he says, Jim? Go on now. Jim, he ain't the kind of trick nobody. I mean it, boys. I got going. Well, come on, men. But we'll be watching. Quillen, let me see that warrant. You've seen it twice. Yeah. Well, ain't you going to look at it? I should have looked at it the first time. Huh? Close. I missed reading the date till Hank mentioned it was 12 years ago. What's that got to do with it? Twelve years is a long time, Quillen. That warrant's still legal. But it would have been forgotten by now if you hadn't have paid the sheriff in Prescott to go to the trouble to dig around and find it for you. And paid him something more to make you a deputy. What do you say? I hate men like you who go out after other men just for the reward money. You're a professional man, Hunter, and that's the worst. So? What are you? I'm a lawman. I never collected a reward in my life. Okay, do it your way, but I'm taking this man back. I got word this morning from a friend of mine in Prescott, Quillen. So? He says what I thought about you. You don't often get back with your prisoners. Huh? Too much trouble, I guess. Too much expense. You'd shoot Hank here for trying to escape before you reach the Colorado line. But you'd still collect the reward. You're getting a lot of ideas, Marshal. I got a couple more. Hank. Yeah, what, Marshal? I hear there weren't any witnesses to that murder 12 years ago. That wasn't no murder. Of course, I had to run anyway. Yeah, the sheriff was an enemy of yours. Well, I hear he's dead now. Mm-hmm. 
There'll be a circuit judge here next week. I think we'll let him decide all this. No, you don't, Marshal. You don't cheat I'm me. sorry, Quillen. You're going to have to earn your money someplace else. Marshal, I'm warning you. This is the only copy of the warrant for Ike Abbott there is, isn't it? You give me that. I'm going to tear it up. I'll kill you if you do. Hank's only worth $500 to you, Quillen. You can find bigger game than him. I said I'll kill you. You tear up that warrant. Even you're not that big a fool, Cullen. Don't do it, Marshal. Somebody has to. No! You killed him, Marshal. I misjudged him, Hank. He was worse than I thought. What? He wouldn't only kill a man for five hundred dollars. He was willing to die for it himself. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, on the frontier, men fought for fool's reasons, like a spilled drink, and they fought for good reasons, like fenced water. But next week, a man comes to Dodge who won't fight for any reason, and still wins his battle. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, John Daner, and Ken Lynch. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. L&M. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Only with L&M can you enjoy the full, exciting flavor of today's finest tobaccos. No other cigarette, plain or filter, gives you the full, exciting flavor you get through the pure white miracle tip. So light up. Free up. Let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gun Smoke. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure.
because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. For heaven's sake. Matt. Yeah, what, Doc? Look at that coming. It's a surrey. What? A four-passenger surrey. Oh, well, that's the first one of those I've seen west of St. Louis. What? That's Kitty up there with a the driver, isn't it, Doc? Kitty? Oh, no. why, so it is. <laughs> but who is the driver? I don't know. I don't know the one sitting in the back, either. See, that's pretty fancy for Dodge. Yeah. Those are a couple of dudes, if I ever saw any. Mm, green as squash. Hi, Matt. Hello, Doc. Hi, Kitty. <laughs> Hello, Kitty. Uh, thank you. Yeah, haven't met anyone? Haven't even seen them, Kitty. Here they are. Marshal Dillon, Doc Adams, Mr. Samuel Sprague, and Clifton Bunker. Hello, Mr. Hi, Sprague. Hi, Mr. Bunker. <laughs> Quite a wagon you gentlemen have. We brought it with us, Doctor, on the train. We've been all over the country around here in that Surrey, haven't we, Bunker? What are you, uh, prospectors? No, Doc. We're writers, Doctor, from New York. Writers? Did you ever read anything by Ned Buntline? Oh, then you're not reporters. You you write uh, make-believe stories. Well, we want to write true stories, Doctor, but there doesn't seem to be much material around here. I'm uh, kind of disappointed. There hasn't been a gunfight since they arrived, and every Indian in Kansas seems to be growing old on a reservation. We're not going to get any stories this way. You mentioned that writer Ned Buntline, Mr. Spring. Uh, I met him once through Jim Bridger. Oh, yes, he wrote a lot of stories about Jim Bridger's adventures. Mm-hmm. Most of them were lies. They made Bridger look like a fool. They also made Jim Bridger famous, Marshal. Like Wyatt Earp? Buntline wrote about him, too. Anything wrong with being famous? I guess it depends how you get that way, Mr. Sprig. Yeah, go stir him up some Indians, Matt. A few massacred families out here would... Oh, that'd make nice reading in New York. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's go get a drink, Kitty. Uh, you two go ahead. I'll join you. All right. Good day, gentlemen. Gentlemen. Well, you were a great help. What do you care about them, Kitty? I don't think a series of stories in the New York papers would hurt Dodge any, do you? Oh, oh, she's thinking of business, Matt. I, I keep forgetting she's half owner of the Long Branch now. So that's it, huh? Of course it is. Don't want anybody killed, but you might at least be polite to him. Haven't got time, kidding. What? I got to ride up to Hayes City tomorrow. May not be back for a week. Good. You want to come along? Ha! Huh. Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better smokes better 
tastes better, and Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. Calvary up ahead there, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Pretty sloppy looking, ain't they? Half of them ain't even setting their saddles straight. Uh-huh. Yeah, not that I blame them, none. Riding them terrible McClellan saddles. I think they've been ahead, Chester. They must have had a fight. Hey, by golly, I think you're right. Let's pull up. Some of them boys is wounded. And look there. A couple of them tied across their saddles. They're dead. I think I know that lieutenant, Chester. Yeah, it's Lieutenant Bain. What in the world do you suppose has happened? Company! Company! Hello, Lieutenant. Can we give you any help? Might have this morning, Marshal. Indians? Chief Little Hawk. Little Hawk? The Pawnee? Haven't you heard, Marshal? What? I've been in Hayes City for a week. Little Hawk and 40 Brave jumped reservation four or five days ago. Well, he's one of the most peaceful chiefs in Kansas, Lieutenant. Look at my patrol, Marshal. Two dead and half a dozen wounded. I don't understand it. Neither does anybody else. They wiped out a family over on Walnut Creek yesterday, and he hit us this morning. You're the only cavalry in the field? Yeah. Funny thing, we picked up Little Hawk's trail right here, Marshal, right out of that grove of trees. Huh? It's a Pawnee burying ground. Guess they stopped there to make medicine or something. Well, see you at the dance, Marshal. Yeah, Lieutenant. Uh, I- I'm sorry it happened. Yeah, so am I. Up, buddy! Up, Come on, Chester. Them poor devils, they really got it, didn't they? Well, they're not far from Fort Dodge now. Where are we going? To look at this Pawnee graveyard? Not exactly a graveyard, Chester. Well, what is it, then? You'll see. sticking up over there with them platforms on. Graves, Chester. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. They bury people up in the air on them platforms, don't they? Yeah, that's right. But these is all new, Mr. Dillon. At least they're empty. There ain't no corpses laying on them. Yeah. Little Hawk must have come by here to pick up his dead and take him with him. What for? I don't know. They must have been in an awful hurry. Look at that platform over there. Uh-huh. It's half tore down. Yeah, I noticed it. The rest of them ain't. No. I declare I I don't feel right here, Mr. Newman. Neither do I, Chester. All right, come on, let's go.
I'll buy us the first drinks, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. I swear my throat's solid alkaline. Yes, yeah, so my... no, hey, Kitty. Yeah, she wants you, Mr. Dillon. Uh, I'll join you at the bar, Chester. All right, sir. Say, Alvin. Yes, how long have you been back, Matt? Oh, since noon, Kitty. I had a lot of business at the bank. Oh? <laughs> well, not personal business, you understand. Matt, uh, you remember Sprague and Bunker? No. Are those dudes still in town? Matt, they want to talk to you. Now, Kitty, their stories aren't going to put Dodge on the map. It's already there. Texas cattle did it, not New York writers. Please, Matt. I'm asking you. Well, if you're going to turn female on me. You forget I'm part owner of this place now. I can have you thrown out. Yeah? <laughs> well, I'd sure be talking to those two. Oh, right there, Matt, at that table. You see him? No. Well, then walk around a while. You'll find him. I'm going to talk to Chester. Good evening, gentlemen. Marshal Dillon. Sit down, Marshal. Sit down. All right. Uh, Marshal, we've got a proposition to make you. Oh? You tell him, Sprig. Well, Marshal, we heard about those Indians. Uh, some soldiers from Fort Dodge were in here a while ago. And? We want to find them. What are you talking about, Sprig? Well, I don't mean find them exactly, but the next time they attack some settler, we want to be the first to get there. That way, we'd really see what it's like, Marshal. Maybe we could even talk to the survivors, if there are any. We'll pay you well. Pay me for what? For guiding us, for taking us there. What do you say, Marshal? You want me to guide a couple of vultures like you? That's uncalled for, Marshal. Why don't you go back to New York, huh? They got plenty of corpses there. And they're a whole lot prettier than anything the Indians might leave for you. Now, look here, Marsh. Just no getting along with him at all, Spring. Well, you certainly didn't talk to them very long, Matt. Is that my drink, Chester? Uh, no, sir, it ain't. No, it ain't. It ain't. It's my... It's my... It's... <laughs> it's yours now. Pour yourself another one. I'll buy it. Well, thank you. I don't mind if I do. Oh, uh, Mr. Dunn, look at this little dido Miss Kitty's been showing me. Huh? Well, they had it hung up behind the bar there. See, it's all carved out of bone. Here, let me see that, Chester. Interesting, isn't it, Matt? Where'd this come from, Kitty? Well, it's an Indian totem of some kind. Sprig and Bunker brought it Sprig in. Sprig and Bunker? Uh -huh, but they were just lending it to us to hang behind the bar. Yeah. Now what? I'll go with him, Chester. Well, I'll go. Where did you men get this totem? We've had enough of you for tonight, Marshal. <laughs> Well, I want to know where you got this totem, Sprig. You're choking me. Then tell me. We got it from a soldier. A soldier? What soldier? A private from Fort Dodge. His name was Roger Harlow. We bought it. Yeah. <laughs> what is it, Mr. Dillon? Chester, we're riding out to Fort Dodge in the morning. In time to wake up Major Honeyman. All right, Marshal, B Company moved out yesterday. My judgment of the situation is that they'll make almost immediate contact. I see, Major. But I don't like your insinuation that the cavalry is responsible for Little Hawk jumping reservation. I'll admit garrison life's dull, but no soldier in my command would want action that badly. Where's your proof, Marshal? Right here, Major. Why, this is a Pawnee totem. It's more than that, Major. It's a Fox Clan totem. Little Hawk's Clan. Yeah. Well, I've told you where I think it came from. Now let's get that private in here and settle this, huh? Marshal, I'll feed him to Little Hawk if this is true. Oh, Sergeant! Sergeant Grimes! Oh, uh, what'd you say his name is? Harlow. Roger Harlow. Yes, Major? Now, Sergeant, you pride yourself on knowing every man at Fort Dodge. As regimental sergeant, I consider it my duty, sir. What company is Private Roger Harlow assigned to? Private Roger Harlow? Yes, that's right. There 
Ain't no Roger Harlow on this post, Major. There never had been. <laughs> Listening to Gunsmoke. In your kitchen, getting ready for a Sunday supper, maybe in your living room, relaxing, or out driving. Say, be sure and watch the road, but remember there's pleasure ahead when you smoke Chesterfield, when you satisfy yourself with Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better smokes better tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. Find Sprig and Bunker last night, man? No. no. We finally learned at the stable they drove out of Dodge in that Surrey yesterday morning. You going after them? Yeah. As soon as Chester comes with our horses. What do you think they're up to now, man? I wish I knew, Doc. Mm. They ought to be hung. Hey, Doc. Huh? Look over there. Coming into the plaza. Oh, yeah, well. You won't have to ride after them now. <laughs> no. Them and their fancy Surrey. Yep, Matt. Yep. Where you going? Oh. Yeah. Oh, hello, Marshal. Get on, Bunker. You too, Sprig. Now. We saw it, Marshal. We saw practically all of it. It was exciting. And with no help from you, either. Oh, it was magnificent. The cavalry really got their own back this time. What are you talking about, Marshal? The Indians. The cavalry practically wiped them out. What? Yesterday, Marshal, just before dark. We were driving along the Arkansas and heard all that gunfire and commotion up ahead. And we got there just in time to see what few Indians were left running for their lives. They killed all but half a dozen of them. And they got that chief little hog, too. You saw this, huh? Now, Marshal, we wouldn't be making it up, would we? And I might add that it's about time we saw something around here. You know, Sprig, I was talking to Doc Adams over there when you drove in. You know what he'd like to see? No. He'd like to see you and Bunker hung. What? And so would I. What's the matter with you, Marshal? Why did you tell me a soldier gave you that totem? Oh, you... You found out. Why did you lie about it? Because you were choking me and because I didn't know what you'd do next. Or why? Why? You men robbed a Pawnee grave. You stole a totem, a totem of Little Hawk's clan. Well, that's all we took. Who cares about a savage idol anyway? Little Hawk did. He went on a warpath. Oh, nonsense, Marshal. Over a fool thing like that? Marshal, you're not standing up for a bloodthirsty redskin, are you? I knew Little Hawk Sprig. He was a good chief. He was a brave man and a peaceful one. Till you shamed him. 
<laughs> well, he's he's not shamed now, Marshal. He's a good Indian. <laughs> <laughs> You get out, both of you. You get out today. Enough men have died because of you. And you go back to New York. And when you get there, you'll write a story about a marshal who'd have liked nothing better than handing you over to Little Hawk. If he were still alive... our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, there's a saying on the frontier, kicking won't get you nowhere unless you're a mule. <laughs> well, next week, a man complains that somebody's trying to kill him and isn't believed until it happens. But that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, John Daner, Joseph Kearns, Lou Krugman, and Ralph Moody. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Only with L&M can you enjoy the full, exciting flavor of today's finest tobaccos through the modern miracle of the pure white miracle tip. So light up. Free up. Let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gunsmoke. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.